Good afternoon. Want to call in the session the August 10th, uh, 2022 meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors. And I want to thank all of you who've joined with us this afternoon here in the chambers. And I know we have a number of folks that are following us on the live stream and we'll be calling in in some, some cases. So, again, thank you uh, for uh, joining us. And uh, we've got a um, uh, short number of items, but a pretty full agenda uh, with the uh, topics that are going to be before us. So, with that being said, again, welcome, and I would uh, ask the uh, clerk to please call the roll to establish a quorum. Uh, she'll read some announcements into the record. Uh, I know a number of you have signed up, uh, but in the event you haven't, you'll give some instructions on that. And then we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll get into today's uh, order of business. Thanks, thank, well. thank you. Good afternoon, Supervisor Cerna. Here. Kennedy. Here. Desmond. Here. Frost. Here. Natoli. Here. You have a quorum. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated Sunday, August 14th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. The Board of Supervisors fosters public engagement during the meeting and encourages public participation, civility, and use of courteous language. The Board does not condone the use of profanity, vulgar language, gestures, or other inappropriate behavior, including personal attacks or threats directed towards any meeting participant. In compliance with directives of the county, state, and centers for disease control and prevention, the meeting will be live streamed and open to public attendance pursuant to health and safety guidelines. The practice of social distancing and wearing face coverings, mask or shield is recommended for the health and safety of all persons participating in person during the meeting, although it is not required. Seating is limited and available on a first come, first serve basis. Members of the public will be given three minutes to make a public comment and are limited to making one comment per agenda item or off agenda matter. Matter. Please be mindful of the public comment procedures to avoid being interrupted or disconnected while making your comment. To make a comment in person, fill out a speaker request form and hand it to clerk staff. The chairperson will open public comments for each agenda item or call up for off agenda matters. And when the chairperson calls your name, please come to the podium and make your comment. To make a comment by phone, dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter. Please refer to the agenda or watch the meeting to follow along to determine when is the best time to call to be placed in queue to make your comment. Clerk staff will transfer calls into the meeting accordingly. Each agenda item queue will remain open until the public comment period is closed for that specific item. You may be on hold for an extended period of time and your patience is appreciated. You may also send written comments by email to boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the meeting record. If you need an accommodation pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act or for medical or other reasons, please see clerk staff for assistance or contact the clerk's office at 916-874-5451 or by email at boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding of the meeting procedures. Thank you, Flo. If you'd all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Okay, thank you. All right, so for our agenda, we do have a couple of off agenda items, but and we do have some addendum, addendum items. Do you want? To, how do you want to handle them, Madam Clerk? Um, I think we should take up your off agenda okay. uh, where I need you guys to take quick action. Okay. All right. Um, so you should have received a memo from me today. Um, first, we need to determine the necessity to hear. And then um, it's a received and filed for processing to registrar of voters. This is a communications referred to registrars of voters, county council, and office of county executive for processing in accordance with resolution number 83-1346. This is the city of Galt resolution number 2022-57 calling for the placement of a general tax measure on the ballot for the November 8th, 2022 general municipal election regarding an ordinance to enact a general transaction and use tax at the the rate of one cent, resolution number 2022-58, providing for the filing of primary and rebuttal arguments and setting rules for the filing of written arguments regarding the ballot measure, and resolution number 2022-59, requesting consolidation of the general municipal election with the November 2022 statewide general election. 
So I need a motion to at least place this on the boards referred and um, yes. to the voter registrars. So we need a motion to hear the item first. Do we have a motion? So moved. Mm -hmm. Okay, moved and seconded, and that requires a four-fifths vote to, to accomplish that. So please vote. Unanimous vote. All righty. This is a received and referred, so no further action is required. Okay, so now we need, but we, now we need a motion to actually act on the item, correct? No, no, it's a received and referred, so it normally would have been under your received and referred matters, and you guys don't actually take action on that. We just okay. automatically refer it. Okay, so it didn't require a four-fifths vote then. <laughs> all right. Well, to be placed on the agenda. On the, on the agenda. Yeah. Okay, but then it was received and referred. Okay, all right, very good. Yeah, that's the only off agenda items we need to add. That's it. Okay. Now we can do your off agenda public comments. And okay. I do have public comments on the phone, and I know you have some in person. Right. So this is a time for those that aren't with us regularly. We do take our off agenda items, then we'll get into the matters that many of you are here on here today, uh, items two and three. So uh, for off agenda, we have a couple of folks in chambers that have signed up, and then we have some on the phone. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and call on um, Giovanna Fajardo, and followed by Tammy uh, Freemeyer. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Tammy. Sorry, Hi, Tammy. first time here, so. <laughs> hey, Tammy. Well, I welcome. currently live in Sacramento at Harlow Apartments. They're owned by Tryon Properties, who basically are an investment company. And since they have purchased us in the middle of November, they have misplaced my rent. They have been harassing me, uh, sending back my certified mail of my cashier's checks and all the emails and the sent certified mail. I have copied Rich Desmond on those as well. So far, all of them, they have refused them and sent them back to me. I've never had an issue with my landlord before, and I always pay my rent. So they're harassing me. They're retaliating against me because I am standing up for myself, unlike so many people, unfortunately. And even the manager of the complex, she, she was just like, oh, she's the ringleader, and I'm not. Um, so <laughs> it's just really ridiculous. But it's real. last night, the last two certified letters, they got refused. And I cried all night just because I've never done all this. I've, and it's just it's hurting me, and it's just causing a lot of pain. And I don't know what to do. So I'm trying to do what's best and stand up for myself and for the other tenants. And we also have other complexes that are ganging up with us and trying to stand up for ourselves also, because what they're doing is not right. They're just completely harassing us. OK. <clears throat> All right. Thank, th thank you, Tammy. <laughs> I, good afternoon. My name is Giovanna Fajardo. I am with the organization ACE, the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment. Do I just hand it to you if I have letters for them? All right. And as Tammy said, we're helping organize a tenants union of these try-on tenants, which in your county, you have at least four apartment complex with several hundred members. At this moment, we have 130 of those tenants in your county that are working with our organization that have called out these three issues that they have with this corporate greedy company that brags about the money that they take advantage from tenants. The Original issue that they contacted our organization about was the use of ConService, which is a utilities company that has been charging them at one point 10 times the utilities, refusing to give them bills, explain charges, refund the overcharges that were deducted automatically without their permission. Um, and so that was where it started. Where it's gone from is now the harassment and the retaliation towards tenants like Tammy, who just spoke, who have been trying to have conversations with the property managers, with the staff, with their fellow neighbors, which why should anyone be accused of doing anything bad if you're trying to talk with your neighbors of a complex you've lived in for years? So these tenants have been taking photographs illegally of them and their children while trying to talk to press. We've had um, discussions with, their, with the try-on lawyers and they're refusing to work. And so again, it's habitability issues as well where they're refusing to fix 
things, health issues for tenants in all four of these complexes for months at a time and refusing to work with tenants. They're harassing and retaliating against these tenants for organizing, knowing their rights, and requesting repairs, requesting receipts of utilities, requesting that their rent be accepted both in person, online, and by certified mail, which legally you have the right to do and still have been refusing. And Tammy is not the only person whose mail, whose rent has been lost. Um, but we wanted to come here in person because we have been emailing Mr. Desmond on several occasions over the last few months. And this is a bigger issue than just Harlow tenants. This is a corporation that was given the door, like the way in to your county to take advantage of your rental and tenants who are trying to just live in your community and thrive. Um, and so I've given you guys a copy that will be sent to the Tryon lawyers today. Um, and we will continue to come back until something gets done. Thank you. Yes, Joanna, I just wanted to ask you, so again, have you talked with anybody from our housing agency, housing authority? Um, and we also obviously have a a uh, helpline, again, that's more for individual tenant types of, of situations. Of course, yeah. they send us to Legal Services of Northern California, which cannot represent some of these tenants because okay. they do not qualify. Again, they are so overwhelmed with the high need of harassment, evictions currently going on in your county that they are refusing anywhere from 40 to 60 tenants a day. Legal Services of Northern yes, California? Yes, because is? they are overwhelmed with such a high demand. Yes. Okay, okay. All right, well, we just got this letter just dated today. So I, I know that it sounds like three of the complexes are in Supervisor Desmond's district, but the fourth one on Terra Loma is actually in District 5. I'm, yes, that's a new yeah. new apartment complex we started meeting with this last week. Okay, thank you. and Supervisor Desmond did have a, a comment. Well, just for, thank you, Giovanna, for the letter. I will direct my staff to get in touch with you to discuss this and discuss some other ideas for, you know, how we can look into this and maybe help with you, help with your situation. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Yeah. If I could, too, maybe county council get a copy of the letter, take a look at this, too. There may be some things that we might be able to assist that are already an existing ordinance or law. So, okay, great. Yeah, if you could get one to council, we could. Thanks, Shabana. Okay, those are two folks I had signed up for um, off agenda in chambers. Anyone else wish to address the board on an item that's not on the agenda today? Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We you do? With okay. Yeah, we have another. Okay. okay, that's right. Yeah, she can approach the podium. Just give us her name and fill out a form later. So let's it's, it's with your group. That's fine. Come on. You can come on down. That's fine. <laughs> Just identify yourself. Good, good afternoon. Um, Hi. My name is Patricia Hanley, and I live at Chloe Apartments, okay. which is managed by Tryon. Um, they have recently, um, well, first of all, even before Tryon took over for DJA, uh, we got a unilateral amendment to our lease saying we had to pay water, sewer, trash. And this was not an option. It was just a a notice, basically. No one agreed to it like we did in the lease. We agreed to the terms. Well, this amendment came in saying we had to pay these other charges, which uh, this month is currently $46. Um, but they, Tryon took over, a, over a, year, a year ago, I believe. And um, the pool. <laughs> The pool has been closed. The notice came from the city that it was something to do with the lock. And, um, and then something below it was checked, something about the pH in the water. Mm -hmm. So um, this summer, it's been, it's been six weeks it's been closed at least. But even after finding out this happened, it took them a month to get somebody there to look at the lock, which um, someone took down the notice like 10 days ago. Um, I wasn't home, so I don't know who did it, but I assumed it was 
the people at Tryon or the city took down the took down the sign. Well, I went to use the pool and come to find out another email came that the pool was still closed. Um, and now they're in the process of draining it. But we don't know any of this. There was an on-site manager assigned who we never see. Um, doesn't return calls. You have to leave a message if you want maintenance. Um, but there's, there's no one there managing the property. And the, the kind of questions we have are more than just a yes or no. It's the communications we get are don't do this. It's not, there's no explanation of what, why, and, um, and so anyway, back to that amendment about the utility service. They have, in the last few months, have decided to assign the collection of that water sewer um, trash fees to con service, which is an outside company that now sends out the billing but charges us an extra $450. Now, um, my rent went up in January. I moved in in January uh, four years ago. And um, now, it, uh, and the last rental increase was um, $95 plus the 46. So I'm paying a lot more than I bargained for. And during the pandemic, the pool was closed too, and there's no rental offset for the lack of amenities that we signed up for. Patricia, I'm gonna need to ask you to conclude your comments. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the laundry room is screwed up too, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> so thank you for listening. You know, thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing, and hopefully this will get ironed out, so. All right, so anybody else with your group? Ace? Uh, okay, very good. Well, thank you uh, to all three of you for your comments today. We do have the letter, and we'll take a look at it. So, All right, with that, uh, then no other off agendas in chambers. We'll go to off agendas on the phone. So, okay, Clark? could you please transfer the first caller? Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, uh, this is Cynthia Campbell, and I'm I live in the Arden Arcade uh, neighborhood, and we have been very shocked to find out that the Powerhouse Science Center is to be turned into some kind of homeless shelter where the city will bust their homeless people in, and then do something, I guess, and then we're going to be left with the problem. Now, meanwhile, the city has a lot of empty um, office space where they could put people without bussing them out to our neighborhood, but they apparently don't want to do that. And this is really unfair. We're being redlined. Redlined was in the past. Your utility person would come out to the house. They might notice, oh, you're Moroccan. Here, let me put a red line on your card. Those index cards made it back to either the phone company or whatever, they were a utility at the time. It's been a while. And then that made its way to the banks where they would then redline the neighborhoods so that the ones who were not white would get um, the worst service. And if there was something that wasn't um, good, it generally got situated in those neighborhoods. Well, what's happening with the city wanting to bust their homeless people into Del Paso Heights an Arden Arcade area is no more than modern-day redlining, and I hope you'll do everything you can to oppose it. We already have a serious problem with uh, the um, homeless who take up the sidewalk, so if you have a walker or, or a wheelchair, forget it. There's no more ADA access to our sidewalks. If you try to shop at Sprouts on Marconi, their shopping carts are stolen so often, you end up just going online, so our businesses are hurting. If you try to go to Estelle on, Alt on Arden, there's a gauntlet of people, you know, these, these filthy tents on the sidewalk. So you can't go there anymore. Our neighborhood is being systematically just 
harassed, mm-hmm. and our property values are going down. Meanwhile, the city, because they're putting the good stuff, like the medical campus in North Natomas, their property values are going up for no good reason. I mean, so I think you need to stop this. I think it's a race issue. I think it is totally unfair. And for the city to be basically dumping, which is what we said Nevada did when they just moved all their people into California who were homeless, for the city to be dumping the homeless problem onto us when we already have one of our own, this is immoral and unfair. So I hope you'll do everything you can to stand up for our unincorporated, our county neighborhoods, because right now we're under attack. And thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And I know you've corresponded uh, in writing as well, so we've received your letters. Thank you for your comments today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Claudia Cardoza Aderholt, and uh, I am an animal advocate. I've taken up on myself to participate in different platform tests of board, of board supervisors meetings, animal welfare committees, and uh, board uh, council meetings as well to create awareness with respect to the crisis um, affecting our animals, uh, specifically our homeless animals. So thank you for that opportunity, and um, I will proceed in letting uh, the board know that in the last 30 days, um, three dogs trees in a homeless camp and nine cats, mostly due to lack of medical assistance and of pla- or placement available. Number two, no TNR health effort have come together since um, the last 30 days that we have. Um, cats are dying, kittens, kittens are dying from starvation, lack of medical resources, or health. Uh, I have taken in two medical, um, two medical animals, serving lethargic, non-responsive, and upper respiratory infections, possibly um, anemia due to flea infestations. I I am reaching out also to other groups besides talking to you, and I know that we have talked to um, the county um, animal shelter, but um, we still haven't made any progress with respect to uh, preparing or coming together with an action plan where we both can work in collaboration and actually assist these animals in the meantime they're dying. So I have taken up on myself to reach out to other groups. Um, for example, the SBCA, Rio Linda Federal Group, and a private vet that is willing to help us to, to get the ball rolling on this. Um, also, I have become aware today that 17 dogs have died because no drinking water is available um, in the parkway area. I believe that uh, drinking water has been shut down, and that makes it pretty much inhumane. And um, having 17 dogs dying um, because resources are not there for the animals, it, it's just, uh, it shouldn't be happening, not here, not in America. We are not a third world country, and um, it, it's just inhumane. So I implore you. <laughs> and I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments today. Okay, next speaker. Okay, that's all the callers for now. Okay, so that goes to our off agenda uh, comments. And uh, with that, if we have no one else, then we're gonna go to our our agenda items. I think we're gonna call both of the items. Uh, We have speakers. Just before we get started, I know we've received uh, uh, a fairly significant volume of correspondence, email, uh, some calls, uh, and uh, again, those been dis- have been distributed by the clerk's office. If it didn't go directly to a supervisor, they were distributed uh, by the clerk to all members of the board. We also have a number of speakers that are signed up, uh, some for specifically for item two, some for uh, items three or two or three. So uh, if you sign up for two and three, then I'll give you an opportunity to speak to 
uh, those items um, uh, during your comments because we're going to call them both together and um, want to be respectful of people's time. And uh, again, we have a pretty large number of folks have signed up, and I trust we have some on the phone as well. So, okay. So with that, we're going to call items two and three, and then we'll go to our staff presentations. Uh, any board questions, and then we'll uh, go to our um, audience members and uh, interested parties for for their comments. Mr. All right, Mr. Chair. Yes. Before we get started, sure, Phil. Uh, I'd like to ask the clerk if she knows um, roughly how many folks are on the line. Uh, we have about uh, 10 on the line, so okay. you have a total of about 45 comments altogether. Okay, so I just want to make sure the room understands how many folks are right. uh, uh, you know, willing and, uh, to, to uh, speak today um, in terms of um, not repeating their comments and you know, being efficient with your uh, testimony. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Phil. Yes. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and call the items. Okay, item two, uh, introduce an ordinance amending chapter 9.120 of the Sacramento County Code to prohibit camping and encampments on or near certain public property locations in the unincorporated county area, waiving full reading and continuing to August 23rd, 2022 for adoption. Item three, introduce an ordinance of the Sacramento County Code amending sections 9.36.058 relating to fires and 9.36.067 relating to remaining in the parkways between sunset and sunrise and adding section 9.36.083 to prohibit camping or constructing, maintaining or inhabiting any structure or camp facility in the American River Parkway and Dry Creek Parkway, waiving full reading and continuing to August 23rd for adoption. Okay, thank you, Flo. All right, Emily. Great, thank you. And if the clerk could pull up the PowerPoint. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Emily Halkin. I'm the Director of Homeless Initiatives. Um, and here today with Liz Bellis, who will follow me. I think we're going to try to package these together. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about the Critical Infrastructure Ordinance, then Ms. Bellis will talk about the parkway components. Um, so we are here today at your request with a draft ordinance that could, could restrict camping on and around critical infrastructure as well as other specific locations within the unincorporated county. Um, as you know, the county has made and is continuing to make very significant investments to increase shelter, housing, and services to help prevent and end homelessness throughout the county. Um, in terms of direct work within encampments, our encampment services teams are prioritizing high-impact, high-needs camps and providing case-carrying services for those living in those camps, aiming at transitioning them out of unsheltered homelessness into sheltering and eventually housing. In addition to the encampment services teams, we also now have a full slate of 11 navigators uh, contracted, um, working exclusively in the parkway system, again, focusing on making connections to shelter, housing, and supportive services. Um, despite these efforts, um, and, and those from many of our community partners, including the cities and community-based organizations, we all know the numbers of encampments in our community have grown, and certainly the conditions within those encampments and immediately surrounding them has also worsened. While the county does remain committed to increasing housing, sheltering, and other services, we also know that we are obligated to um, address the negative impacts of encampments for the broader community. Based on input from the board, um, including some from a workshop that was held here uh, in June 14th, County Council has drafted an ordinance which is attached to the board letter. I'm going to summarize some of the key components, um, and County Council is available to address any specific legal questions that you may have. Emily, if I could just yeah. pause for just a moment, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Uh, Emily, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yes. So you, you highlight the number of new shelter beds that are funded this year, but what you don't have on the slide uh, that may inform um, for the public kind of the totality of what we're doing in terms of capacity building. Do you have a rough uh, estimate that you can share off the top of your head in terms of all the capacity that we currently have? Uh, in the county? I certainly do on sheltering. Um, we have we currently fund approximately 1,300 beds through the county contracts. The city of Sacramento additionally funds over 1,000, I believe. These 250 are not online yet. They represent the new investments this year. Um, in terms of permanent housing resources that are specifically dedicated for folks experiencing homelessness, so typically what we call permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing, I think we have somewhere between, well, I don't, we have a, a few thousand units in the, in the community. Those those obviously don't turn over as frequently because they are permanent housing. Does the, does the, um, uh, the 1,300 um, number of sh shelter beds, does that include the scattered site? Yeah, the 1,300 okay. number includes scattered site, Mather, um, some other site-based shelters that we operate. Yes. Very good. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. 
Um, based on similar ordinances in other communities and the board's priorities that we've heard, um, the draft ordinance would apply to four specific areas. It is important to note that should the board approve this ordinance, it would only apply to public lands within the unincorporated county of Sacramento. So the, the four areas that we are contemplating are within 25 feet of very specific critical infrastructure locations. These locations would have to be adopted by resolution at a later date, um, but critical infrastructure may include things such as bridges, um, water treatment facilities, rail stations, et cetera. Emily, if I could just on that point, so if it's un understood for the audience that in the event that the board were to move ahead with action on a all of this or part of this today, but that piece of it would require a resolution at a later date that would actually define by location where that critical infrastructure was and then how this would, be, would apply to that particular locations. It would yes. be multiple locations, but I trust. But. Yes, and, and Ms. Travis may want to add, but my understanding is the board needs to adopt a resolution with specific findings for each of those sites you identify as critical infrastructure. Okay, so so there are some steps involved here, and, and one being that what's before us today, if it was introduced, would still, and you're going to get to this, but would come back at uh, a future date in a few weeks and then the effective date of that, but there still would have to be an accompanying right. resolution for, for that particular piece of what you're outlining here. So. Right, and, and I do believe that um, those two things could go concurrently. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do, but I think that theoretically you could concurrently adopt, do the second reading and, and adopt the resolution of the locations. And, and is, is that something that is envisioned, maybe council would be best to answer this, but um, that would be iterative that if locations were determined and other locations were to be added, maybe even subtracted at some point in time if, you know, there were sufficient uh, uh, reason to do so. So that's something that could be would be ongoing, but by resolution, is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay, so it would require public hearing, public notification on our agenda. It's not something done by edict or that's designated or delegated to you or to the county executive. It has to be done by this board. Is that that's it? correct? Yes. Okay. And I would caution that it is quite a, going to be quite an undertaking, and I don't know how um, departments that would be impacting how much they've worked they've done in advance. So I don't. I would caution that it probably can't be done in the next two weeks. Okay. <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a follow-up on that. Um, so that when we make this identification of critical infrastructure, if the board moves this forward today, would it be like a specific location, you know, a bridge abutment in this spot, this this portion of X waterway, or would it would it be certain criteria that would identify what that infrastructure is? It's identifying the actual infrastructure. Actual yes. location, the actual, actual right. specific location. To provide notice to um, the public um, and to assist the enforcement of the ordinance. Yes, that is um, correct. It would be actual infrastructure. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks, so. um, The second uh, location that we're talking about is within 30 feet of wildfire or flood risk areas only during severe weather events as, um, as issued by the National Weather Service. The third would be up to 1,000 feet from the perimeter of a facility providing emergency shelter for homeless populations. And the fourth would be within uh, 25 feet of youth serving facilities, which is defined in the ordinance as a public or private primary and secondary schools as well as public libraries. Okay, please pause for a second. No. Good. Good. A couple of follow-ups to this one as well, and maybe this is for... Um, I don't know if it's County Council or Emily, and, and I know we'll be, Liz will be talking about the Parkway Ordinance specific to the Parkway, but a discussion we've had um, among the board members, certainly, and, and with staff is, um, and certainly called out by some members of the public, what about the... Um, the other uh, the, the the other waterways that that feed into the watershed here, um, you know, because obviously they are impacted a lot of times by encampments that result in um, impacting water quality. Um, um, clogging up some of these uh, uh, watersheds, whether it's a slough or creek or whatever it is, how would those be treated under, or would they be treated under this or under the other ordinance we'll be discussing? Yes, they would be treated under the critical infrastructure ordinance and those creeks and waterways that the board wants to have covered by the ordinance would need to be identified in the resolution that would be brought back. Okay. There are certain... Um, 
there are certain flood control um, items that do not need to have a resolution, such as levees um, and things that are used specifically for flood control. Those are automatically covered by this ordinance because of the importance um, to protect public health and safety and also um, it, the investment in those facilities. So um, there is a distinction between the two of those in this ordinance. Okay. Thank you. In the definition, if, if that's where, if you're wondering where it is, it's in the definition of critical infrastructure. Um, the flood protection facilities are automatically covered versus any other critical infrastructure, including other waterways, um, could be would have to come back by resolution. Okay, great. Thank you. Just one follow on, if I could, to that point, uh, Lisa. The um, uh, definition of severe weather events. So you use the. Um, uh, definition that I guess you know using weather forecasting and so forth, but this is not just storm events. It's also high fire risk when humidity is low and temperatures are high. Is and, and is that spelled out in the ordinance or how how is that determined? Yes, it is. It's um, it's in the definition section of severe weather, and it's a flood watch, flood advisory, flood weather warning, fire watch, red flag warning, and it's is when that is issued by the National Weather Service. It's on, well, I don't know what. Okay. It's under the definitions, under but, severe weather. But it has relates to wildfires, though. <laughs> there's a fire marshal call in that as well, right? Right. And then there's also a definition of wildfire risk area in the definitions yes, I as see well. That. So it's a combination of the two. Okay. But is the wildfire, so the, the wildfire risk area is one to define areas that may have dry grass or a lot of vegetation or be proximate to homes or whatever the um, determination or determining factors. But does that have a weather component to it as well or no? The wildfire risk areas? Yes, under 9.120040 yes. A, um, it would be number six. So it's not allowed during within 30 feet of a wildfire risk area or flood risk area during severe weather. Okay, but the severe weather could be a summertime severe weather or early fall or whatever. So it's, it's better understood when you've got either flood risk and you know there's been, you know, torrential rains or a prediction of a, of a you know, um, a atmospheric river or whatever it is. But with the wildfire, you have areas that, like I said, have vegetation and so forth, but <clears throat> they're... They, and, and you may not have made the call because of the vegetation, but because then you get a heightened fire risk, you could make a call. Does that require a board resolution, though, to do that? Not, not for wildfires. Not I for wildfire risk. Let me look back yeah. again. Okay. Yes. All right. Thanks. Rich, do you have any other questions? No. Okay. All right. Emily? Okay. Thank you. Um, so these four location categories align with board direction, and the effort here is to prevent potential damage to public assets, that's a critical infrastructure component, to address some of the past challenges we've experienced in wildfire and flood risk areas during severe weather events, um, to support the board's goals uh, to decrease encampments near sheltering programs, we talked quite a bit about this during the um, adoption of the safe stay shelters, and to ensure that youth have unimpeded access to schools and libraries in their communities. Uh, you pause, please, Supervisor Cerner. Um, thank you. So what's not uh, listed here, but I think is critically important to acknowledge, um, and I think uh, certainly given the nature of some of the public testimony during yesterday's board meeting about an uh, issue that is um, currently um, plaguing uh, the district that Supervisor Desmond uh, represents, is safety, especially with regards to uh, streets as critical infrastructure. It's also um, something that would, uh, an objective through this ordinance that would seek to protect the folks that are encroaching on roadways where they're actually putting themselves in dangers because, danger because of uh, the conflicts between vehicles and, and people, correct? Um, I want to ask Ms. Travis if a street or a roadway, I did hear the conversation yesterday, could be deemed by resolution critical infrastructure. I'm a little bit unclear as to whether that could be one of the pieces. Right, under the definition and what we've recommended, I think, is that it not be included in the definition of critical infrastructure because there are other county um, statutes and code sections and state statutes that apply to streets that um, camping could be regulated under those. But wouldn't the practical effect of implementation of this 
uh, ordinance if it's adopted by the by the board and um, and enforced have the I mean the, the practical effect at least the way I can determine it would be uh, to dissuade folks from uh, camping in close proximity to the travel lanes correct uh, well this is again as we've said before is one of the many tools that the county has um, so I don't think this ordinance oh, well maybe it's belt and suspenders but right. I think it deserves to be, be called out. I don't know if uh, Mr. Desmond has any thoughts on it. You know, I, I appreciate that, uh, Supervisor Cerna. Yeah, we, we have had a lot of discussions about this, including, I mean, mostly in the context of uh, Alter Arden and some encampments there on where there's not, it's not even protected by a raised curb, and it's very close to a, uh, a high-speed um, expressway. So I, I think that's a, a very good point. Are we, I, I want to make sure that, whatever we're discussing is going to give us the, the latitude to really identify places where um, certainly it's a safety hazard either to the infrastructure itself or to the campers themselves or even even nearby motorists. Um, and maybe could, could we flesh that out a little bit, uh, um, Lisa, maybe talk, what are some other tools, if we, if we couldn't address that situation with something like this, what are some other tools we could use to address a, a situation where an encampment is posing a, a, a traffic safety hazard either to the campers and or uh, motorists or pedestrians or bicyclists? Right, so if we're talking roads and, and highways, it's a law enforcement issue and the vehicle code um, and streets and highways code would be applicable in those situations and it's strictly prohibited. Um, it's an enforcement issue, obviously, the, the prioritization of enforcing. However, if, if you're talking about sidewalks, which is another thing that we've been talking about a lot, um, because obviously, as you all know and have seen, when there's folks camping or staying on a sidewalk, it often spills out into the roadway. Um, there's a county code provision that makes it a misdemeanor to block a sidewalk. Um, and again, it's a matter of enforcing that um, and either voluntarily seeking compliance, and then if not, then it is a misdemeanor to do okay. that. Okay, and that's already on the books, the that's sidewalks, already, and, and something we could be utilizing right now. Correct. And there are a lot of encampments we're seeing right now, I think more and more in the unincorporated areas where they are actually blocking the sidewalk and somebody has to walk out into the, either walk into private property to avoid an encampment or actually walk out into a traffic lane. But, so I get the sidewalk one. Is that is that ordinance um, um, expansive enough to cover the situation where there, there, are, there are a lot of places in District 3 where there are no sidewalks, as you right. well know, but they're very urbanized roadways. Would it cover a pedestrian access or is it just specific to sidewalks? I need to pull up the, the county code section if okay. you give me a minute, but if it's a county right-of-way, which most of those would be, I believe, yeah. because they're adjacent to the road, um, it would apply in those situations as well. Okay. Let me just look at the code section now. And, and I would just note for the, the record that there are actually only two expressways in the county, uh, a portion of South Watt Avenue and Alto Arden. I mean, you have roads that may serve high volume, high speeds and so forth, but the designated expressway, Alta Arden, if recollection serves me correct, is one of only two locations. I mean, you have the, and you have the connector roadway in some of the unincorporated areas of the county, but as far as a defined expressway where there's limited access, but to your point, there's some areas that don't even have a sidewalk. Um, again, and you know, having heard about that yesterday and certainly recognizing the proximity by where people are living, uh, right, adjacent to an expressway that has limited access that encourages movement of motor vehicles, not that you don't encourage it on a, you know, streets like Arden or any of the other ones that go north and south, but Alta Arden is, is, it's called an expressway because that's by county definition in the Department of Transportation with the county, that was, uh, you know, a, a limited access roadway. Again, it may not have been a uh, key. It, it is a distinction, and this is not yeah. a hypothetical situation because as, as we discussed, someone was recently killed there, someone who was camping alongside of that roadway. So, I mean, yeah. to answer your question, I think, again, we do have authority to address that already in the county code. It's section, or uh, county code chapter 12.12. 12. And all of those things are included. Public right-of-way, sidewalk, public street. And I know we have... It's, again, comes down to prioritization and right. enforcement. Um, and I know, obviously, offering services is always um, part of our response. So it's... Absolutely. It's those three things combined. And, and I know, you know, for so many folks who were very frustrated about that situation and the inability 
to move some of those camps who we know we can tell they're they're causing um, um, traffic safety issues and other issues. And I know we've been working on it really ad, ad nauseum, some of these encampments. And um, then I, I think we, it's very frustrating that we're not able to resolve some of these situations. And so I know we'll keep having that. And I know there's a lot more to that story than what we're just, certainly than what we're just talking about here today. So, um, but I right. guess, you know, so, just to play off what, what uh, the chair was, was saying, I mean, is there, would there be a benefit in declaring an expressway itself um, as critical infrastructure, you know, as as distinguished from another roadway that's not high speed, that's not limited access. I mean, you know, because it is, it's almost analogous to a freeway, right? In some ways, I don't know. Is that is there value in that, or do you think it's well, not again, necessary? Well, again, I think we've uh, we've advised in the past to try and use existing resources to address that because we have the ability to do that, um, and then just address the thing, other critical infrastructure in this ordinance that's not covered by something else. So again, it's a policy decision from a legal perspective. I don't think it um, would be any better or any worse. Okay. I guess any better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe worse. Okay. Okay. And while, while certainly not yeah. answering the question about enforcement, I certainly can share that from a service perspective, we can and do, and, and definitely hearing at the board, prioritization of, of resources, including our outreach teams and shelters when they're available. We certainly can. Um, uh, lift those those types of areas up into, into priority. Um, at the end of the day, though, as Ms. Travis said, um, compliance is, is based on enforcement. I'm going to have to ask folks, I know that um, you know phones are with you for vital purpose, but if you have them on a ringer tone, please put them on silent. We've had a couple different ring tones here, and it uh, keeps us all awake, but we need to you know, be courteous to our speakers, please. So please turn, put your phones on silent if you can. Thanks. All right, Hannah, go ahead. Okay. Um, at board's direction, staff did do some directed outreach to interested stakeholders. Um, and I think you're going to likely hear from many of them today directly, but I do want to share some high level um, input we heard from three groups of stakeholders. Uh, first, staff met with one, uh, with representative. Rep uh, representatives from SMUD Regional Transit and multiple reclamation districts, as they all are owners of or managers of facilities that you may deem, want to deem critical infrastructure. Um, all were extremely helpful in explaining to staff the types of facilities that they operate and manage and some current challenges that they face, which I've highlighted up here. All of them um, shared with us that they have certain sites within their inventory of facilities that they are challenged with maintaining or accessing due to the presence of encampments. And sometimes that shifts as camps move around. Many of the public property owners shared with us concerns for the safety of their, t of their staff who are tasked with maintaining and operating these facilities as they are typically not social workers or um, law enforcement. Um, and all of them indicated that should the ordinance be adopted, they are willing and able to work with the county to prioritize specific facilities within their inventories that they have the most concern for um, and to address those in partnership with the provision of outreach and services that the county would be providing. Um, secondly, Ms. Bellis and I hosted a listening session where we invited key stakeholders from both the environmental advocacy world and the homeless advocacy world, and then separately each of us hosted an individual session, I with the homeless advocates and Ms. Bellis with the Parkway advocates. Um, because many of the comments that these two groups shared were very general and not specific to one or other particular ordinance, I'm going to summarize the key points from both of these constituencies, and Ms. Bellis will share some additional input um, from her presentation specific to the Parkway ordinance. Um, I do want to say that both of these groups strongly acknowledge the need for a, alternative locations for shelter and housing to address the needs of those living outside. That was a consistent message, and I think everybody understands that that is a priority of the board. Um, there were three overarching comments from the environmental advocates um, related to the critical infrastructure ordinance, um, many of which I think also would apply to the Parkway ordinance. Um, first, there was concerns over the environmental degradation of creeks and waterways from camps and from debris from camps. Second, there was concerns over the behavior and sometimes violence within encampments and the impact on the public's ability or comfort to enjoy those public spaces. And third, there was a very specific request for the board to consider um, 150 feet from any waterway as critical infrastructure um, as aligned with the state's fish and game code. 
Uh, finally, homeless advocates shared input in both sessions, which I've generally organized into seven main themes that you see here. First, and these are somewhat in order of frequency that we heard them, but, but perhaps not uh, precise. First, there was um, a lot of concern over the lack of adequate shelter and housing that is necessary to enforce either of the ordinances. Um, second, there was a concern about the impact of an ordinance on outreach teams, both professional and, um, and non-professional outreach teams' ability to provide people living in encampment with basic services. Third, there was a concern over punitive actions if people living in encampments don't voluntarily comply. Um, fourth, there was concerns that the critical infrastructure ordinance is being used to limit land that's available for people to be in and that the county may not have conducted mapping of those impacts. Fifth, there was a concern the ordinance does not align with best practices for delivering services to people experiencing homelessness. Sixth, there was concerns about the impacts of climate change and the um, racial justice impacts of the ordinances. And seventh, there was concerns that the county does not have sufficient places to store belongings if the ordinances are enforced. Um, Emily, before you go to the next sure. steps, I want to just kind of back to the uh, input you gathered. So um, you talked br briefly about where um, you know the prohibitions might fall, but could you just take a talk, talk a little more? Because again, I think as you just said you know, a shared concern for the availability of housing, of certainly concerns about the approaches about the ordinance construct, but maybe just give an example of how, not just you would envision, but obviously there's a lot of folks that are weighing in on this, and if uh, the ordinance were in effect, how would the, again, recognizing there are court decisions that, you know, are a backstop to, uh, you know, some of the construct of the ordinances themselves, but also to the way uh, we would, you know, would carry this out, the realities, though, of the you know the uh, unavailability of, of housing in any uh, great supply, if at all, in some cases. So, could you just take a, just a moment and maybe describe again, certainly you as the homeless coordinator, but recognizing that we're talking about park rangers, we're talking about uh, you know, social workers, mental health workers, law enforcement, uh, others who would be a party to uh, you know carrying out the the ordinance wherever it might be defined. So. Could you describe what you think the approach would be and how we would, as a county, carry that out? Because I guess that's key yeah. to some of the questions and concerns we're going to hear today. So. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I'm happy to, yeah. to do that. Um, obviously, we're working with limited resources on, on both ends. And so um, what I'd really uh, like to work on with our partners in law enforcement, with Ms. Bellis and her team, with our outreach staff, is um, some clear policies and procedures about how folks are deployed. They, you know, This is not... Um, there's a role for, for all of those entities. Um, we currently are doing a good job with the encampment services team of targeting priority camps. We don't have enough of them. So should the board pass this, I'm hoping for some direction on prioritization because this will become even a, a bigger task to prioritize. But um, you know what has worked well here in our community and has worked in other communities is a, a common understanding of sort of uh, what camps are prioritized and why, and are having a shared time frame to get to the end result and allowing for the, the pieces of the puzzle to work together. So for example, we send out the encampment teams, the social workers, the behavioral health, the peer specialist, for a concerted effort with, with the resources that, that you've created, the sheltering resources, the housing resources, and they spend a, a sufficient amount of time to really engage folks. And then followed, maybe not immediately, but pretty closely by the, the law enforcement arm. Um, but recognizing that both of those things need time. Um, and so we're going to have to um, be thoughtful about how we sequence it, as well as how we how we uh, direct those limited resources, because there's, there's hundreds of camps mm -hmm. today in the, in the county, um, and, and the parkway you throw that on. So um, that may not be as concrete of an answer, but there's certainly lots of examples in other communities who have successfully done this. Um, we obviously have the shared, I think what I can say is that all of the folks in the room have a shared goal that we don't want anybody to sleep outside. Right. So would you envision this, again, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I, again, I, I think as you've described it, though, so you send folks out to make the contact, and you've already done that in a number of cases. When you say target, it doesn't mean you're targeting for anything besides services and options that would be available to help folks both individually but certainly collectively and uh, 
um, deal with the impacts, both the human impacts of folks that are camped there, but also then the impacts that have uh, impacted neighbors and, and business folks and so forth. So when you send a team, team of folks out, um, are they going to have in their front pocket or their back pocket the ability to provide if if you approach me and I've been in a tent, I've been you know living in this location uh, as desperate as might be for several months. What are you going to just give me a, a hypothetical, but maybe it's a real. What what, what are you going to say to me? Are you going to say, well, you're going to have to move, and you know you can sign up to get substance abuse services, you know, a few months from now, or are you going to have a voucher, a housing option, a shelter option, maybe some other option mm -hmm. available to folks? Um, maybe it's a safe state community. Describe that. Yeah. I think it's important to know because, again, a lot of what we're hearing from folks, I can tell you certainly in the mail I've received, is, uh, as you said, there's this kind of common thread that ties people together. We want something done now, but we also want to help folks. What is it we're going to offer recognizing limitations on our resources? Right. So um, certainly the ideal from a social service uh, standpoint yeah. from providing folks with services is to have in your front and back pocket real access, real time access to real resources, yeah. whether it be shelter or housing that meets the needs of those individuals. Um, definitely evidence shows that people are more likely, uh, are going to voluntarily engage better when, when those resources are available in real time. When we don't have that is when it becomes more challenging, which I think is where you're getting at is that, yes. it is that we only have so much space. I know you're making every effort to build them up, but for example, when the Safe State community opens um, in the South area, that real resource will make our team's jobs so much more, not only easier, but impactful. Because people will say yes. It, it will take some time, but people will when you have an alternative place for them to be safe and stable and secure and, and have a pathway out of housing. I get that sometimes that doesn't align with with community concerns for for expediency, and it's and it. So my comments are really are on how you would provide social services and understanding that we need to orient those to the other side of the coin, which is an an, an interest to expedient be more expedient in um, in making a visible difference in, in how the community sees. Camps. Well, I think it, and that's the reality of, of what we're attempting to deal with here, you know, whether it's through the ordinance or through current you know, ordinances or current right. efforts. And, and, I, and I guess it would be important to point out is, you know, whether it's individual or it's a, a, a folks that have, you know, formed a family unit of some sort or some association, um, the ability then to look at the individual situations and if they have pets, they have possessions, they have, as a partners, but they have folks that are part of their unit to try to accommodate that within reason, uh, again, define within reason, but certainly to, to do that and be able to do that quickly. When you talk about uh, locations that are scattered throughout, certainly not just the unincorporated area, but throughout, you know, through the, the county, uh, uh, both in cities and in the county. So in any given point in time, though, we, we, you know, we talk about, we've said it, we've got 1,300 beds right. that are available. I, everything I see says they're full every night. Yes. And, and, we, and we haven't done anything under this ordinance uh, at all, right. uh, proposed or otherwise. So. Yeah, yeah, so I think that it's both, yes, and that is the challenge we're working under today, and, and we will be until we can um, both increase capacity but also increase flow. Um, so just as committed to, I, I know it was on the front slide and I didn't really dive into it, is creating that flow, right? And so the investments we're making into rehousing, into treatment services so that people can better connect into systems, um, because you're right, 1,300 beds, are they're probably all full tonight or very close to that. Um, and so we can only offer, we can't offer a, a full bed, we have to offer an empty yeah. Well, one last question, and again, it's, it's related because I think it's something we have we hear about pretty frequently, uh, uh, and, and, and is those that are already housing insecure, who may not be homeless, but right. we're on the very edge of being homeless or virtually homeless because they don't know if they're going to have a place to stay a, a week from now, a month from now, with the rental situation and so forth. Are we cooperating with, and again, I, it's kind of rhetorical, but I know the housing agency, what are we doing for folks that are right now on the edge? They may not be in the encampment and they, you know, maybe in and out of their car because they've got some temporary shelter situations, but what are we doing? Because that's another piece of right. beyond just providing housing or supportive housing or transitional or shelter is what are we doing to help people avoid that, uh, which, you know, is a far less desperate situation sometimes 
than folks who have been chronically homeless for, for, for years. And it, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, prevention is an activity that is what, that we need to focus more on. Um, a couple of things. First of all, some of our benefit programs, that is sort of what they are, right? They are safety net services to help lift people out of poverty, provide critical services. Um, there are some direct uh, assistance programs that we run through the Department of Human Assistance and other and other departments. Um, in addition, SHRE, you know, one of the, I guess, benefits of COVID, we got a, a pretty substantial amount of money for the ERAP program, Emergency Rental Assistance Program, um, which has made a, a pretty big impact, I think. Um, How many uh, folk, folks, I think I saw 7,400 families have been assisted? I, that sounds about right. It's, it's a lot. When you I think say about families, this, it could be individuals. But yeah, yeah, could, yeah, yeah, city yeah. and countywide. Um, so having programs like that that can help sort of fill those short-term gaps. Um, the landlord engagement program that we are uh, we're going to be operating is targeting um, primarily folks who are literally homeless, but who maybe we have a lot of folks who are like sitting on a, a voucher and can't translate that into housing. So having the ability to, to translate those and keep people with a subsidy in the housing unit is also critical. Um, but I agree, um, the 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 flow in is just as important as the flow out, yeah. But we are doing some things and, and certainly happy to, to look at other ways we can support those. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so finally, I just wanted to write a quick summary of the next step should you approve this critical infrastructure ordinance today. Um, the second reading and the formal adoption, I believe, is tentatively scheduled for August 23rd, which would mean the ordinance would be effective um, on September 23rd because it's a 30-day period. Um, before implementing the portions of the ordinance pertaining to critical infrastructure, as Ms. Travis just discussed, the board will need to adopt by resolution, or I guess resolutions, you could do this over time, um, specific sites that you deem critical infrastructure. Um, we will be, staff will be working, um, meeting, having additional meetings with other public property owners, as we did with SMUD and RT, to discuss their facilities and how this might impact uh, uh, programs they run. Um, finally, staff will be revising the encampment re response policy based on the ordinance and any additional direction that you give today. Um, this concludes my comments. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or if you'd like Ms. Bellis to present and then us both be open, I'm happy. Okay, uh, Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for the um, overview, Emily. The resolutions, um, I'm, I'm going to suspect that the resolutions, unlike the ordinances themselves, aren't as um, sensitive to very, very specific language that in, in large part is you know, based on um, case law and making sure that you know, we make, this, make ordinances as defensible as possible but that the resolutions have more latitude to include um, substantive language that um, could, to Supervisor Ntoli's uh, last um, series of questions, could uh, reference the county's efforts um, and successes thus far and intentions going into the future to extend capacity. You're talking about the resolutions to deem the critical infrastructure? Yeah. The examples I've seen from other cities, and, and Ms. Travis may, it, it, there tend to be more um, findings about the actual facilities themselves and what it is that deems them critical, like what what's the need to have this water treatment facility. I suppose, I, I don't know, I don't know if Ms. Travis wants to weigh in on what additional information could be added. Yeah, so the, um, the purpose of the the resolutions as it's defined in the ordinance is to um, alert the public as the Board of Supervisors finding as to why the infrastructure is vital or critical to the operation or functioning of the county, um, that its damage, incapacity, disruption, or destruction would have a debilitating impact on public health, safety, or welfare. So the intention is to really justify why the board is um, specifically designating infrastructure versus um, what you're alluding to. I, there's nothing that prohibits uh, yeah, the board I, from I, including that. But, yeah, um, I understand, I understand yeah. that. Um, but there's no denying that the, the two are inextricably linked here, whether it's you know, in ink on the, in the ordinance or the resolution or not. Um, there's an obligation for us to respect both sides of the equation the capacity building side as well as the efforts to protect, in this case, critical infrastructure. So it seems to me that if it's not going to um, legally uh, place, us, place us at any higher risk to look at language that could be put into the resolution that at least acknowledges what the county's efforts have been, are today, and in the future to add capacity, I would suggest today that we um, strongly consider that. Good point. 
Okay, <clears throat> any other questions for Emily before she gets to hand it over to Liz? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Stand by. Thanks for filling the questions and your presentation. Yep. Okay, Ms. Bellis. I also have a PowerPoint. Can you switch out the PowerPoints, please? Up. Good afternoon, Chairperson Natoli, members of the board, Liz Bellis, Director of Regional Parks. I will be giving an overview of the parkway ordinance today in my presentation. The American River Parkway and Dry Creek Parkways have special status. The Lower American River is designated both a federal and state wild and scenic river for the recreational values and fisheries. The continued impact of trash, debris, fires, and degradation of the Lower American River puts these recognized values at risk. The California State Legislature has also recognized the critical importance of the American River Parkway's resources through the enactment of additional laws, including the Urban American River Parkway Preservation Act, the Bushy Lake Preservation Act, the Lower American River Conservancy Program Act. Additionally, the state has allocated tens of millions of dollars for the protection, enhancement, restoration of, and additions to the parkway's natural and recreational resources. Both waterways provide pr critical habitat for several fish and wildlife species that are protected through Federal Endangered Species Act, the California Endangered Species Act, California Special Species of, or spe species of Special Concern Laws, and the Federal Migratory and Bird Treaty Act. The Dry Creek Parkway is the last remaining major open space riparian corridor in the North County. The parkways are not designed to accommodate extended camping. The infrastructure necessary to support such activity is not present, and the lack of these amenities leads to unsanitary and unsafe living conditions. It is not a simple matter of placing extra dumpsters or bringing in additional portable restrooms. Both parkways serve as the closest regional park sites for nearby disadvantaged and severely disadvantaged communities. Negative impacts to these recreational outlets further impact these communities and residents. Anecdotally, I have been told numerous stories from people who grew, out, grew up recreating on the American River Parkway or along the Dry Creek Watershed who no longer choose to do so because of the impacts they see from the trash, debris, and fires. These are just a few examples of the impacts on our parkways. I unfortunately have hundreds more pictures just like this. The trash, debris, and fires are destroying our natural resources. It will take years and many millions of dollars to fully restore these park lands. The estimated cost to actively restore 250 acres is $11.25 million and would take about three to five years to accomplish. The number of fires in our parks have more than doubled since 2017, and several hundred acres are burned each year. Despite the ongoing preventative efforts undertaken by regional parks and the quick response from our fire agencies, these fires put those who live on the parkways in grave danger, as well as our first responders. Often, these fires reveal hidden encampments deep in the brush that contain propane tanks or barbecues which become safety hazards to those responding to the fires and increase the potential at risk of injury. If not for the efforts of our staff and volunteers that have dedicated hundreds of hours to remove the trash and debris from our parkways, it would end up in our waterways, and I'm sure some folks here today will attest to the fact that a lot of it already has made it into the creek beds and tributaries. In 2021, rangers issued 84 citations for the Fish and Game Code, section 5652, which is littering within 150 uh, feet of the high water mark for the waters of the state. And year to date, we have issued 122. It is an unfortunate fact that unsheltered individuals are victims to many crimes. Emergency response to unsheltered individuals living in parks is limited to geographical issues, terrain, narrow roadways, dirt and gravel fire roads, and trails. 
these limitations become even more significant during the hours of darkness. This puts people camping at risk should there be the need to respond due to fire, flood, medical emergency, or other disaster. Furthermore, our ranger staff, who serve as the primary law enforcement for the Sacramento County Regional Park System, do not work 24 seven. In summer, the late shift typically ends at 11 p.m. and in the winter, it varies between 10 p.m. to 8 p.m. I'd like to point out that in 2021, there were six homicides in the parkway and all of these victims were residents living near or in the parkway. Um, public outreach was held on July 27th via a Zoom call with interested stakeholders and an in-person meeting on August 4th specific to Parkway stakeholders. Ms. Halcon already addressed the main themes from these public outreach sessions within her presentation, so I will not be repeating those. And the board has obviously received additional written public comment, which has been included as part of the meeting record for today. It is recommended that the board introduce and waive the full reading of an ordinance amending chapter 9.36 of Sacramento County Code relating to fires remaining in the parkways between sunset and sunrise, and prohibiting camping or constructing, maintaining or inhabiting any structure or camp facility within the American River and Dry Creek Parkways, and continue until August 23rd for adoption. This concludes my presentation. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Liz. We do have some questions by board members. Uh, Phil? Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Liz, for the, uh, for the brief presentation. Um, you know, we, we hear from you very often on a number of items that um, are certainly in your wheelhouse as our regional parks director, but I can't help but uh, take notice of, and, and now I want to publicly acknowledge the, the fact that your tone is a bit different uh, today, and I think that's reflective of the passion that you, you hold as our um, chief steward for our regional park system, and I applaud you for that. Um, at our workshop before we had, um, before we got to this point today to consider adoption of the two ordinances, um, there was, I think, some good discussion at the board um, that was the product of public testimony at the time um, about whether or not um, there was enough in the infrastructure, uh, proposed infrastructure ordinance and concept that it could or should or would protect uh, the American River Parkway in particular. And if you recall, um, I was very adamant, as I think uh, Supervisor Desmond was, that because of the import of uh, the parkway uh, and later the Dry Creek Parkway that was um, um, added by Supervisor Frost, uh, but primarily the American River Parkway, because it's such a unique um, asset uh, and uh, cherished by uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in our in our local region that it deserves of you know very specific focus vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, a dedicated um, ordinance uh, to protect it um, so I'm um, it's not often I, I kind of show my cards um, as perhaps as blatantly as I am right now before we hear from the public uh, but I will say that um, I appreciate uh, everyone whether you're you identify with a specific park, uh, parkway advocacy organization or not, or you're simply someone that, as Ms. Bella said, that used to enjoy uh, recreating in the parkway but no longer does because of its condition. Uh, I appreciate um, the time that you've taken to uh, send in your emails, place your calls, uh, reaching out to all five of us. Um, I, you know, have the unique. Um, privilege and challenge of, of representing the lower reach of the Lower American River Parkway, which extends uh, roughly from the H Street Bridge down to the confluence of the American River, which um, arguably is um, un and unfortunately home to the greatest number of folks that are um, participating in unsanctioned um, habitation on the parkway. And of course, today is yet another balancing act for the board to consider that being um, the responsibilities and obligations we have uh, to protect and be good stewards of the parkway uh, for its ecosystem, for its recreational um, uh, you know, condition. Uh, and of course, um, to do so compassionately and with forethought for how we are going to 
extend services to those that feel their only option is to habitat in the parkway. Uh, but given the fact that uh, almost with every passing year and season, we see more and more uh, devastating fires. We see and hear about uh, more and more uh, water pollution, contamination, um, and unfortunately, as was cited in Ms. Bellis's uh, uh, um, PowerPoint, uh, the criminal activity that's uh, unfortunately going on in the parkway. What I didn't see too, by the way, was um, uh, the fact that there, because I get the emails from my constituents, there are a number of um, uh, instances where there are off-leash dogs that uh, are not controlled by their owners, and that has dissuaded a good number of folks from uh, enjoying the parkway. And let's not forget, this is about also protecting those that um, are in the parkway now. Um, God forbid um, we get to your next uh, PowerPoint presentation at some time in the future and you're telling us about someone that died in a wildland fire or a first responder that was responding to a wildland fire and was injured. Um, so again, it's a balancing act, but um, as someone who has um, spent every single day since being elected to this board uh, trying to be uh, a good elected uh, steward of the parkway, um, I'm telling everyone right now, I am not only encouraged by uh, what I've read in terms of the, the uh, ordinance, uh, but I will be uh, supporting it. So thank you. Thanks, Phil. Okay, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Supervisor Cerna. I mean, I, I appreciate your um, dedication to the parkway and your um, initiative in, 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 in bringing this to the board, um, and, I, and I too support it. I, I think that, uh, it, you know, so many people, how many people in Sacramento live here because we love this parkway? Or we have, I look at all the people raising their hands in the, in the, in the audience today. It is, it is, um, a, a, an amazingly beautiful, unique amenity that we have in this county that most folks in the state don't have. And it's not just people who live right next to the parkway. It is, Liz, you alluded to that, that there are a lot of folks from disadvantaged communities that have this um, um, environmental amenity very close to their home, and it's an opportunity for them to get out in nature and experience this this beautiful riparian habitat that is being uh, completely destroyed. And Supervisor Cerna undoubtedly has a disproportionate amount of, I think, the encampments and a lot of the degradation that, that's happening in his district. But it's happening all throughout the parkway. Um, and and we have a, a compelling obligation to do more to protect the campers out there, I'm not gonna repeat everything Supervisor Cerna said, but I agree with him 100%. Um, he and I, several of us have spoken to um, campers out on that parkway. I know Supervisor Natoli did as well when we did a, a cleanup not too long ago. And it's amazing how many of the campers themselves say that it's such a dangerous place to be out on that campway. So our obligation is not only to them, uh, to the resource itself, to the, the users of the parkway. Um, and, and that obligation is, not only to have tools like this to uh, prohibit camping where it should not be occurring, but an equal obligation to find alternatives for, for people. And, and Liz, you and I have had this discussion many times. Uh, Supervisor Cern and I have had this discussion many times with other uh, parkway advocates about finding these alternatives that are, that are suitable alternatives. I'm not just talking about a, setting up a, a parking lot somewhere. Safe and secure alternatives that provide a level of privacy and dignity where we can connect people with services to get them treatment they need and, and ultimately into the housing um, that they need. Um, I had a question on this specifically um, maybe for, for county council. Um, we've had some discussions about the enforcement of this, and you know, we've, we've heard some comments about there being a giant sucking sound coming from the parkway into other parts of the county. Um, and I, I think I'm, I'm probably joined by my colleagues here in um, stating unequivocally that it is not the case that the county is going to all of a sudden start sweeping every camper off the parkway. I mean, that's immoral. It's illegal under under uh, Boise versus Martin. But, but some of the discussions we've had, um, and I'm looking at, at our county council, is I imagine there are 
there are locations that exist right now that that maybe it's a clear and and present danger to the campers themselves, the parkway, first responders, um, where we could go in and, and enforce, if, if this passed, we could move someone out of an encampment if it meets certain criteria. Could you, could you comment on that, um, um, Lisa, if you don't mind? Sure. So there's several aspects, I think, to your question. Uh, one is abating the camps and moving campers, and then the second side of that is criminally enforcing against um, people that are residing there. So, um, and Liz and her team and Emily and her team can probably speak to this better, but um, my understanding is that at this point, we are abating camps, meaning cleaning up debris and working with the folks that are living there to do so asking for voluntary compliance um, in cases where there is a clear and present risk to the campers or natural habitat. Um, under this ordinance, if, for instance, um, an area was shown to be uh, very prone to wildfires um, and we could get the fire marshal or the city fire department to show that the, there is a danger to the habitat, to the residents, to um, anything in the parkway, then we could try to enforce this ordinance. And that is different than what we're currently doing, which is asking for voluntary compliance. Okay. Um, and additionally, and I think Liz and Emily would be best to address this, in every case that the county goes and engages with folks living in these um, encampments, they're always offered a variety of different services, including Again, uh, uh, I will. Okay, let, we need to, to. Again, you may have a very strong opinion about it, but we can't have people just calling out, please. So please, you'll get an op okay. You'll get an opportunity to come to the podium. You can speak to the. You can come speak to the matter, but we need to maintain some, you know, again, courtesy when you get up. We're not going to be you know, allowing folks to. Okay. Okay, sir. Please, you have an opportunity to come to the podium in a moment. Okay. Thank you. Again, my understanding of the situation is such that I believe that that is how the uh, the situation is approached. I will again defer to staff to do that um, to confirm that. Okay, that's helpful. No, I, I appreciate that, and I think they're you know they're probably. I, I mean, for instance, if a, if say the fire marshal Sac Metro determines a specific location is hey this is a, this is a safety hazard to first responders if there's a fire it's a safety hazard to the campers and there's evidence of a, a fire maybe that just occurred there I mean th these are all factors I would imagine that would be taken into account correct but I, I but I, I for one and 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 I also want to Liz I want to um, underscore what Supervisor Cerna said. I mean, it is um, clearly you are very passionate about this as well. I know you're living it every day and you're seeing the uh, uh, the, the devastation on the parkway and, and the dangers to the campers and the users and the first responders. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, and I, 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 for one, I'm, I'm supportive of this and certainly supportive of having a larger discussion about how we find alternatives so we can we can utilize if this passes today, we can utilize this tool to the fullest extent while making sure we, we do so in a, a uh, um, moral, um, uh, compassionate, and certainly in an approach that, that is within the bounds of the law, but finding alternatives for people so they can uh, turn their lives around and get the services and supports they need. So thank you. Okay. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, and to that last point, I think it's a very important one that um, Mr. Desmond just mentioned. I, I do want to um, cite something very specific to the parkway that um, is a, it's an added resource, um, and I'm hopeful that um, Ms. Pagetto, who was the executive director for the American River Parkway Foundation, who I expect will be uh, testifying this afternoon, uh, per perhaps could provide more detail about. But during our uh, recommended uh, budget hearings uh, this past June. Uh, this board has um, set aside, allocated uh, $5 million. It's something we've never really done before, but set aside $5 million with the express uh, intent and the purpose being uh, to help the foundation with uh, its uh, capital campaign uh, to fundraise uh, for specifically for the acquisition of sites. Uh, so that um, when we find that there is someone that is uh, camping on the parkway and uh, we are enforcing this ordinance, should it again be adopted today, uh, that we actually have a very specific place where they can go. 
And so um, I think it's important for everyone in this room and, and that's watching and who may testify by phone later, understand that we've already set in motion uh, some of the resources necessary to add that capacity specifically for the purpose of um, benefiting the parkway. Okay, thanks, Phil. Uh, Liz, before you leave the podium, just to kind of follow on to what I asked Emily earlier about the approach, and obviously um, the Rangers have, um, you know, certainly some experience uh, having, you know, many of them worked the parkway for a number of years. But what would be the approach in the parkway? Again, it's one thing to seek to get voluntary uh, compliance, but if there was going to be an enforcement, could you just briefly detail what that entails? Because again, we've heard from folks about their possessions, the pets, the partners, uh, and if you know, and, and again, but they have not, they have not been subject to a criminal citation uh, like this ordinance would would have. So I guess I'm again to the the way that it has been and and, and would be approached, and we talk about the resources available to critical infrastructure locations. Um, I don't want to presume, but I'll let you talk to it. But, you know, what sort of um, resources are available t to you, to the rangers, uh, in approaching uh, this issue in the parkway, which would have a, a certain call out to it, so. Certainly, so our current approach, and this will be remaining the same, it's outlined in our action plan, is we will be providing the resources we work directly with the navigators that your board has approved for specifically for the parkway as well as DHA staff to go and do outreach to the encampments. We do this on several occasions before we would provide what is called a 48 hour notice to vacate. Um, and after that point in time, after the 48 hour has uh, passed, sometimes even longer than that, depending on the situation, we go back out there to ensure that uh, folks have picked up their belongings. If they are unable to take all of their belongings with them, we will store items. We have a, um, we have a storage facility at CubeSmart where belongings are stored for 90 days. And then we clean up and abate the camps, the trash and debris that is left behind. So, and maybe this is for Lisa, as we talked about with regards to critical infrastructure and some other definitions under the um, item two, is there a um, requirement that there be alternative shelter offered to folks um, as a part of this, or this would be have a prohibition that would, be for other reasons that are stated in the ordinance, again, recognizing you can uh, approach it with, you know, uh, humanely, but also it has a different, a little different force and effect if I, if I read this correctly. So could you explain that, Lisa, how this may or may not be distinctive from what was item number two? Oh. In either, neither of the yeah. ordinances, that requirement that you referenced is specifically called out. Okay. However, anything that the county does to facilitate an abatement of a camp must be done in conformance with state, local, federal law. Okay, so what Emily described to respond to my question earlier would be, because I heard a navigator, but a navigator doesn't necessarily come equipped with you know, the ability to find housing. They can tell people where they might find a resource. They can certainly be of an assist. Some of the DHA folks may have some of that ability. So it's just the same team of folks with the exception of rangers versus, again, it's different. Because what I heard Emily say, that you would go in in advance with social service teams, encampment teams, professionals that would offer some level of resources or services, and then that would be followed behind Again, she was, you know, pointing out, you know, there need to be some time lag in there with potentially law enforcement. In this case, does the ranger go in initially? And, you know, what sort of time frame there, recognizing some of the criticality of the, of the habitat and some of the urgency people are going to tell us about later today. But so I, I'm just want to have an understanding, is it going to work the same way in the parkway as it works for critical infrastructure or for other areas that are designated either high risk and or adjacent to shelter uh, as called out in the previous ordinance, or in ordinance in under, under number two. Correct, so we operate under the same manner in that we bring out staff. This is a social services side staff to offer the resources. And then we follow up with our ranger staff afterwards. So, but there is, 
a bit of time. It's not just a, here you go, here's your resources. Next day, there's a, a, a notice to vacate put on your camp. Okay. We, are, we are giving them time to process the resources. We are going out multiple times, or we're having the social services side of our house go out on multiple occasions to try and uh, provide outreach to the, those uh, campers. One of the things that's been spoken to here many times in chambers and certainly in, in, in recent months has been um, the fact that uh, a number of folks do have animals uh, and uh, they do that likewise if they're, you know, outside of the parkway, I trust too. But so we have a trained professional, somebody from our shelter staff, again, recognize the parkway cuts across both city and county lines that will be available to assist uh, with that or is that just under the blanket of a social worker, you got to know about what's available, behavioral health, what's available for substance abuse, what's available for your animals, uh, should you try to make other arrangements? I have had uh, a few conversations with our director of animal uh, care and regulation um, about that. Uh, she has already made one visit out to the parkway. We are making arrangements for her to take another visit out to the parkway so she has an understanding of the needs uh, of the unhoused pets that are in the area so that we could develop a plan of action. Okay. Thanks, Liz. Any other questions for Liz or Emily? Okay, very good. Okay, so those are our staff presentations. Uh, we do have, as I noted earlier, uh, numerous speakers. Uh, we did have uh, two parties who made arrangements uh, to uh, do presentations flow. So we, are we going to take those in that order first? Is that the intent? Yeah, as long as they're here. Um, okay. I'm not sure if you received speaker slips for those two individuals. Well, I didn't sort it all the way through the stack. I think I saw both of the parties here in the chamber, so. So uh, for the one with videos, whenever they are uh, ready, and whatever order you go in, I, I realize that there's a first in, first out. Uh, the yeah. Metro Cable is prepared to present. Okay. That information. So let me do this. Let me, let me, uh, Sacramento picks up, uh, made arrangements to have some videos and uh, speakers. And then we had a uh, person who just requested two additional minutes uh, under public comment, made arrangements prior to, and that's Mr. Uh, Davi Rodriguez. So let's do this. Let me, and then we'll go to, to the speakers who have signed up here today. Um, so I'm going to call forward Sacramento picks up. Uh, and I guess we have videos that are, have been many prearranged for them to show. <clears throat> so who's representing Sacramento Picks Up? The person that's in charge of our video archives is not here. Not here yet? Okay, so we want to hold on that then? And she had hip surgery. Oh. So if, if there's a, a way to show the videos without the, her being, she's on the phone. Okay, I think there she's is. not physically present. Okay, so get, all right, so the clerk's going to make arrangements, so. But I'm still, at the end, is the person on the phone, is she going to be the initial presenter then for that? Or are one of you going to, we can show, we can show the videos, but, and have you all, you've all signed up individually? Have you all yes. signed? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Did you sign up as a group, sir, or were you all kind of scattered in the in the mix here? Okay, so, um, well, why don't I do this? Why don't maybe have one of you come up, or if she's on the phone, we can go ahead and show the videos. That'll count as as that testimony, and I'll call you individually as we come through here. So, uh, who's the party that's on the phone? Sure. Chairperson yeah. Natoli, there isn't a way for us to pick her out of the queue on okay. the phone. She didn't make special arrangements to call in on a special line or for us okay. to. So can someone here be the representative to come up and okay. open up the whatever yeah, why, they want to say and then and, we'll and, get and, the yeah, video. Okay, that's good. Thanks, Flo. Okay. And I understand we can show two of the videos. On one of them, there's a copyright issue relative to the music that accompanies this, so we're not going to be able to show that one. So, okay. uh, so if you want, I just got to do a brief introduction. I won't take it off your time, and then when, when Deborah gets on the phone, we can allow her to make some additional comments, but... Okay. Did, did you want me to... Because I had, irrespective of this, I had things to say. No, I'm going to call so. you. So just so if you want to just introduce, what are we going to okay. see? Okay, I'm David Ingram. I'm, yeah. I'm a local attorney. I've lived in Sacramento for 25 sure. years. I am a volunteer with Sacramento Picks It Up, and I clean yeah. up waterways. Sure. So we have a group of over 2,000 volunteers that are trying to 
save save our waterways, basically. Great. And, so, and what are we going to see, David? What, what, what are the videos? I'm not, I'm not sure which one is the one that's copyrighted. We did um, get it on Facebook by challenging that because we're basically environmentally uh, we're environmental advocates. So I think that this is a thousand foot stretch of Arcade Creek that we uh, okay. cleaned last two weeks ago, two weekends ago. Okay. And All we pulled right. out about 12,000 pounds of trash and one thousand only just 1,000 feet of Arcade Creek. Okay. So we're going to roll the video. That's good. This is helpful. So then we know what we're looking at here. Okay. So. Okay. Go ahead. And this video was taken by Mark Baker, who's present here. Okay. I should say that we, our plan was to, to clean a mile of this creek. We, we did 1,000 feet. The creek's 16.2 miles long. And we basically did 0.2 miles. 60 volunteers on Saturday and 45 on Sunday. And no one, no one else is obviously cleaning this up, so it's up to volunteers to do this work. Arcade Creek runs into Steelhead Creek, which runs straight into Sacramento, which runs obviously into the Delta and the Pacific. So basically this is Sacramento's gift to our downstream neighbors and the communities that Arcade Creek runs through. And this was all in the section that you cleaned? Uh, I, think it, I think this goes was, beyond. This was uh, from Real Linda Boulevard to Marysville Boulevard, I believe. Okay. Three quarters of a mile. Okay, thanks. But we, we only cleaned, okay. oh, again, we only cleaned 1,000 feet. Right. 12, over 12,000 pounds out of the actual creek bed, which is dry right now. We didn't go up on the levees or anywhere. This was actually in the creek. <clears throat> okay, thanks. All right. This is uh, on Garden Highway, uh, between Garden Highway and Steelhead Creek. We cleaned up an abandoned encampment here. Um, we've cleaned up a two or three. They move pretty fast. <laughs> I think this is yeah. Allison's yeah. working. She yeah, you likes us to work quickly. With a she has a whip. You can do 1,000 <laughs> feet an hour. So we, uh, this was, uh, I don't know if this was the one where we cleaned out, I think, 30,000 pounds of trash in two days. It's super arduous work. It's very, very physically demanding. Um, uh, we actually get down under all of the, the stickers and get poison oak. No one, again, no one's doing this. And it's very, very physical and arduous. And this is an area that's been reoccupied since we cleaned it. <clears throat> The county was out and, and helped us transport. They're not allowed to get out and do the, the manual labor, but they transported the, the trash for us, the garbage, the debris. It's just embedded. Very, very physical. We do this every weekend. Every weekend we do this, somewhere. And we, some weekends we only go 50 feet in one creek with 30, 40 volunteers. This camp was more than 25 feet from the creek, by the way, speaking to the, our request that we use 150 foot buffer from the, this creek would not be, if this creek was outside of the American River Parkway, it would not be protected under the critical infrastructure. This camp would not be restricted under the critical infrastructure law ordinance that's proposed before you. These camps were all abandoned? Yes. Okay. We, we never, we will work 
with active encampments to help. We provide garbage bags. We help educate them. We teach them how to use the 311. We are not anti-unhoused. We work with them as much as we can, and we always touch bases and try to get their assistance, and many times it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but we, we have not had any problems. We've been doing this for 18 months. So we go into places that no one else will go into, and we do things that other agencies can't because we actually go in and, and use our volunteer status to work collectively with people instead of against them. I think I've asked this question before, but uh, are, do you have a formal um, nonprofit tax ID? We don't. So you have a fiscal uh, agent that you work with? We, we work with the Creeks Council. Okay. When you say physical agent. No, no, fiscal, fiscal. Oh, fiscal? Uh, yeah, we, we use the, the Creeks Council that okay. kind of oversees. I mean, we only, we operate on like, I think we have 3,000 bucks or something that's Well, that's my point. That's my point is, yeah. um, I think I've, um, I've attempted to um, help a little with some um, discretionary funds from our office, but uh, I'm, I'm just curious, is there a way, because we've offered help to other organizations that actually do have their own uh, nonprofit tax status, right. which makes it a little easier to, right. to use uh, funds from our district uh, accounts. But this is extraordinary work like so many other organizations, Parkway Foundation, other, other organizations um, certainly would love to help with that, especially when you're telling me that you're you know, operating on a shoe, shoestring here. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's all volunteers, and the, basically we just try to pay for our tools because they break. You know, we, have, we bought all of our own tools, shovels, wheelbarrows. We have come-alongs that we pull carts out of the creek with. It's, I mean, this is just a small sample of what we do. This is just a three days. This is Arcade Creek, uh, 1,000 to 1,100 feet upstream of Rio Linda Boulevard. This is what we collected. Um, towards the end of our second day that we didn't have time to get out of the creek. We're going back this Sunday to resume work in this section. Um, it's just overwhelming. It really is overwhelming. That's a question we're watching. Just, just, just to be crystal clear with our county council. So when this comes back to at the resolution stage, if the board were to pass this today, the board could declare these waterways specific. We'd have to do it specifically as critical infrastructure. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. These water, our, our drinking water, does come from all these tributaries. I mean, there's there's nothing that filters all this water out before it gets to the sec, to the American River, Did, the Sacramento River. I, I want to make sure you heard that exchange. Yeah, I did. Okay, because you had you'd made the comment earlier that you said nothing in the ordinances will affect this, and that's not necessarily true. What, the 25-foot buffer would allow some of these camps that we were, that are near the waterways to exist legally. With the 25, our, we want the code, the ordinance to comply with state quality water law, which is the Fish and Game Code that was mentioned earlier. In the presentation, uh, under, understood. Okay. But to the point that Supervisor Desmond just made and was affirmed by our uh, county council, there under the critical infrastructure ordinance, there would be an, a, an ability to enforce some some of the aspects of uh, what's in that ordinance for under critical infrastructure based on what's in the resolution that's forthcoming that designates very particular waterways. Yeah, but, but again, is the waterway the specific waterway or is it the high water mark? And that was, that's something that I believe we were it's, gonna Well, it remains to be seen, but I, I believe it's gonna be the waterway. I don't okay. know that we're gonna talk about high water marks. Well, that's, that's taken directly from the state fish and game code. So that's, that's why we want to talk about it, so that your ordinance doesn't conflict with the actual state water code. The ordinance the doesn't water. conflict with that now. It's the, 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 that's but, reserved but it for could. the... Hold on. It's reserved for the discussion of the resolution, not the ordinance. Right, right, right. Okay. I, I got you. Hey, thanks, David. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you for narrating. We'll get a chance to you know, call you when you come. Thanks for coming up. Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. I did, th th thank you for that exchange. Um, I, I guess... 
I, I, just a li I just want a little more clarification on that particular subject, and that's that he says that he wants us to conform with basically what is state law. I mean, state law trumps county ordinance. Uh, so where, where's the disconnect here? I'm not exactly sure what, I mean, I think I know what he's asking for, but as far as your question about which trumps, I think he's wanting the definition of at least waterways that it's designated critical infrastructure of 150 feet uh -huh. within or from a waterway, I think. High water mark. High water mark. Okay. So, so, so the fish and game, maybe you want to get back up. You know, I, I just, the gentleman that was just up here, please. Yeah, I'm going to be addressing that, and I'll have the actual Okay, okay, then I'll, 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 I'll uh, wait, I'll hold my question. Okay, Jim, when you come up, we'll give Lisa a chance to take a look at yep. it while we're... Waiting for that. Okay, so I had one other speaker who had asked for uh, two additional minutes, and that's Davi Rodriguez. Davi? Yeah, I saw him her earlier. Mr. Rodriguez, Davi? Did he step out, Darrell? Okay, well, we'll call on him a little later on, but I wanted to, those were two that made previous arrangements, so all right, with that, uh, we'll uh, go into our speakers. Um, uh, again, I have, I'm gonna go through this in the order they were handed to me. I have those that signed up for item two, those that signed up for item two and three, and those that signed up for three. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go to the uh, first uh, uh, party who apparently has uh, some uh, others who are going to take 30 seconds each to, uh, either, I guess, agree or, or add their comments. And so, John Honeypole, John. Good afternoon, John. So, good afternoon. My name is John Honeypole. I'm a resident of a mobile uh, home park at uh, Sunrise in Coloma, which you have visited before. Um, the first thing I want to state is we're here to support uh, anything that can alleviate this quote, homeless, unquote, issues in our state. Uh, I've brought 12 of the residents here that'll make some brief comments. I spoke to you uh, last month uh, regarding what I call the elderly abuse that the residents of the Mobile Country Club ex experience every day and have experienced for a couple of years here. So uh, my issue is really with the health and safety, and I'm not trying to solve anybody's homeless problem. Uh, and we're talking about the ordinance that we want to support, but laws without enforcement seem to be useless. Now, we have the Sacramento County codes. A lot of people have addressed certain things here, but we already have codes and ordinances that address this stuff. For example, uh, 6.16, 6 you can't discharge stuff into the river unlawfully. It's already in the, in the code, so why don't we enforce it? Uh, dumping is prohibited uh, in, in any of these waterways. It's already in our codes. Uh, we talked about noise affecting the residents of the Mobile Country Club. Uh, you have a noise ordin ordinance here that says, hey, you can't do this. We talked about the motorcycle that comes up the Citrus Road every night to deliver drugs, making all of the noise and everything. You already have an ordinance, 6.68, that says you can't do that. So you have it, but you don't enforce it. While you were there visiting that, if you recall, we had one of the residents of that homeless community come walking up the trail with his boom box for so loud that we had to cease our conversation until he had passed. You have an ordinance in here, 6.68, that says you can't do that. Uh, we have general noise regulations, and now the noise affects these elderly living in those mobile homes because they're elderly. Noise hurts people. Uh, you, we have the ordinances that says you can't do it. Um, then I heard some other comments here about the shopping carts. You know, you already have an ordinance here that says you can't possess a shopping cart. You can only use the shopping cart for what it was intended for. So, you know... If you don't have the enforcement of the ordinance that we're supporting that you pass, it's going to be meaningless. So, so that's really all my comments, and I want to allow my other 
residents to go ahead and make their comments about how they've been affected, okay? Thank you. Okay, John, before you leave, so thank you for your comments. So do they fill out individual forms or they're, they're piggybacking with you? How did, how did Well, they did, but it would be easier if they just came up and- Okay, we, just identify yourselves, because again, I got a, right. a whole handful Barbara, here, so. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you again for okay. have, letting us speak, okay. and thank you to the presentations. Um, I could show you pictures, but the same pictures are what you see here. But I do have something that occurred, that occurs all the time, every day, at night, a lot of times at night, but I had one this morning. I, I wanted a resident to come. She has a lot of anxiety. And like me, she has an autistic daughter. She's terrified. Her daughter is in the back room. The camp is right behind her. This is what happened right behind her. This is every day, night, morning, it doesn't matter what time. They're screaming and yelling at each other, dogs barking all day and night. I can't, I'm in the middle of the park and I deal with this. I ask, my, I ask the residents, please call me because I'll videotape. I will take pictures and I appreciate your time on this and I'll let somebody else speak because I know it affects us all. Just give us your name again, if you could. Barbara. Good. Okay, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. Okay. My name is Michelle. Hi, Michelle. And mentally and physically, it's drained me in the last year and a half. I can't even think straight anymore because the yelling. It just seems like the I'm, I'm not right at the very end, but I I hear all the loud music. It's just it's frustrating. I just hope you guys are gonna help us on this because it's draining me. And I got an accident in at work three years ago, and I'm trying to heal. It's kind of hardy healing. And cut constantly when they're just ripping you off, coming in and ripping us off. I can just I'm jump five and a half foot fence, no problem. You know, and I'm just trying to get rest. At two o'clock in the morning, he was banging, he was ticking, tick, 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 tick. You know, M80s are going up. And so it's like you get your sleep's getting interrupted. Thank you. Thanks for, for listening to me. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for coming down today. Hi. Hello, my name's Lori. Hi, Lori. Um, my first thing I want to tell you is that I am tired. I have been up since four o'clock this morning listening to that. They were right behind my fence, 10 feet away from my bedroom. And I go through this every single day and every single night. I can't go use my backyard because it smells like urine and other things. And I just found out yesterday, we have dead dogs in the tributary behind where these people are living, behind my home and these other people's homes. This is not okay. 
I'm tired and I'm done. These people jump over our fences. They rip us off. It's, and the noise level is incredible. Harleys are delivering drugs now. We hear them, and I can tell you exactly what's going to happen after that Harley gets there. The people that were behind my house this morning at 4 o'clock screaming, it was probably because they were coming down. And I, I have the police on speed dial. Um, they don't stop. They don't care. As John said, they, there's ordinances. We call the police. They come out. They say our hands are tied. There's nothing we can do. If any one of us in this room did what they did, we would be cited or in jail. This is not OK with me. I'm done. I've been doing this for two years. I can't use my own backyard. I can't have company. I have turned my family away because I don't want them living in this horrible situation. We have to get help. We are retired. We, some of us are unhealthy. A lot of our people, the demographics are that we have 60, 70, 80, 90 year old people in there. This is the group that, that is healthy enough to come and fight for us. We need to get them out. We need to get this stopped. I'm done. I don't know what else I can do. The woman this morning was screaming her head off. Ouch, how do you think that makes me feel? I can't go outside my front door and see if she's okay. None of us will go outside our front doors anymore. Dark? Nope, we're done. Can't have a bicycle because they'll come and take it right during the middle of the day. They do not abide by the law. If I have to, then they have to. We need help. I don't know what else to ask you, but this is the most horrible situation to live through every single day and every single night. There is not one moment's peace for any of us there. It's frightening. I need your help, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. My name's Larry Brown. Hi, Larry. And the people that you just heard, or my colleagues, we live in the same place. Now we, my wife and I, live next to the wall. And just on the other side of the wall is the encampment. Now there are micro particles coming over that wall. I know that because we have to wash our cars every day. If, if those micro particles are light enough to come over there, there's other things that are light enough to come over. If there's a pandemic breaks out in that park, with our immune systems, I'm 84. I would like to have some peace and quiet in the last years of my life. That's why we moved there, so that we could live out our lives in peace. We gave, I didn't retire until I was 70, and I gave my life to society with blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, I see some of you guys are not exactly spring chickens. <laughs> so you got you got to know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Must be talking about me, huh? <laughs> yeah, you're a kid. <laughs> but anyway, listen. I will arm wrestle you anytime, sir. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> listen, it's all about th you know, this is just life, right? It's just life. And but we have to put up with certain things in our lives. But we don't have to put up with this. We should have some protection. You know, the last meeting that I went to with the police down at the clubhouse, I listened for 45 minutes to hearing about all of the rights the homeless had, and we didn't even get 15 minutes of our rights. Listen, we're, we're, we're kind of held captive here. We're invested in this. Our lives are invested in this. This is where we want to live in a gated community that's supposed to be safe. It's supposed to be healthy. It's supposed to be good. 
This is a four-star park, and you're knocking it down. You're not, but somebody's knocking it down to about a one-star. Okay? I, mean, I, I didn't mean to get uh, radical, but, <laughs> but I am. So anyway, that's all I got to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Larry. Thanks for being down here. John? So you heard from a few of the, of the residents there, you know, it's a 500 resident park or more. Again, the laws are on the books. Let's enforce the laws. Let's, you know, let's make it, you know, I, I can't solve the homeless problem. But this is not the way people are supposed to behave and inflict that kind of damage on the residents there. Thank you. Thanks, John. Supervisor Desmond. Just briefly, thank you, John, and all of you for coming out here. Uh, Supervisor Natoli and I went out there with you, um, and it just, it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's inexcusable, it's appalling what you're going through. You know, we, we spend so much time here on this, on this dais figuring out ways we can help the folks who are living unsheltered in terms of more behavioral health services, in terms of more shelter for them. But damn it, we need to protect our, all of our constituents. And we're not doing it for you. And you are in a very unique situation in terms of the impact that you're feeling from this encampment. And for those of you who don't know, this is a, a, these are several, dozens and dozens of, of camps um, stretching, what, about a half a mile? And how, how the close proximity it is to your backyards and the noise that it causes. Um, I, am, I am right now, I mean, looking at, at Emily and our county CEO, I mean, we need to do intensive outreach and engagement, intensive coordination with law enforcement for those who don't take advantage of the services that we're offering them. We need to provide relief to these homeowners and, and come up with any creative or innovative way we can do that. And I, I, I am committed to doing that. I know Supervisor Natoli is as well. And we will be following up with you, John, and all of you. Thank you for being here today. If I could, just before I go to our speakers, I, I think it would be helpful, too, that I haven't had a chance, certainly, to see this location firsthand. I think one of the compounding factors, and it doesn't go to what laws are on the books and what behaviors are, are causing uh, issues for the residents, but you've got uh, an area that provides for a bike path. You also have a tributary um, a waterway that runs year-round, small, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a suburban urban drainage. But you've got multiple easements in this location. There's an old rail, railway line. You've got, obviously, smud lines, uh, 12 kV lines in there. You've got sanitary sewer. I don't know if water's there. You've got the, uh, the public right-of-way. And, uh, and then an area that's fairly wide. It's, it's, it's um, unique. It's partially in the city of Ranch Cordova, partially in the unincorporated part of the county. And there are access points at two major roadways, Folsom Boulevard and um, uh, Coloma Road, um, Gold River Drive. And I just, uh, and I think it needs some attention. I know others are well familiar with certainly Supervisor Desmond has been on point with this. But um, I think those things all factor into who's in charge, who's in charge of what, who can tell what needs to be done beyond the laws that are in the books that apply to all of us. Uh, and I just, I, I think that level of focus beyond certainly Supervisor Desmond's call for, for help here is, it's going to take some, some effort, but um, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's very necessary. And I'll just say this, that that five and a half foot wall, I remember this board many years ago when that park expanded and uh, the then owner, uh, uh, there was discussion because Citrus Road was actually a road right of way at the time. It's now now a dedicated trail. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about what the height of that wall ought to be. That doesn't keep out the issues, and it's not not designed necessarily entirely for security. But uh, there were some allowances at the time by the by, by the county for what the owner requested. But we have residents. Some of those obviously have changed out over time. Uh, who make conscious choices about living there. So there is a, a safety and security, let alone a, a, a comfort issue here. So um, I, I would join Supervisor Desmond in trying to find a solution to this. And some of obviously is enforcement of laws, but there are some unique things about that particular location. So, all right. Um, and thank you, Supervisor Desmond. I know you're, you know, you're, you know, that day when we left the Citrus Road and the Rancho uh, Mobile Country Estates, uh, you were heading to another location in your district, so I know you've got your got your hands full. 
All right. Um, with that, then, let's go back to our, our regular order of speakers, and thank you all for who have been testified this far. We have Eric Acosta, followed by Matt Ryan, followed by Charlie Ramirez. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Eric. Thank you for your time today. Um, on this critical issue, I am the district director for Assembly Member Kevin McCarty, here to speak in support of amending the ordinance. Assembly Member McCarty would like to express his support for the proposed ordinance amending Chapter 9.120 of the Sacramento County Code, which would prohibit camping on or near certain public property locations in the unincorporated areas of the county. The adoption of this amendment would greatly enhance public safety by allowing the county to prohibit encampments on public property such as the American River Parkway, a 23 mile long natural corridor that runs through the heart of Sacramento and is designated as both a state and federal wild and scenic river. This natural open space corridor provides habitat for a series of protected species and recreational uses for an estimated five to five to eight million visitors each year. In recent years, the parkway has become an illegal campground for the unhoused. Estimates indicate that several hundred persons illegally camp on the American River Parkway. Fire officials indicate that campfires from illegal camps are a major cause of wildfires. In 2021, more than 11% of the parkway burned. In addition to the risk of fires, illegal campsites cause ecological damage to the habitat and result in wildlife abandoning nearby, in abandoning the parkway. The proposed ordinance would allow county officials to protect flood infrastructure, recreational resources, um, and public health and safety. The proposed ordinance would also protect adjacent communities from wildfire risk, flooding risk, or other significant environmental harm. As a principal co-author of Assembly Bill 2633, legislation introduced to authorize the same thing that this ordinance is attempting to do, Assemblymember McCarty really urges your vote in favor of the proposed ordinance. This amendment is vital to the safety and quality of our public lands, especially the natural jewel that is the American River Parkway. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Thank you to the assembly member for having you here today, too. Appreciate it. Okay, next, uh, Matt Ryan. Matt? And Matt's followed by Charlie Ramirez, followed by Katrina Rogers. Uh, so first of all, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, David. Um, I want to preface this, because it comes at the end, but I want to preface this by saying uh, this is to help these people. This is not to stigmatize them, okay? So I want everyone to hear that before I start talking, because I know what I'm going to say is might be a little unpopular in this room from some parties. <clears throat> the issue that you call homelessness is the actual issue. The issue is misnamed. The issue we have is drugs. Conservative estimates put the number of people on the streets at 66% drug addicted. Most put it at 75. But last week, a member of the hot team that I spoke with said nine out of 10 people he encounters on a daily basis, that's all he does, that's all he does, are addicted to drugs. Do you know that in the year 2022 in the United States of America, the National Institute of Health is predicting that we are gonna have 100,000, 100,000 people die of fentanyl overdose. You may ask why I'm talking about drugs and not the county ordinance. The reason is that drug addicts need help. They don't need a tiny home. They don't need to be left in the gutter with a needle in their arm because of the Boise ruling. That help needs to come involuntarily. They do not have the cognitive ability to make decisions for themselves. Letting them live in our gutters only ensures one thing, eventual overdose. An often used statistic regarding people living on the streets includes families. Using the HUD numbers from the federal government, 
And while this is a large number and it should be a lot smaller, only 9% of people living on the streets included children and families. So 91% did not. From 2005 to, 2020, or 2005 to 2020, people living on the streets nationwide decreased 26%, while in California, we saw an increase of 31%. It must be because we have a temperate climate. Nope. Same time period, people living on the streets in Atlanta decreased 43%, and in Miami, 32%. So why must this be? Because in this state, we tolerate, pay, and invite people to live on our streets using the Boise ruling as a shield. I work for a company that employs roughly 580 people in Sacramento County. Just in July, we had 52 alarm calls. We had a fire on the bank of a creek adjacent, our Arcade Creek, adjacent to our property where an encampment went up in flames and caused approximately $80,000 in damage to our facility and various property. One week later, the encampment's back, called the authorities, can't do anything. So I guess my question is, are we supposed to wait for another fire? We encounter on a nightly basis needles and tinfoil littering the grounds of our properties. The RV situation continues to plague our communities with trash and human fluids permeating the streets and domestic squabbles terrifying people who work and live in those areas. It would seem to me that safety would be the first goal of any governmental agency. When people living on the streets addicted to fentanyl and meth congregate around businesses and neighborhoods, the people who work and live in these places live in terror. Terror because of the unpredictability of the person addicted to the killer fentanyl, which is going to kill 100,000 people in the United States of America this year. When I look at this drug epidemic, I wonder myself, what is the end game of the elected official? What, what is the long-term goal of letting people live in the gutter with needles in their arms? Why can't we get these people help? I don't advocate, this is where it comes in, I don't advocate stigmatizing them, I advocate helping them. The most maddening aspect about this entire drug epidemic in this small community of Sacramento is the fact that the city and county are constantly finger pointing. Folks, listen carefully. <laughs> this is not about you. This is not about the elected official. This is about the constituents of Sacramento County. Stop arguing. Stop the focus groups, stop wasting time, compromise, make a decision, and get these people help. If you want the solution, though, th this is really crucial. Yeah, I need, I need you need to, to know. If you want the solution, you need to trade the word homeless for drugs. Then and only then will you have the understanding and the ability to make a change. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, Charlie Ramirez, followed by Christina Rogers, followed by Dan Adderholt. Hello. Uh, my name is Charlie Ramirez. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, talk, speak. Thank you for being here, Charlie. And uh, I, live, I work on X Street, X and W Corridor. I own uh, numerous properties there, and uh, it's getting terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I'm starting to call it ugly Sacramento instead of beautiful Sacramento. What happened to us? We're going backwards. And the gentleman who just spoke, that's exactly what I'm thinking. It's all about what these folks are taking. Unfortunately, there's people that are weaker than us. And they have problems. How do you fix it? You got to help them. There's no other way to do it. They got to be helped. They got to be helped to get them off of the street. I seen this little old lady once. She had to be 90 years old, laying in the street, just quivering. Oh my God, where is all the help? She was just laying there quivering like she was going to die that moment. The fire department finally did come and hauled her away. But what are we doing? When are you folks, and I can't say you, when, are, when is something going to happen? Whether it's from you folks, uh, the city, I don't know whether the mayor, uh, the governor, the 
whoever. But these folks need to be off of the street and get some help. Very simple. That's the bottom line. Otherwise, they're never going to go nowhere. And the more you try to help doing what you're doing with little houses or big houses or whatever, it's not going to work until they are helped. And unfortunately, it takes a lot of money. And the gentleman that was here speaking, I'm with him. So thank you for allowing me to thank say you, what Charlie. i got to say. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Christina Rogers. And then Christina's followed by Dan Adderholt, followed by Amy Gardner. Wow, it's hard to follow all that. I mean, we've had some fabulous speakers, but um, I'm just going to give you my three minutes here. So my name is Christina Rogers, and I'm vice president of the Lampart Community Association, and I'm also a 20-year resident of Sacramento. And the LPCA board has agreed to support this ordinance to prevent... Uh, to prohibit camping near the unincorporated waterways. The care of these waterways directly impact our community as the river meanders right beside the Land Park neighborhood. And here are many key reasons why we support this ordinance. This is a link to today's E. coli report from the Sacramento Water Board that you see up here. Notice the E. coli levels are red around Discovery Park, and those are dangerously unhealthy levels. This summer, you may notice families uh, out record, recreating at Discovery Park, and many can be poor or low-income families of color. And the county is kind enough to provide life vests for them, but are you fighting to keep the water clean for them to swim in? People have explained that E. coli comes from birds and other animals, and I find this to be a weak reply because the feces and drug use and garbage along our riverfronts have no impact on the E. coli numbers. Anyone want, who wants to support the right of illegal camps only needs join. Sacramento picks it up for a volunteer cleanup along our rivers and streams. Please see the truth with your own eyes and accept it. The truth is uncomfortable, but if we deny the truth, we will never discuss real solutions for this problem. Let's really pay attention to the long-term impact of illegal camps in our natural spaces. Around 85% of the fires in Sacramento are human-caused. It's not climate change. It's people starting fires sometimes to cook food or meth. Sometimes those with mental illness just like to see things burn. I heard some folks start fires to retaliate against others in their illegal camps. As you continue to find solutions for the needy and drug addicted, it's important to also maintain the quality of life for the rest of Sacramento's citizens. I've heard much from those in support of illegal campers complaining about the privileged people demanding this ordinance. And they will call approval of this ordinance maybe violence or NIMBY. But if anyone thinks Sacramento is a playground for the rich, they really aren't paying attention. Here's a little insight. The truly privileged can leave Sacramento on vacation wherever they like. They can afford to move their family somewhere else with a cleaner environment. And I know a few who already have. So who's left? Low income, fixed income, working class, even middle class families like mine. We are the hard working tax paying citizens invested in our communities. Many rely on the nearby natural spaces for their only personal health and well being. When conversations go to what about the illegal campers, where would they go? Your core constituents are the first to be thrown under the bus, dismissed, and ignored. This isn't a fight between the haves and the have-nots. This is the difference between narrow-minded advocacy and common sense. We can both support clean waterways and smart solutions for those in need. Do we need compassion? Sure, but for who exactly? For the girl who was murdered along the parkway earlier this summer? For the children and families who cool off at the river at Discovery Park? For the single mom who wants to take her kids for a safe and fun bike ride along the river? We must broaden our perspective about the impacts to all our populations, both human and natural. So the, EPC, uh, the LPCA supports this and, and, and appreciates your support. And we also hope that you directly address the very large illegal drug trade that inspires many of these illegal camp, campers to refuse services or support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen. Okay. okay, next. Okay. okay. You'll get a turn to speak in a moment, please. Okay, all right, we have uh, Dan Adderholt, and Amy Gardner, and then Roland Brady. Thank God. Um, I'm done hearing the lies. This has gone far enough. I've been hearing about the Lower America Road Parkway being destroyed. No, rape, murder, 
stop the lies. My Macaroon Homes crews are on the lower part of Macaroon River Parkway. There is no rape, murder, or a trash, and I got Beatles proving this. We're supposed to be working together, not against each other. You know, I am tired of this personal attack against my Macaroon Homes crews. My Macaroon Homes crews represent the whole lower park of uh, Macaroon River Parkway. You know, that's enough. We're out here cleaning every day. We're the ones that clean 500 tons of trash a month off the American River Parkway. Not you, of you. My American River Homes crews did. I'm, I'm mad right now. I'm sorry, Dennis, but your area, yeah, I agree with you. Your area is destroyed, okay? I'm trying to get out there with my crews to help your area, all right? But you got thousands of homeless crews out here. Speaking right now, right back, Mom, well, I'm calling you guys a liar just now. I walked out. Because you are lying. My American River Homes crews here are saving the parkway. We're out here every day. And Emily Holkin, okay? You're on the right track, but you don't listen to the advocates. That Zoom meeting was a joke. Right. We're out here, we're talking about helping our homeless and everything. What about homeless pets? I have totally bashed about the homeless pets for what, weeks now, Don? Mm -hmm. On deaf ears. Homeless people out here have three to four dogs each. And Sacramento Code says you can have four dogs. County regulations, four dogs, people. Okay? So, is it because they're homeless, they don't get to keep their goddamn pets? Excuse my language. Because they're homeless? Yeah, Dan, you need to dress the board, please. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. Because yeah, they're yeah. homeless, they get to keep their pets. And that's enough, you guys. You guys, Don, Des, you told me yourselves that you're not going to let the homeless pets die. Then why are you supporting this? Why are you supporting the murder of these homeless animals? We got one pet? Are you kidding me? I mean, how many people here have more than one animal? As a pet, please raise your hand. Come on, Dan, address the board, please. I just want to get to the yeah. point here, you guys. I am addressing the board. I'm just everybody here. Yeah. Look, man. Amer oh, my God. Sacramento Homeless Union. Decarcerate Sacramento. All them. All these groups here. We need a joint alliance. We need to go together and fight this because this is illegal. It is a direct attempt to go around Boys vs. Martin. And it's a direct attack by Boys vs. Martin. You know... I came here with a plan today because I talked to people at Arden, the expressway people. They're willing to come here and live in this area right here, you guys, where my American homes crews dominate. We're over 4,000 people strong. Okay, you want to talk about 1,000 people? I say 1,000 people because I usually run around with 1,000 people in my crew. I have over 5,000 people in my crew right now. I have cabards in Sacramento. Because I knew this was coming. I told you this, Don. I told you this, Serna. But you know what? I stand here, this insect will pick it up, say they're not against homeless, right? Not once did he say that American Homeless Crew was there helping them clear up that damn Arcade Creek. Not once! We were there! We were there helping them clean, okay? We're the ones that got the homeless to help you, not you! We're the ones that went there talking to the homeless people to help. And I'm gonna get Sacramento to pick you up. Mark Baker and everybody, you guys are good people. I have yeah. not liked what you guys are doing. But call the credit to credit to do. One brace, someone do credit to credit to do. I'm gonna do the same for the homeless. Yeah. Dan. I'm going to admit that the homeless are there Dan, to help you Dan, clean. Dan, Dan, please address the board. Okay, please. I'm just going to say this, you guys. Yeah. What I'm getting at right now is, uh, is I, my, right now I'm proposing this be a safe ground for the homeless here. Because that's, I can guarantee you that we'll keep it safe there, Serna. We have been for 10 years, bud. Almost 10 years. We can keep it safe here. We cleaned the hell out of it. We're the ones that cleaned it, not Parker Rec. We saved it when Parker Rec had no money to save it. And now you're making it personal, it personal with me, Liz, because you're saying the Lord Bank of the Merrick Parkway. When the Lord Bank of the Merrick Parkway is my Merrick Homeless crew, and they are not out there committing crime, they're no different than anybody here. They're trying to survive, and they're not drug addicts either. They're trying to survive the best way they can. And hopefully we all can work together and stop this point, point and finger stuff and start finding a real solution. That core affordable housing, our mayor is a joke. I'll say this publicly, Steinberg is a joke. He took away affordable housing for the homeless. You talking about curing the homeless problem? Affordable housing. You say there ain't no homes available? I can show you hundreds of the homes right now that take Section 8. Hundreds of homes here in Sacramento. Yeah. Yeah. Hell, Kimberly yeah. Church even did. Yep. Okay? All these people, yeah. all these yeah. advocates, yeah. you guys don't listen yeah. to him. Yeah. Dan, you're going to need to wrap up. Yeah. That's you, all you, I got to say. Okay, thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Uh, Amy Gardner, followed by Roland Brady. Amy Gardner had to leave, so she ceded her time to me. We were going to go together okay. on this. So, Can you please bring the PowerPoint up? Is it PowerPoint? And oh, PowerPoint. You guys okay. have copies of that now. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what, what am I doing here? We're going to bring up the PowerPoint. 
Oh, okay. To through the pages, but they're going to bring it up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, sir. just uh, an announcement just uh, before um, Roland gets started here. Uh, I take the liberty of uh, taking a recently completed uh, list of um, county funding for homeless programs and services. It's a, it's a list of um, various initiatives, uh, efforts, programs. Uh, there's also a frequently asked question section of this three-page uh, document, which I thought uh, might be helpful for um, many of the people that are in attendance today. It's out on the other side of the um, the slate wall here on the other side during the, in the uh, in the lobby there, and I would encourage folks to take uh, take a look at this, especially uh, members of the media that are here, that actually documents and it's actually not a complete list. It actually documents uh, much of what we have been doing when it comes to capacity building, what we have been doing, and continue to enhance in terms of addiction services, mental health services, and again, it has a frequently asked questions section which uh, attempts to uh, get at some of the more common inquiries that we face from our constituents about uh, what the county actually is uh, doing. I think there continues to be a great deal of myth uh, in the community that uh, the county is uh, not doing anything, uh, which couldn't be further from the truth. And um, this, uh, I think, should, be, should mark the beginning of us trying to um, have a more concerted effort to uh, help educate folks about uh, what it is that we're, we've committed ourselves to, to uh, to assist folks that need the help that are unsheltered in our community. Okay, thanks. thanks uh, Mr. Brady, so this is the PowerPoint. So you and um, um, Amy were going to present this, so I'm going to put six minutes up to get, allow you to do, the, do the PowerPoint. Okay. Correct. All right. Just give me um, a second here. Thank you, Board. Uh, yeah. My name is Roland Brady, and um, I'm here to speak in favor of the proposals, both proposals. I have a PhD in geology and I've taught watershed hydrology and engineering geology for over 20 years. And I'm the Miles Steward with the Parkway Foundation on Steelhead Creek. One of the important aspects of the proposals was to include the infrastructure, critical infrastructure, with the urban creeks as well as with the parkway. And I, I favor that because the uh, urban creeks not only supply groundwater recharge and surface water to the Sacramento River, they're also critical habitat, and I would like to discuss that. The creeks that were on the map right there included Arcade Creek and Steelhead Creek. I have most of my experience on these two. The creeks um, are all in the area, all bordered by levees, and many of them have flood, flood plains. Steelhead Creek flows all year. Dry Creek usually runs dry, as does Arcade Creek this time of year. And these are two views of the winter view, showing the floodplain and the levees. The Central Valley Steelhead and Central Valley Chinook st Salmon find these creeks to be their home. They migrate up Steelhead Creek, and they spawn in Arcade Creek. The majority of California steelhead are listed under Federal Endangered Species Act. And we got a note from NOAA Marine Fisheries that outlined with dwindling populations and passage issues, preserving local habitat is more important than ever. The protection for these waterways comes from no dumping laws, punishable by six months in jail and or a $1,000 fine. However, dumping goes on day after day. On the left is a large camp on Steelhead Creek that was, uh, we had uh, permission to remove 68,000 pounds of debris from this camp on Steelhead Creek. And the one on the right shows a more typical camp on the inside of the bank on Arcade Creek. This is also on the floodplain. These represent point source contamination. The red triangles represent camps on Steelhead Creek. So there are many, many, many of them. They're just not a few, but they're distributed all along the side of the channel. Now, these camps and these concentrations of debris are vulnerable to flooding when the creek on the left becomes those views on the right, and both of those are Steelhead Creek during high flows. You can see water completely covers the floodplain, and the aftermath of this is grim. All of the debris that had accumulated on the floodplain gets washed into the water. Now, 
We have done a number of debris surveys, uh, 15 of them, and keep track of all of the type of debris, the volume of the debris, and the weight of the debris. So we know exactly what's going into the water and what's being stored on the floodplain. This was removed from an area in Steelhead Creek that includes toxic chemical wastes, pathogenic waste, human and dog feces and needles, and solid debris. In the stream channel, all of the debris on the left came from that 25 by 30 foot area on the right. Solid waste, the worst players are plastics, especially bags, sheet and styrofoam, textiles, tents, tarps, bedding, carpet remnants, and shopping carts. Now plastics are particularly bad and they form two kind of groups. One of them is little worm-like bodies that look like food for fish and they eat them, but of course they can't digest them. And then plastic nanoparticles, and these are very fine particles that enter the tissue of organisms and they themselves are toxic. Now I wanted to point out that the life of the creek is not the water you see flowing, but is the water that's flowing in the substrate below that, through the sand and the gravel. That carries oxygen and vital nutrients to the organisms that live in that substrate, in that sand and gravel. And the fish eggs live there. Without oxygen, that whole hyperreic zone is dead. And that's what's happening with the textiles and the plastics. It's forming an armor on the bottom of the channel, and it's choking out the life in the bottom of the streams. In places we've found there's 60 to 90 percent of the channel bottom is covered with this armor. Shopping carts are another bad player. They form physical barriers to the flow of water, so they not only decrease the flow capacity of the channel, but they form islands that accrete vegetation and debris, and this reduces the fish passage, barriers to the fish passage. So what I'm asking is that the ordinance really only abide by existing state law. The California Fish and Game Code 5652 says it is unlawful to deposit, permit to pass into, or place where it can pass into waters of the state, these are all of the waters we've been talking about, or to abandon, dispose of, or throw away within 150 feet of the high water mark of the waters of the state. Any cans, bottles, garbage, motor vehicle parts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically what the ordinance is saying is this. This is an existing state law. And if you look at the waterways as part of critical infrastructure, you'll see that it's covered with this. And most of what we're talking about right here, we would not have this discussion, if this law had been assiduously abided by all along or had been enforced, 150 feet for the high water line, and this all could have been avoided. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brady. <laughs> Supervisor Kennedy. Surprise. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for that. Uh, that. Now I'd like the clarification that I asked for earlier as to what we're doing, how does it play into what the state has already done? Right, so there's uh, several issues um, okay. involved in what the speaker was just talking about. Okay. The first of which, a lot of the areas that the prior speaker um, where the, the Sacramento picks up mm -hmm. speaker and this one both are referring to actually examples that are it within the city of Sacramento. So unfortunately, the, any ordinance passed by the board would not address the specific issues that they're talking about. But, but, we, but doesn't uh, this apply to the county already though? Okay, okay. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> so, so just pointing that out um, so that people aren't disappointed uh, later on. Uh, as far as the um, ability to enforce the California Fish and Game Code within the American River Parkway, for example, my understanding is that the park rangers do already enforce that. Um, and they issued, I think Liz could speak exactly, but around 100 citations a year for that, um, a violation of that. So the real question I think that the speaker may be addressing is they want consistency, I think, um, in the definition of what is critical infrastructure. Um, I, I could be wrong. Um, again, the board can choose to uh, 
de define critical infrastructure as related to waterways in this way or in the way that we're recommending that it be done. Um, I think the parks director um, has opined on that and um, would rather have it be done the way that we've presented it. But again, I will let her um, state, speak to that. Okay, so I guess the, my, my question is though, is that wh wh whatever we do today and whatever we do next time when we come up with a resolution, this is still the law in the county of Sacramento. Correct. In the state of California. Well, then are, are we looking at adopting something that is conflicting with the law of the state of California? No. No. no why not? No. Why not? Well, it's, it's not conflicting because this addresses dumping into it, and the critical infrastructure ordinance oh. uh, addresses camping okay. in it. Thank you very much. There's yes. the clarification. Can, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Okay, sure. Mr. Vice President. So, I, I mean, the way I, the way I view it is... Okay. If, Okay. You, there's going to be others going to present on your behalf. Um, so, this supervisor asking questions. Supervisor, I, I don't, I, I, I don't view it as as conflicting. I mean, I think what this is on the books can be enforced, but it's it's harder to enforce because you have to see it happening. Just like a lot of the things that John mentioned, if we have our ordinance that is doesn't isn't the same distance, but it would. Again, obviously, we probably need to offer an alternative, obviously, because we have federal court decisions, but it would be able, it would allow us to be able to prevent the camping entirely in these areas, right? So that would be important. So I think both of these working together is what's what is what is crucial, in my opinion. So. Right. Okay. I, I trust we may have some more discussion before we're done here today on that. So, okay. Let's continue with our testimony. We have Shireen Miles, followed by Dennis Scott, followed by McKenzie. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Okay. Hi, Shireen. My name is Shireen Miles. I'm a homeowner and a constituent of Rich Desmond. Additionally, we are boat owners, and I walk and I use the American River Parkway. Residents are admittedly beyond frustrated and we want to see something get done. The sooner, the better. But these particular measures are simply smoke and mirrors to make us feel temporarily better. Like any temporary fix, this purported solution will leave us more disillusioned than before. It will not get more unsheltered people into housing. When we have only a fraction of the needed shelter spaces, it will simply victimize campers further by displacing them to another location where they aren't wanted either. Today I represent Sacramento area congregations together. Our more than 60 congregations have standing on this issue. We have not been wringing our hands from the sidelines, as you know. You know that for years, our congregations have not only been trying to meet immediate survival needs, we have staffed and operated emergency shelters and respite centers, and we have dug deep and worked collaboratively with other congregations and nonprofit providers to pay for housing navigators. Additionally, we have lobbied this body and the Sacramento City Council to come together and work collaboratively on the problem. We are aware that the county has invested a lot of money in the problem. But the size of the crisis is too big now to make headway with disjointed efforts that won't help reduce homelessness. To those in favor of these resolutions, we need you to stand up to support more shelter options. It's cruel to advocate to get people off the streets and parkways and loudly oppose the establishment of shelters anywhere. To supervisors, enacting the measures before you tonight will be a huge waste of taxpayer dollars, my taxpayer dollars. Our county will most certainly face costly litigation. There will also be a need for additional resources for the sheriff's department and for park rangers. And none of that 
will create additional shelter spaces to get people off the street. You heard your staff saying that they would offer options to people who are in the encampments, but no, but, but they're, we know they're not sufficient. Don't take the easy way out and pass these measures just to feel like you are doing something. Instead, be leaders. Work with the City of Sacramento, nonprofit providers, business leaders, homeless advocates, faith communities, and those who are themselves unsheltered to create a comprehensive plan to really end homelessness. It's very late, but it's not too late. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes. yes. Yes, Mr. Chair, if I could, just, if I could uh, address the speaker, I would, uh, you, you mentioned uh, that your organization wants this board and this county to stand up for more shelter options, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I would encourage you to, to take what's offered out in the, in the uh, lobby because it details uh, precisely what we're doing to that end. We, we are well aware of that, but we, I, that's, why, that's why I'm also speaking to the public, because we know that the public opposes everything you try to do, and that's really frustrating. Thanks, Shereen. Okay, all right, so next, uh, thank you, Shereen. So Dennis Scott, Dennis, you're next, and followed by Mackenzie, followed by Alicia Rancano. Uh, yes, I, I, I have two Two, both uh, two and three to address here. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Dennis Scott. I was the, I'm a retired architect from State Parks and Recreation in the Department of Rehabilitation. So, a couple, of, one of the big issues here is that these ordinances is that been, and the lack of, has been total, no concern for the American Disabilities Act. This is a Civil Rights Act. As same as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So, when you allow camping, you allow any camping and people to camp on the sidewalk, you're blocking a path of travel. A path of travel is defined and required under the ADA to be maintained. And any Boise thing does not over over uh, over exceed. ADA. ADA will exceed any of those kind of decisions because it is a civil rights act. And one of the things is, is that the ordinance should actually say that any sidewalk or human path of travel should not be less than six feet if somebody camping. They can only camp on a sidewalk that's six feet or that are wider than six feet in this way, way it should be in the ordinance and be and if it is wired to six feet, they can use, leave a path of travel a six feet of width. Now, where does it come from? You can have, ADA says, okay, it can be three feet wide, but only for two feet. Go around a pole, a fire hydrant, or anything else. A standard path is four feet wide. For a single lane, for we this is all for wheelchair and blind people, as well as people with strollers and everything else. It shall be four feet wide with passing lane areas every 200 feet. To be five feet wide will allow two wheelchairs to pass, a, and that can be continuous. This is why most people build six-foot sidewalks to allow for signs and stuff and still have passing for two people. So I would recommend on that part that the war ordinance be made that no camping, no obstructions for a width of six feet or and or and if it's greater than that width they can go do what they want. But the other part is on the American River Parkway. Really simple. We have I'm sorry about that. I better make it quick. Um, the, the the basically the problem is on there is when somebody takes and camps on a piece of land, it's actually land theft. Because that one acre goes out of my use, it goes to their private use, and they're not paying for it. When I put on a running event in a, when I put on a running event in the parkway, I pay to use that space during that running event. These people, they want to camp there, and we say, they really, why aren't they paying ten dollars or twenty dollars a day to camp? So, anyway, that's it. So, it's not a campground. They can go to other places, such as the 
we can set up places at, such as on county land in which they can go camp, maybe by the one of the Air Force bases that we acquired by the county. We acquired or or the Army Depot. We have land out there. We just grade, grade, grade the soil, bring in, bring in portable restrooms, bring in that, water trucks to have clean water, and set that up temporary quick, and then go build a humane facilities, if best, most of the drug addicts are dis, 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 phys, uh, mentally disabled, and with them being mentally disabled, we need to have humane facilities for that purpose. Great. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate okay. you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, okay next, Mackenzie. Mackenzie's followed by uh, Alicia and then Dan Meyer. Good afternoon, board. My name is Mackenzie Wilson. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the community organizer for Decarcerate Sacramento, the Sacramento Tenants Union, and I have been a lifelong, but definitely for the last eight years, advocate for basic needs here in Sacramento County, which means that I'm really close to those actually experiencing the issues. I'd like to say hello to everyone in this space today, even the no ones to this issue, because this issue has now begun to affect your life and your businesses. I recognize you trying to make sense of the devastation you see around you. Context, since the 1970s and 80s, there has been a divestment from your community. And if I could sum it up, as education, housing, and access to physical, mental health care, welfare, social security, you know, the things that meet basic needs went down. You saw carceral and punishment-based spent spending go up, especially around the racist war on drugs. Now, historically in Sacramento County, we have followed these trends. We even participated in the real racist segregation and redlining of people of color that coupled with that divestment have created the pockets of poverty that we all see today. Flash forward to now. Following this trend, Sacramento County has continued to follow this route, and it is a part of why we stand here today. If, if y'all had been doing this work, then you wouldn't need enforcement. If you had been doing this work with intention, you know, i.e. with folks experiencing homelessness, with their doctors, with the community and the organizations that work with them and hadn't been criminalizing them for years, you wouldn't need force. You, if you would make the critical and vital investments into housing, mental health services, substance use services, food access, and cut the poverty to jail pipeline, then we wouldn't need to be here today. Snapshot of your jail. 62% of your jail is suffering from mental health crisis. One third suffering from severe mental health crisis. 50% of misdemeanors are unhoused people. I've, we have spoken with person after person in that jail and the phenomena of 30 to 40 times in that jail just due to homelessness is horrifying. 60% of your jail population is housing insecure. Simply, your efforts to criminalize homelessness, survival crime, poverty, mental health, substance use crisis, and work is all working if your goal is to already is to fill your already overcrowded and horrific jail and their conditions. But I don't think it is. Actually, I know it's not. Because of the Mays v. Sacramento lawsuit, you have and the need to reduce the jail population, meaning you need to stop the criminalization of poverty and stop the inflation of police budgets. 72% of our general fund goes to cops, courts, and cages. And knowing what's in your jail means that we instead need vital reinvestment in housing, food access, mental health and substance use services, education, workforce development, et cetera. I am almost done, so bear with me. The things that will truly build safer, healthier, more educated, and therefore freer Sacramento County. Do not pass another criminalization effort that will only add to the harm and lack of trust that you have already built and harm that you have already caused to this vulnerable population. The most recent pit count and time count, and I'm going to say I'm going to go a second just a little longer because okay, the okay. fact that we conflated these two items, even though the talking okay, points okay. are completely Keep separate. Trying. Keep going. Thank you very much. The most recent pit count and time, that's a time and point, that's a time count, y'all. It's a two-night count of unhoused people. It found 10,000 people living outside. It's important to note that these figures grossly undercount the numbers outside. The people living in cars, parkways, under bridges, doubled and tripled up houses, inside the houses, couch surfing, housing unstable. And there's 
thousands of people just in the parkway. And knowing one third of Sacramento County was living in liquid asset poverty pre-pandemic, then we know a paycheck away from homelessness number, that number is only growing. So Sacramento County is like, and not to mention Sacramento County is short, hundreds of thousands of public housing units. And to give a micro example of what will happen when these folks are moved without housing, without access to services, and even what could have been avoided by offering trash cans and bathrooms, like will look like simply the Stockton Boulevard encampment. Patrick, you remember moving hundreds of people off that county-owned land. People who had been there for years. Multiple deaths and rapes reported immediately after. To count to this day, 35 deaths. A loss of community safety, access to programs and organizations who had been working with them. And those folks have reported being moved over 78 times since 2019. Folks from Stockton Boulevard at DSN 65th or 63rd are actually scheduled to be moved again this week. Simply stop criminalizing. And all the folks in this room, I implore you to please stop demanding for it. Instead, demand the housing, the mental health services, the substance use services, better education, food access that we all deserve. All these actions will do is further disenfranchise, lead to further divestment from our communities, and cause actual death and harm. This is not an us versus them. This is about us in our community. And this community needs folks in this room to really understand and begin to correlate that you having to pick up trash with volunteers and the Lack of is, is correlated to the lack of investment in parks and rec and access to people's bathrooms, trash cans, and housing and resources. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have, uh, and I don't think she wanted to speak, I guess I said in the form, so Alicia Rincano. So, all right. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Myers, he doesn't need to speak, but supports the ordinances. Uh, Rachel Brown. And then Kathy Strickland. Good afternoon. Hi, Hi Rachel. Um, so this is definitely an issue that many people feel passionate about. Um, and I provided a letter, uh, a comment letter to you all, but I just wanted to come and say personally, um, on behalf of Power and Alliance, I'm Rachel Brown. I'm the executive director for Power and Alliance, which is a PBID in the city of Sacramento. Um, we supported the safe stay community that is going to go live right at the edge of our district. Uh, we provided a letter of support for that at Florin Road and Power Inn. And I think that this alone today is not going to solve the complex issue that's before us, and I, I hope to make that clear. There's a number of complementary services and a, and a complex <laughs> you know, set of solutions that I, that I think you guys are talking about coming forward and what time I, I need to look at your document there. But I look forward to um, supporting this and many more efforts, I hope, as um, you know, you and maybe the county or city, rather, sorry, um, try to work on many issues to tackle this. And it won't be solved overnight. It didn't come forward overnight. Uh, but I look forward to seeing more solutions uh, to tackle this complex problem. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Okay. Following Rachel, Kathy Strickland. Kathy. And then uh, Margarita Chavez after Kathy. Good afternoon, Kathy. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, my name is Kathy Strickland. I live on Burgundy Way in Arden Arcade, have been there for 40 years. Um, I have a lot of hats. Um, I'm on the board, I'm board chair this year, Fulton El Camino Rec and Park. Um, I'm on the, the, um, um, the board of Sacramento Area Co uh, Creeks Council. I am also a mercy peddler. Um, I see this problem really well. Um, my concern with you is establishing what I'd like to see in the SLUs. In the new and revised edition of the, um, pardon me, the, um, uh, the critical infrastructure. In the revised edition, it says something about floodplain, or not floodplain, um, pardon me, um, drainage systems. I'd like to know for sure, does that include the sloughs? Okay, that's a question. Okay. 
Um, that, that was just recently added like a day or two or so ago. Um, the drainage systems that we have in my neck of the woods in Arden Arcade go through my parks, both of them, Strong Ranch Slough and Chicken Ranch Slough. They go, are also going through an environmental justice community. Um, the people that live there, many of them live in poverty, not just poverty financially, but poverty in being heard, poverty in food, poverty in, um, in, the acad in academics. It, I can go on and on. Um, what, what disturbs me, and when I have seen Sacramento Picks It Up's videos of the, and I, go, I have been out on these creeks before a flood and after a flood. I've seen the camps there and where the campers camping, I have seen their tents and their stuff downstream. Um, I've also picked out of the creek 50 to 60 year old water heaters. There's, there's, uh, so, somebody mentioned a couple of days ago that there are like two generations of trash in the creeks. One of them is really old and the other one is like 10 to 15 years old. What we're taking out of the creeks now is the 10 to 15 years old, except the time that we took out that water heater. That was, <laughs> it was weird looking. It was a little tiny thing. Um, but the, the drainage system, they are seasonal. They're dry right now. I have pictures of a camp on Strong Ranch Slough that is four blocks from the American River. I don't know how to do this, but I'm going there. I think it's up there, Kathy. Yep. There it is. Um, right above it, up, up above um, the bank of the slough, is a camp of, oh, eight to 10 people. I try not to take pictures of people because I feel that that's really rather humiliating. As a mercy peddler, I serve these folks. Um, I know some of their stories. I don't ask. It's not my business. But eventually, I do get shared stories. Um, one, one of the people that I serve is a young Muslim man who was a, uh, a gang member in Southern California. I'll come up on him. He'll be reading the, the Quran. He's deeply spiritual. He's also terrified to be who he is and where he is. I, too, worked with SAC Act. Um, I helped to put together the environmental justice element that you guys put together so beautifully. Um, the idea, though, that the homeless are living on our waterways is extremely disturbing to the Sacramento Area Creeks Council board member in me. We cannot let this go on. This has nothing to do with the homeless. It has everything to do with the trash, including that 10-gallon water heater from 1950-whatever. Um, it, 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 this, this truly is disturbing for me. I am deeply environmental. Um, and I, I, I get into this stuff in my overtime. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I am. Yeah, I'm so yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, I've said yeah. enough. Thank you so much for your efforts. We cannot build housing fast enough. We really can't. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Pardon? There's the other picture. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Next, we have uh, Margarita Chavez, uh, and then Lisa Sanchez, and then Allison Goble. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Maria. Uh, bear with me. I've been sitting and I'm 68, <laughs> so I'm kind of a little stiff here. Okay. Um, I volunteer uh, picking up trash, and um, I was joined in October. But uh, in my community, actually, I'm also co-chairperson of our Detroit Neighborhood Association in South Sacramento. And that area, even before I moved there, was known with a lot of, you know, crime, violence, and all that stuff. And uh, I started walking and saw the stuff happening, started reporting it, and I got pretty good at it. Now I'm, um, um, they did a podcast on me because I care. 
I volunteer. Everything that I do, I work even with Justice for Neighbors, getting bad renters out. But the thing that I'm here today is for our water, our waters, our creeks, our rivers, the, the, you know, all the contamination that I've seen. I didn't know all this was happening. What were you going to give our children our future, you know? I'm so proud of these people. Sacramento picks it up. And every other volunteer that you know, uh, does work at the, at the American River Parkway. But when we start to do a cleanup, we always have a safety talk. And I'm so proud of all of us that we don't, you know, the thing is that is keeping our, our people safe as we're picking up trash. Don't fall, don't get poked with a needle or whatever. And I have pictures here. Um, can you help me? Yeah, you can put them display right there. Okay. Keep, yeah. And uh, you this put, is... Put, put them on the white, okay. Uh, right oh, there, right there. Show me. This is the... I did pick up these with uh, like two other people in like a two feet by two feet area with a cultivator. You know, we have our sharp containers and stuff, and that's how much all that stuff, you know, will eventually go in the river. This is also... Um, We've been doing uh, abandoned, burned encampments that's all burned, you know. We're actually also, you know, we're volunteers, but we're actually putting our lives on the line to clean up this because we don't know what's in there, you know. There's another one there. Uh, we have uh, also young people volunteering. Thank God the high school kids are volunteering, and I love to work with them. Uh, yeah, that's another, another uh, homeless encampment. Uh, tons and tons of garbage of every kind. Here's one of our, of our, our, our this David Ingram. And he is, they're trying to get plastic from the trees from the, from uh, I think that was American River Parkway. Anyway, but the thing, he's putting his life on the line, you know? And that day I was thinking about and contemplating that, you know, what we are doing all this microplastic and stuff is polluting our waters. It's just, it's, it, we do safety. Can you do safety for us, for our waters? What, what are we going to drink? Uh, what, what, what's in the waters? So much contamination, not just in the waters, but in the soil, probably even in the air. And I just want to thank you. Mm, thank, thank you, you Margaret. Thank you for sharing. Uh, the speaker. Yeah. Yeah. The speaker did make mention, uh, and rightly so, about the dangers of uh, uh, accidental hypodermic needles. Um, and I can attest from uh, accidentally being stuck myself 10 years ago while cleaning up the parkway. Uh, you, don't, you do not want to have that happen. It's a really awful experience for the next 21 days, waiting to know whether or not you contracted something. Okay. 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 Nick, 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 you got a chance to speak in a minute. We'll let you speak. Okay. You all are just yeah. responding to comments, so I thought. Yeah. Okay. No, we, we're responding, responding to comments. To You'll have your, have your chance. chance. I, I said you are, and I said something yeah. that's against the brown. Uh, but sometimes yeah. they're allowed. Oh, okay. That's what you have to do Okay. Everybody's going to get a chance to talk. Okay. 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 Please, 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 please. All right. Okay. Lisa. All right. Lisa Sanchez, and then uh, Allison Goble. Hello. Hi, Lisa. Hey. I have some pictures, too, I'm going to show. Can I do the picture? Yeah. I do. I just have the stack there. So. OK. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Lisa, and I'm a longtime Sacramento area resident. I would like to provide my support for passing both ordinances today with a special interest of our creeks and waterways. I'm excited that they now have been included under the critical infrastructure of the first ordinance. I am also someone who used to enjoy the parkway and no longer do so. By creating restrictions to allow any camping and illegal dumping, it will help to restore these neglected creeks, sloughs, channels, rivers, and waterways along the floodplains that surround them. These areas have been greatly neglected for many reasons and are literally dying for our help. 
the ecosystem, water quality, fish, animals, and people all have been negatively impacted for so long, it seems we have become used to how bad it is. With COVID, the, the exponential increase in the volume of illegally dumped trash is impossible to keep up with. The county have rules preventing the removal of trash and debris in the water, along with active camps, et cetera, that allow it to stay there and fester for years. This is an impossible task to remedy as it stands now. So we must work to change this and modify the ordinances that allow our creeks, rivers, waterways as a whole to be free and clean from non-organic materials. Not only should there be no camping around our creeks and waterways, but it's also extremely unsafe for anyone to do so. There are no facilities meant for living there, and there shouldn't be. There are no evacuation abilities when storms and high waters endangers those living in the floodplains. When fires start and spread quickly and sweep through the dried banks, our first responders put their lives in danger, accessing far off locations without street lights and roads. This is an all year round or all, all around danger for any unhoused living in these areas and for police, fire and rescue or for flood rescues. These areas are not made for someone to live there. One thing I would like to modify in the ordinance would be the increase of the 25 foot minimum that has been included. 25 feet is negligible when we're talking about trash, debris and contaminants of any kind entering the waterway. Urban structures on the streets would be just fine for the 25 foot minimum, but our waters require an added safety net. Wind blows the trash, especially the light plastics that make the majority of what is removed, and piles of rubbish get so high that the mounds spill over. This is um, regarding uh, Mr. Kennedy's question with the state regulations that um, Mr. Brady had talked about. But it is to align with the current California Fish and Game Code 5652. It's unlawful to deposit permit pass into yada yada within 150 feet of the high water mark is what we're going after. <sighs> I ask that you increase the buffer to 150 feet around all of our creeks and waterways. It's a critical step in our responsibility to protect what cannot protect itself, nature. This will also place this in line for the current state regulations. If, shelters, um, if shelter perimeters are given a thousand feet buffer, I think 150 feet is necessary for our waterways. I don't know. Come on, I don't know how many chances we will get to present this information to those who can make a difference. I'm hopeful that we can make this difference today with the future of our wonderful gems in Sacramento, our numerous waterways. One question I do have is with the, the 30 feet and the 25 foot markers, is that from the water line or the, the water where it ends? Because again, that's really 25 feet is from, I believe, yeah, yeah. The chair to here, mm -hmm. that's, that's not really a buffer. Again, the high water mark is a significant difference and that's gonna make the biggest impact for it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, good. We'll get to uh, Lisa Travis. Is that something you wanna to respond to now or you wanna get back to us with that answer to that specific question? I will I respond uh, in a minute. Okay, you mind. Yep. okay, that's fine. Okay. All right, we'll get a, a response to that, uh, Lisa. All right, next, Allison uh, Goble, followed by David Ingram, followed by Mark Baker. Uh, right Hi, Allison. Hi. Hi, um, my name's Allison Goble. I'm also known as Allison Seconds. That's my music name. I'm a singer. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, I saw that in parentheses, so I didn't know if yeah, I was supposed to call you by it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of things, including um, a, a naturalist. Um, I grew up in Carmichael, California. <laughs> and um, I also, um, I, I grew up playing in the, the sloughs with the tadpoles. Um, you know, just kind of um, what I hope would be an idyllic um, situation for a lot of kids. And now I certainly wouldn't let my nephew and niece um, play in the sloughs or the creeks because of the state that they're in. Um, these textiles were pulled from Arcade Creek by Mount Mikes. Um, and I'll, I'll go further back. Um, about 15 years ago, I got my first dog, which took me to the American River daily. Um, I probably averaged 300 out of 365 days walking along the American River Parkway. Um, for 15 years, rain or shine, I'm out there. I don't drink or do drugs, I'm addicted to the river. Um, and through that, um, I saw the trash 
start to pour in um, from a lot of different places. Um, I did form Sacramento Picks It Up last March. Um, because of that reason, and a lot of other reasons, um, trash in the city, but, but mostly the American River. And I, I want to really reiterate um, to the crowd, to the record, that um, we're against all trash in the river. Um, we don't care where it comes from. Um, there's abandoned encampment trash. There's illegally dumped trash from perfectly housed citizens. I just want to make that really clear to anybody listening. Um, it's, it's, that's clear. And so um, I appreciate that you are hopefully going to be including sloughs and creeks um, in the mix because they need protection. Um, the two day, you saw the, the video in the beginning, that two day cleanup at Arcade Creek was appalling. Um, in a thousand foot uh, area. Um, the 25 foot buffer is not enough. Um, I mean, I've watched folks uh, throw, throw batteries from here to there into our waterways. It, it's, it's such a small amount of, of a buffer. 150 feet really would be more effective and we're certainly not advocating for any homeless folks living on the river to be kicked off and have nowhere to go. So I want to make that also very, very clear um, for our, organ our not nonprofit status organization. Um, so that's mostly what I'm here to ask, is that that buffer is bigger um, to protect these waterways, these vital tributaries and rivers um, that need to be more full of life. We do want to bring salmon back to the creeks. They have not been seen in years. Um, and that's what my organization is working on, too, amongst many, many other um, trash-related items. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Allison. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for your efforts. OK, next, David, David Ingram, followed by Mark Baker, followed by Crystal Tobias. Uh, hi, David Ingram. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak today and also for having uh, the um, wherewithal to tackle this very important issue also with public comment. I know it's a very difficult charged issue. I've never actually been uh, laughed at or mocked for cleaning up creeks and rivers as a volunteer on my own time before, but you know, there's always a first for that. Um, but I'll start with a little levity. Uh, OK. This, uh, this back to the spring chicken comment. Uh, here are some of our spring chickens, 60 plus year olds, uh, nine, 10 days ago, trying to dig carts out of Arcade Creek. And Mark's video that, that talked about the 63 carts in three quarters of a mile was actually inaccurate, because I think we exposed about 10 to 12 more that were buried. So um, lots of more work out there. Um, I want to talk about the 20-foot buffer because, and, and we clean up, I know that maybe some of the creeks and rivers that we discussed earlier or in our videos might be in the city, not in the county. We don't draw a line. We clean everywhere that there's a problem. We go into the county, we go into the city, we go to Elk Grove, we collaborate with people in Carmichael. We don't have geographical limitations. So when we go into the county, it'd be nice if we have some, some if you guys have paved the way, that then we can go to the city and say, this is what the county has done and look how much it's helped. And we can actually have data to try to propel the, the city and some of these other municipalities to get on board and help us. And all we're doing is asking that you make this ordinance protect the waterways, and make it consistent with state law. Uh, it's very important. I'm an attorney, um, and I only bring that up because I know how important it is when you're talking about enforcing laws that there be consistency bef between federal, state, and local. And that's, that's what we would highly recommend. That's what I would recommend as, uh, as an attorney that you do so that you have more legal standing. It makes things more... Uh, easier to defend. If you're actually consistent with state law, you can actually say, if you're ever legally challenged, oh, we're just making this consistent with state law. So it makes sense from a legal standpoint. It also makes sense from a practical standpoint. 
Because what we're seeing is massive amounts of debris in the waterways from camps that are more than 25 feet from the water, which is how the ordinance is currently drafted. This is a camp that we could only see from the, the water. But when we got inside, we realized that the actual camp was all the way up on the bank. And they had actually chiseled in and tiered the river bank, denuded it of all of its natural vegetation, exposing that to washout and erosion. This is not a levee. This is a river bank. This is more than 25 feet from the water. We took, I don't know how many boatloads uh, on a paddle boat. This is a hard, hard area to access. I think we took 15 boatloads of trash out of this one abandoned spot. So these are all areas that are more than 25. This is more, it's hard to tell, this is more than 25 feet from Steelhead Creek. I uncovered this myself and spent five hours. And look what I dug out of that one spot. All of that was in underneath the mattress, buried, all encampment trash. This is a spot that Lisa showed you. But up above the bank, more than 25 feet from the water, was all of this that we pulled out. And it goes on. This is more than 25 feet. This is more than 25 feet. This is more than 25 feet. This is more than 20 feet. This camp is actually about 50 feet from the river, but we still pulled all these textiles out of the river. That camp would be legal under your proposed ordinance. Okay, this Dave. is hard work. I challenge anybody here, if you want people to live along our creeks, come out with us. We're out every freaking week. And this is Dave. what we do. Dave. That's me in the yellow shirt. I do it every week. I, I get sciatica and I get numb hands Dave. from it. And I'm doing it not because I have a nonprofit, not because I get paid, but because I want to save and preserve our waterways. This is what happens when the water goes up and you have campments anywhere near the creeks. It ends up, that's Arcade Creek after the high river, after the high water flows last October. We need protections for our waterways. Okay, David, I need to have a conclude. Thanks, David. All right, County Council. Okay, Lisa. So I'll address your question that you asked before, Supervisor right. Trolley. Um, the 25 feet that we're talking about, obviously, you know, it applies to all critical infrastructure, not just waterways, hence the need for consistency. Um, but as it applies to waterways, the idea would be that it would be from the high water mark. And if the board would like further clarification, we could, we could uh, amend the ordinance to reflect that that's how it would be measured for um, creeks and drainage um, facilities. And if you want me to address anything else related to that, I'd be happy to do it. Okay, Phil. No, so I think that was part of the part of the um, question or the preference expressed by um, Sacramento picks up representatives. But I thought it was also the 150 versus the 25. So right. um, is that also something that the board could consider? Um, two things on that. One, there. I think they understand, but maybe not. They're, those are two different types of tools that we could use. So, because the camp, even if the camp is not with, is outside of 25 feet from the high water mark, if the individuals are de depositing trash, debris, and other things, they could still be cited for a violation of the Fish and Game Code that the um, proponents are talking about. So, there's two different, I think, things being accomplished there. Um, to, just to put a point on it, I think that Supervisor Desmond and Kennedy have both asked to answer your question. Um, again, for consistency, we are recommending that we keep the 25 feet um, from the high water mark. Additionally, um, we are trying to very um, narrowly craft this ordinance, as you all know, um, to um, make it as you know workable yet restrictive um, uh, as possible. Okay, thank you. So, but the high water mark then that moves it significantly up bank, up um, levee, uh, depending upon what the you know natural stream is or not. But that the high water mark is, is measured just, as you said, high water mark, historic high water, high water mark. Right. And, and it's easier to measure uh, because it's an actual scientific geographic uh, feature versus the bank of a river is difficult to determine. Yeah. So that's the um, Liz and her team have... Um, <clears throat> recommended that we use that. 
But you were saying we could apply it to the other creeks as well. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you could use the high water mark in the creek and then 25 feet beyond the high water mark. It doesn't negate or uh, make it inconsistent with what the Fish and Game Code, but, but it certainly moves it significantly uh, a distance from what might be the low flows, even um, you know, seasonal flows. It would push it up the bank. Correct. And there are a lot of speakers have a um, qu question, and I think I already answered the question for Supervisor Desmond, but this would apply to all waterways, sloughs, drainage, concrete lines, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Lisa, for weighing in. Okay. Now we have, uh, go back to our public uh, testimony. We have Mark Baker. And I do remember we still have folks on the phone, so thank the folks on the phone for their patience. We're still... Got a ways to go with our uh, folks in chamber. So Mark Baker, Crystal Tobias, and Mary. Mark is not here. Oh, Mark's not here? Okay, all right. He's out there, but we couldn't find him. Okay, so Crystal and then Mary Tapple. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors afternoon. and everybody here. Um, thank you for taking the issues in front of us today seriously. I'm Crystal Tobias, and I've been actively involved in cleaning our beautiful parkway and the surrounding land for over 30 years. I was at the cleanup where Mr. Cerna had his unfortunate and very scary contact with a hypodermic needle. I am the co-founder of FOLFAN, which is Friends of Lakes Folsom and Natoma. I'm responsible for bringing Adopt-a-Parkway slash trail programs to both Folsom Lake State Recreation Area and the city of Folsom, have supported the American River Parkway Foundation and saved the American River Association for decades, was instrumental in the draft horse cleanup last year on Steelhead Creek with Dr. Brady, and I'm a proud member of Sacramento Picks It Up. I think I have a little credibility. <laughs> I am here today to offer my strongest support for the two ordinances in front of us. In our work on Steelhead Creek, we met with the Gardenland Northgate Neighborhood Association who live adjacent to that waterway. Many of the members lamented that while they grew up enjoying Steelhead Creek and all it had to offer, swimming, fishing, picnicking, hiking, biking, and enjoying nature, they no longer feel safe going there due to the criminal element that has taken root along the waterway and because of the toxic hazardous waste left by the illegal campers, including human waste and hundreds if not thousands of hypodermic needles. This neighborhood is designated as severely underserved and many therein do not have the resources to go to Tahoe or Point Reyes to recreate. They have lost their parkway due to this situation which is tantamount to illegal taking. What I am strongly supporting is fourfold. Designate all Sacramento waterways as critical infrastructure, creeks, streams, storm drains, and sloughs. Pass and enforce ordinances prohibiting the accumulation of human waste, garbage, debris, and storage of personal items within 150 feet of the high water mark in all waterways. Enforce all existing anti-dumping laws within 150 feet feet of the high water mark, including California Fish and Game 5652. And finally, advance and fund consistent waterway cleaning and restoration with our regional departments and agencies collaborating to do so. I thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> okay, uh, Mary Tapple, followed by Mark Berry, followed by Steve Green. Uh, hi, members of the board. I'm Mary Tapple. I've often come before you. I'm, I'm hoping, yeah, at least uh, Phil Cerner and, and Don Natola, you remember me. But I, I always say the same thing about the, uh, what Crystal Tobias and, and many others have, have echoed, including our parks director, Liz Bellis, that there, there's no environmental justice or social justice for the vast of amounts of low-income people who are barely, a lot of them, hanging on to their housing, trying to make a living in rough situations where they cannot afford to go to the state parks or even refugee, and my husband and I do refugee, up to and now the, the upstream parkway, uh, very often because the downstream parkway is so impacted. Even though um, it hurts me, deeply, because I remember decades ago when we were able to help clean it up somewhat significantly to, to help everybody have resources. We, we, my husband and I, who are oldsters now, I'm 68, he's 75, we went to the Arcade Creek uh, um, cleanup that um, you saw the pictures of, 
And there I feel supported because all these younger people are also helping all the older people. And there were both a lot of younger people there and a lot of older people. I'm so grateful to all the Sacramento Picks It Up people. I don't know how they find that spirit, but I'm just glad. And I'm partly living off it to once in a while be able to face how bad things have become. So we, we critically need both these ordinances, and please, I, I support all of Crystal Tobias's comments on expanding that, and lots of people's comments on expanding it to 150 feet uh, from the high watermark for all of our critical waterways uh, as, critical, as critical infrastructure for all of the reasons everybody's brought up. And uh, I, I feel I should also speak about the fire dangers. I, I've been much, much earlier year when it was actually safe to when you saw a fire approaching that might leap the river and go and go also hurt those people in the homeless camps, partly because they had a lot of burnable debris near their places. Uh, I went over there and tried to help, but now it's, it's so dangerous, uh, even for the firefighters, to try to go alert people. And they brought it up, and, and it, it reminded me, I better testify about this. Over 10 years ago, it was safe. Now it is not safe anymore for just your average citizen to try to even warn people who might be in the path of a fire voluntarily because they move so fast, and you don't know. If, if there's going to be a lot of attack, attack dogs in the homeless camps, and you don't know if those camps themselves are full of people who might want to burn out other <coughs> camps with all their propane tanks and all of their other fire incendiaries. And it's a crisis situation now in the park. We need all those propane tanks and, and all those uh, fire uh, extending things. We need them moved out of all of the way, areas of the parkway where they are forbidden, which is everywhere, except uh, some you know, charcoal is allowed, of course, near the barbecue pits. But all that other stuff is a crisis of personal safety for everybody using the parkway and for our law enforcement responders and for our firefighter responders, and it's just getting worse and worse. It's driving a lot of people out of the parkway, as you well know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Okay, I'm Mark Berry. Mark's followed by Stephen Green, followed by Michael Seaman. Good afternoon, Mark. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Uh, good evening, thank you for the opportunity to address this. Uh, my name's uh, Mark Berry. Um, I moved to Sacramento in 1982, and uh, uh, one of the reasons I stayed has been, uh, you know, just the beauty of the area and the, and the American River Parkway. Um, I've been a user of the American River Parkway for, you know, many decades, and uh, it's tributaries, creeks, channels, and I just have to say in the last decade or so, it's degraded, it's all polluted, it's, it's trashed, and, and really it's, it's shameful and, and a disgrace. Um, I know that, uh, you know, uh, this seems to be a two-pronged issue, and I think it's an oversimplification for uh, saying this is about addressing the unhoused versus preserving the American River. I think the ordinance before uh, the county really is uh, about uh, um, curbing camping, fires, and dumping to preserve the American River. Um, the proposed amendment, uh, you know, covers the American River Parkway, the Dry Creek Parkway, and critical infrastructure. And my concern is that, you know, in reading the, the documents, there's 800 to 900 campers nightly. If we're just mitigating or migrating campers from the American River Parkway or the Dry Creek Parkway, in the, in the tributaries, and they're not adequately defined. We're just we're just shifting the problem, and uh, as you can see that, and I've been uh, on uh, cleanup with the uh, um, Sacramento picks it up. It, it's it's a horrible problem. You can just walk along any of these tributaries. It's it's everywhere, and rather than just shifting the problem into these tributaries if we don't adequately define them. Uh, you know, really we should be, be shifting people to uh, opportunities. And I think by closing um, uh, some of these, uh, uh, the river places where people are now camping, we perhaps will be opening up some other opportunities for them. So I'd like the, uh, to consider the, pos the county to consider the possibility of uh, uh, fully fulfilling its duty to protect uh, the river and its parkways and include in the proposal amendments uh, um, to protect all the tributaries by uh, extending uh, the reach 150 feet from the high water mark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> next, Stephen Green, Michael Seaman, and Nate, then Nikki Jones. So, Steve. Uh, 
Oh, thank you. I'm S Stephen Green, Save the American River Association. I want to uh, simply endorse previous statements that you've heard that we designate all regional waterways here in this county as critical infrastructure. And it is also that critical infrastructure should be designated to cover the first 150 feet of the, from the higher water mark on the parkway and the waterways. Uh, you've seen a number of photos today of creeks that look like dumps with water flowing through them. Uh, this didn't have to happen. It absolutely did not have to happen. We have the laws in place to enforce this, and the county has not done a good job of enforcing the laws, particularly Efficient Game Code 5652. There needs to be a much more aggressive area, effort to do that, and we don't have to wait until uh, these uh, ordinances are in place for that to happen. It needs to happen now. Um, finally, I noted once before, before you folks, that last year I worked with Assemblymember McCarty to get legislation passed to establish a camp at uh, Cal Expo, to get people off the parkway. Uh, unfortunately, it, the management at Cal Expo has been resisting doing that. And I would hope that the county would reach out to Cal Expo and see if we can get this done. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Michael, and then Nikki, and then uh, Josh Wood. Thank you very much. I know it's been a long time, and you guys are really patient about this, so I appreciate that. I'm going to talk about uh, both ordinances. Uh, you have a letter from me. I'm not going to read it on the record. You already have it. Um, as I understand, what you're trying to do with, with both ordinances is, is get a balance between the, the need to provide housing and services and the need to enforce, and I appreciate that. Um, there have been an, a number of uh, problems. Everybody's brought it uh, to your attention already about the compromise of other uh, <clears throat> public purposes. So I just want to highlight some things that I said in my letter to you. Uh, number one, the tributary waters. Uh, they do indeed need to be addressed. I personally don't think that they should be part of the critical infrastructure. I think that they're part of the parkway because they're part of the drainage network of the parkway. They're part of the wildlife corridors of the parkway. Um, in particular, Chicken Ranch Slough and Strong Ranch Slough need to be on your radar as integral parts of the parkway system. Um, <clears throat> As a, a member of the board of Fulton Camino Recreation and Park District, I, uh, I know that we've got uh, precious public lands through which uh, two of those sloughs pass. Uh, I, I de care deeply about the Creekside Nature Area. I care deeply about uh, Cottage Park and Santa Anita Park and Howe Park, all of which uh, serve the public, and the creeks run right through the middle of them. Um, so please make sure that the tributary waters are, are considered. Next, fires. Uh, in, in your ordinance, you, you talk about fires as being related to severe weather. Uh, look, the fire season's all year round, and <clears throat> you really need to pay attention to that and not just try to link it with um, the severe weather events. I put in my letter uh, an instance of a uh, fire that fortunately was able to be put out before it could have destroyed an awful lot of other very valuable property. Um, on Chicken Ranch Slough. That happened in the middle of the night on basically a mild night um, at the end of June. Uh, and that, I should add, it's, it still hasn't been abated, the, um, the damage from it. Okay, and then finally, parks. Your staff talked about how in putting the ordinance together, you, you talked with uh, the utility district, you talked with the reclamation districts. Well, I didn't see that you talked with the park districts. And frankly, I personally think that parks are critical infrastructure. And children use parks. You talk in your ordinance about youth serving uh, facilities, and you say that there's schools and libraries. Well, hello, kids use parks. Kids are in parks all the time. We have playgrounds, we have play fields, we have all kinds of facilities that kids use. So you really need to consider that. And, um, and then finally, 25 feet away from a youth serving facility is way too close. It needs to be much farther than that. Um, 
one of my friends said that Elk Grove has, I think it's 500 foot uh, barrier. You need to really think about how close to a kid do you want to have a troubled um, homeless person? And I'm not saying all homeless people are troubled. In fact, very few of them are, but uh, some are. And, and so you're, if you're making a rule, you've got to look for the lowest common denominator. It'd be nice to have it farther away from the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> okay, and Nikki Jones, followed by Josh Wood. Oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Desmond, I'm sorry. Just while they're coming up, just yeah. thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real yeah. quick, on, on the parks, could you address the point of the parks? I think we had this discussion. Um, why was that not included? Sure. Again, we're trying to narrowly craft the ordinance. Um, this mirrors other jurisdictions that um, define critical infrastructure very similarly. Um, and so that is the reason why parks in general are um, left out. There's um, not necessarily always a compelling interest to regulate in those areas. Um, so it was a conscious decision to to choose not to include those. And in terms of other authorities that apply to parks, are there other code sections? And well, I mean, in general, most parks, I believe, um, have in, that they're not allowed to have overnight camping, and they're also enforcing with thing, opening of sunrise to sunset, those types of things. So there are other um, mechanisms to regulate camping in parks. Um, and again, we don't have authority over all of the parks within the county, so that would be another uh, oh, impediment. That's a good point, too. Yeah. Yeah. We have three dependent park districts, I think, but they also can form their own... Um, rules and regulations with approval by the board, so they can certainly do that on their own if desired as well. Okay. And I was going to speak to the wildfires. I know you haven't asked right now, but um, just to let the board know that the reason why we've um, tied it the way that we have is that we consulted with the fire, um, Metro Fire, and I believe the city of Sacramento, and that was their preference in defining it the way that we've defined it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Nick, okay. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, Nikki Jones, then Josh Wood, and then uh, Joyce Williams. Thank you. Yeah, for him. <clears throat> All right. Y'all, here's a reminder that housing justice is racial justice, is economic justice, is environmental justice, it's disability justice. They are tied. They are not separate. They are not binary. Advocates for one are not pitted against the other, as your presentations did tonight. These ordinances are in opposition to these values and will not be enforceable, um, and they will not reduce your complaints. I'm just going to tell you guys that from the beginning. Um, it's society and especially government uh, who have broken the social contract. Homelessness is a structural, not an individual, failure. So this is the encampment response policy. Hmm. If we had that, that would be an infusion of services, basic needs, not more police contact and force removal. This is a cynical, cruel, ineffective, and honestly, probably a legal attempt, <clears throat> a legal attempt to gobble up public space, as not for the public, whose economic status most requires that space to meet their most fundamental needs, like sitting, sleeping, sharing time and resources with friends and loved ones, eating, praying, having belongings, in other words, existing and surviving. These are those members of the public for whom you are prioritizing instead repeated traumatic encounters with law enforcement, physical labor and stress, emotional and psychological degradation, loss of community from this ordinance. It does nothing to create, guarantee, or put people on pathways to actual housing. I do have some specific questions, and I know that everything the county that Liz and Emily have brought to you about what kind of outreach happens on the parkway is not what happens on the parkway. If you want to find out what happens on the parkway, come and talk to anybody who lives out there. We'll tell you. We'll tell you what happens on the parkway, okay? This ain't it. Um, has county staff analyzed or even estimated how many people are living outside in these specified areas? Both the parkway, which I heard someone refer to as hundreds, which is definitely thousands, uh, and then also in all of these uh, special places or what you are calling critical. I'll tell you, housing is a critical infrastructure. Let's get there. Um, 
do they understand, county staff, uh, that there are many more of those people that I'm wondering if they've estimated than the beds available or even on the long-term term, term table for, for the next many years? I wonder if Phil knows that. Many, all the next many years on the table, all the availability, it doesn't, it doesn't hold a match, not a candle, to the number of people living outside, okay? So did county staff do any outreach or hold listening sessions with people who live in these areas? Folks closest to the issue are closest to the solution but have been ignored uh, constantly um, and are not being asked uh, or consulted for a solution. According to the logic of proponents of this parkway bill, uh, that's, that humans are destroying the river's ecosystem instead of figuring out, you know, we could all figure out healthier ways we could support participating, humans who are participating in an ecosystem. If you carried on the logic they're using, humans everywhere are a nuisance. We're killing the planet's ability to uh, allow us to habitate on it. And uh, then, so therefore, the logic goes that we should remove them. Y'all, that's ecocide. That's fasc ecofascism. We should remove the, the humans from public space because they're ruining the, the e ecosystem. That is what's happening across the planet. It is not just the rivers and it is not the fault of people who live outside, okay? Uh, we are also environmental activists. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we are. Come help us. Yeah, I, would, I, I clean up the river, yeah. bro. Get, 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 um, Nikki, okay, you need to so conclude. According to their logic, it's ecocide, blah, blah, blah. It's definitely not the heart of their argument, but that's the point. If humans are the toxic uh, measure, then, then that, and that's who you need to get rid of, then that's what they're saying. If you apply that, then the ecocide becomes very clear when it's not just about poor people. But they're just talking about poor people here, so maybe you don't see it. Okay? Okay, Nikki, okay I, know, I know, I know, I yeah. know. In fact, so also, I'm going to go, I'm going to, yeah. Let's... <clears throat> In fact, it, is, it harkens back to a more settler colonial greenwashing of white environmentalism and the theft of native lands. Uh, that river is none of yours. It is the unceded territory of the Valley Miwok and the Nisanon people who lived along it long before you called it the Parkway or uh, this place, Sacramento. If environmentalism was the issue, we'd advocate for regular trash pickup, dumpsters, pesticide, uh, uh, stopping pesticides, hygiene facilities, increased river flows, a stop to the Delta tunnels, etc. This binary categorization is of homeless advocates versus uh, environmental advocates is trash. There are not shelter beds and especially not actual housing for the thousands of people who live in these areas. Uh, the county doesn't necessarily find these options for people when they are planning to remove them. I've seen it over and over and over again. It's a bald lie, Nikki, bald please. lie from Liz and Emily, okay? I truly do wonder what it feels like to get into social work, to go to school, to learn the best practices from the field, to work your way up in your career, to make hundreds of thousands of dollars, to lead the whole social services department, to have the room, the budget, the trusted expertise to collaborate on real solutions for our community's most pressing social and economic issues, but instead Final to be order, asked Mr. to spend Chair, countless please. hours okay. reworking and justifying strategies towards criminalization okay. that Nikki. the USICH, the United States Point Interagency order, Council okay. on Homelessness, has already Nikki. said are ineffective. Okay, Nikki. Ineffective and wasteful, Thank Emily. Nikki. Okay, but you're okay. going to keep trying them, right? You're going to okay. keep okay. getting Nikki. up here and copying for them. Nikki. They're wasteful and they're ineffective. Okay. Six okay. minutes is literally what you promised us in your agenda. So, so y'all so are so you, so just yes, got so there. Just got there. Okay, you okay. all made a commitment in the agenda. Okay. Let's talk about broken social okay, contracts. Okay, okay. There's thank another. Thank They're constant. Okay. They're constant. Thank you, thank you. And mostly for people who impact us the most. Don't talk to me about decorum when you're literally orchestrating state violence. Okay. State violence. This yeah. is unfair to everyone else. State violence. Nick, Nick, Use Nick, your Nick. gavel, Don. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. State violence. Okay. State violence. Straight up. Okay, thank you, Nikki. All right. Josh Wood, then Joyce Williams, and Shelly Williams. Okay. Come on. Okay. Speak, Nick. Uh, okay, come on, Nikki, please. All right. Okay. All right. We're not going to yell shut up at each other. We're giving people a chance to talk. You're going to get an opportunity to talk. Please show some mutual respect and courtesy here, please. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. First, yep. I want to thank all the people who have been cleaning the parkway for the rest of us. It's, it's really appreciated. You deserve a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, Joshua with Region Business, and I just wanted to come here and support the two items before you guys today. I have to say, uh, the pictures speak a thousand words. It's 
absolutely clear that these items are necessary and we need this uh, to help just preserve Sacramento. Um, so we just want to say thank you, um, you know, to you, your staff, or each of you, and also, you know, over this, you know, heard from a lot, us a lot over this past few weeks, and just uh, for working with us to really create a partnership between you and the city and reach out. That's important because at the end of the day, Mr. Chair, I, I, this is none, this is unfair to the speaker. It's unfair to the rest of the people that actually respected the, their okay. own time. Okay. I'm asking security at this point if they can't. If they can't be civilized okay. and be, okay. be civilized okay. and let people speak, then okay. go outside. No, no. Drag people out of there and No. Maybe you'll get a picture of it. Okay. It's okay. What oh. I'll say is just okay. thank you. We appreciate it. And this is the right direction, and I think everyone knows it. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Josh. Yeah, yeah, everyone knows it. Okay. Please, will you allow the speakers to say their comments and not have you know, the background, it's, it's, it's important. The same courtesy were extended to, to you, so let's have some decorum. I don't want people to be physically removed from the chambers, so let's, you can take it outside if you want, but let's, in the chambers, respect one another. Okay, all right. Okay, next, Joyce Williams, Joyce. Okay, and then Shelly Williams, and then Betsy Weiland. Good afternoon, Joyce. Good evening. Good evening, Joyce. I'm Joyce Williams. This is not a good idea. That's the point. No one ever asked any of the home unhoused to solve this problem. For you, it's um, it just um, my wife and I are a victim of a violent crime, and we were put out here, we went to your organizations, we asked all of the organizations that are supposed to help the unhoused people, <clears throat> but they have, they turned us away. We didn't fall into their category. Not everybody's a drug addict out there, okay? A percentage of them are? We aren't. And I guess we don't fall into any of your little categories. The drug, mental illness, is screw you. No services for Joyce and no services for my wife. What's really a, a, a conflict, what, what was really accomplished with the winter triage shelter? Nothing on railroad. Some of those, men, those, some of those people that were in that triage shelter, they're back out there. None of them asked if we needed assistance when we went to these people, meaning Sacramento Steps Forward, meaning Volunteers of America, meaning, and they told us we didn't fall into their category. And so here we sit, and we've helped the clean up, and we're being categories as that? We're not. There's only nine people where he's saying there is, and those, are, those, those pictures that he was showing are from the first clean up there. And that was how many years ago? Okay. And so you're showing that and now we, I myself, he's never had to clean up after me. And, and uh, this is wrong. This, uh, it, we just need to re rethink all this because I'm one of those people that are out there. I didn't choose to be out there and neither did my wife. And we went to these organizations that did, we've been harassed by the Rangers, we've been ticketed for bullshit. Right. That's all I have to say. Uh, I, I, I feel for everybody that is involved, but what about the ones that, sh okay? Thank you, Joyce. Don't, don't do it. I mean, okay. don't do it. Thank you, Joyce. How is it? shut up. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Joyce. All right, next, uh, Shelly Williams. And then Betsy Weiland, followed by Kristen Lopez. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shelly Williams. Hi. I live in District 1, Del Paso Heights area. I am a parent of a second grader at Woodlake. Um, what? Okay. Uh, I, uh, I am a... Uh, <laughs> Social worker with a background in Housing First and uh, currently not practicing but doing a lot of camp outreach and sweep 
defense recovery support. And um, so, you know, I had a lot of things I wanted to say. I thought we were going to be able to speak to both of these measures and uh, pretty frustrating because they're very different and have different talking points. Um, so I heard a lot of, I also want to say too, I am one of the low income families that lives near the parkway. I, you know, I spend 70% of my income on rent. Um, I, so I'm one of the people that are being spoken for here, and I don't need you to speak for me. Um, me and my son enjoy the parkway. We go to the parkway. We see friends. We say hello. Um, it is not a thing that I am terrified to go do, and, and I don't, you know, I, I don't understand that argument, but whatever. So um, what I wanted to show folks was what these measures will actually do. I think people don't understand that. And maybe you have never been to a sweep. Maybe you've never seen what a sweep looks like. And I've heard a lot of people talking about having compassion for the people living outside. So without there being any kind of real-time housing, um, and actually Mackenzie spoke to this sweep earlier. Uh, it was in 2019. And, and the reason we're highlighting this one is because we've been able to track what has happened to people after. And so 200 people were displaced. They have been swept at least 78 times since that sweep, and we know of at least 35 people who died. Um, so that is what sweeps do, and uh, I just want to play on my phone. If someone could help me yeah, make sure I'm that sure this is I, like... I stopped the time. Go ahead. What? Yeah, you, you want to play it up? Just If you can put it to the microphone. On the, on the oh, white on spot, the white yeah. yeah. There you go, yeah. Okay. And if you can bring, maybe just bring the microphone down towards it there, Shelley. Okay. That, so my, I guess we don't really need... Oh, you're just going to show it? Okay. Was there a voice associated I mean, with it? there's music to it. Oh, okay. Well, that's right. Is it copyrighted? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so better. Okay. All right. But I want folks to see what they're okay. supporting. Yeah, so there were no services offered. Oftentimes, you know, we hear, oh, people are refusing services. There's been a number of sweeps that uh, I've gone to support where we learned that the services offered were ID vouchers. That's it. And then you can turn around and say that people refused services um, because they didn't accept a service that they didn't need or want. And I also want people to know like what the community, you know, what the community showed out for this and we will continue to. People are increasingly not okay with seeing our neighbors um, being harassed, stolen from w by men with guns. Say that. I was illegally arrested that day. So people in the community were trying to help and were surrounded by armed men and friends. And not a service provider. Honestly. No and service not provider. Not a single person out. I've never been. Oh, it's going to mop your parkway and into your neighborhood. So I'm here for that. And there is a solution that, you know, housing, 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 housing. And that's what we can all come together and be like working on together um, instead of finding ways to be at odds with one another if we do all truly um, want to see this problem solved in a humane way. The last thing I want to say, uh, I said I'm a parent of a second grader and uh, there was a sweep at Rio Lindo, Rio Lindo last month that was attended by Twin Rivers police. So we're seeing kind of some new really disturbing developments happening around schools and sweeps and youth and all of this. And uh, I found it horrifying. I called the school district. I spoke to the director of student services and I learned the most staggering statistic. And so if we're doing all this uh, often feigned concern for k children, in my opinion, sometimes it comes from a, a real place. One in 10 Twin River students is unhoused. 10%. 
So that means in every single Twin Rivers classroom, there are a handful of unhoused students. Where do you think those students have to live to go to school? So, you know, if we really care about children, that should be so horrifying and should mobilize us yesterday into making sure that there are no unhoused, unhoused children, um, no unhoused people, but you know, that is the thing that's invoked so often and that's how I know it's not real because that's the reality um, in my kids' school. And I don't know where it is elsewhere. I tried to get those numbers. They're kind of hard to get from some of the districts I'm working on that, but um, I just, Need everybody to know that because it has kept me up at night. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Shelly. Next is uh, Betsy Wallen. Uh, I don't need to speak. Okay. I support both okay. Words. Thank you, Betsy. All right, Krista Lopez, and then Krista's followed by Krista Kennedy. Kennedy. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name's Kristen. I work with ACE. Okay, so I'm an outreach specialist. What I do five hours a day, five days a week, is I knock on people's doors and I call them. And they're all renters, right? Okay? So we fight for renters' rights. The woman that was here earlier today, Patricia, that was telling you about her toxic landlord situation, they're not even landlords, they're flippers and they're just there to make a profit and get people like her out, okay? I asked her, how much would a $100 rent increase affect your life? And she said she's on a fixed income and she would end up out on the street. Okay? So now you want to make a law, two laws, that will make her a criminal for camping. That's what you want to do. And it's because of people like you, Sue Frost, who did not support extending the eviction moratorium or rent control, real rent control here in, in Sacramento. It was a two to 5% cap that we were fighting for. You didn't support that, this is on you. All these people that I talk to daily, they, I live in your district, okay? I live in the county. I live over off of Stockton Boulevard. I have homeless people living two doors down from me. I help, I take their garbage. I take their garbage, you understand? <laughs> My neighbor down the street, out of his own pocket, put up a porta potty in front of his house. That's what you need to do. You don't need. <sighs> All the people here that are complaining about how horrible homeless people are, I guarantee you they do not support laws like rent control laws that will keep people in their homes and still allow landlords to profit. But that's not good enough for you because it's all about the profit and not the people, isn't it? That's all you care about. This system is controlled by greed and I'm gonna make it my mission that everybody I talk to about the housing crisis understands exactly where you stand. So you better vote right on this. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, uh, Krista Kennedy, and then uh, Kit Kirkpatrick, and then Kim Pacini, ouch. So I hope that when you guys are considering the solution to this, and I'm saying solution because we already discussed the issue, like how much, right? So when we're considering the solution, I hope that we're not combining homelessness and trash. Like, I hope it's not like one testing, testing. Can you hear me? Boop. Oh, you speak in the middle? Thanks. Anyway, homelessness, trash, they're not like the same thing. You know what I mean? Um, and like, when it comes to contributing to the solution, cheers to the people who pick up trash and help contribute to the, you know, that's the solution. 
for you guys, but also like, let's pick up the trash and then human beings, let's house human beings. Let's actually provide real resources to human beings, not put them in handcuffs in jail and treat them like criminals because they need homes. Clean up the trash, like is it one, or is it the same thing? Are you like, cause it seems like this whole discussion, it's like you guys like are very like, have this thin line where homelessness is garbage and garbage is homelessness and then there is no like separation in between. So what are we just throwing all these human beings away or something too? Like, I don't know, it's kind of violent, it's, it's a lot. But maybe we should separate that, get rid of the trash, like actually care about human beings and not treat them like trash. Like, it's not, it's not human's fault that the trash is there. Like, you, you guys are like representatives of the city, so maybe you can like literally take a responsibility to clean up the effing trash, you know what I mean? Like, that seems like an actual responsibility, and then at the same time, you should take the responsibility to provide actual resources to the human beings sleeping next to the freaking trash. Like, that's a, I don't know. You sleep on that. Thank you, Krista. Okay, uh, Kit, Kit Kirkpatrick. So, is Kit here? All right. Kim Pacini, ouch. All right. Davi Rodriguez, I think I called him earlier. Davi, out here. Okay, Jim Sargent. Jim. Okay. Chris Balam. Chris. Brenda Gustine. Brenda. And then Brenda's followed by Vince Jacobs. Hi, Ben. Hi there. Hi. I just first want to say thank you for your patience and um, appreciate that you give people time when they need it. Um, I'm a native Sacramentan, and I am deeply concerned about the long-term health and sustainability of our waterways and how it has been neglected. Uh, I also am concerned about the increasing number of people unable to afford housing. I appreciate that tonight you've listened to um, the suggestions about um, moving the critical, in including the critical infrastructure um, to have, um, sorry, <laughs> I've been messing with my notes <laughs> as you go along because everything keeps changing. Um, that you're gonna, you're including the rivers and the um, tributaries, creeks, sloughs, and canals, if I heard you right, as critical infrastructures. And that the um, 150 foot will be the high water mark. And so I appreciate that change. I am in support of these ordinances. I would like to see enforcement of exist, all existing anti-dumping laws by all citizens. Um, and this is already in place, as others have said tonight, uh, with the fishing game, um, section 5652. Um, I'd like to see um, advancement and funding of consistent creek, river, and other waterway cleaning and restoration by our regional departments and agencies, because it is two issues. It's not necessarily all the homeless that are doing this, as evidenced by the amount of trash that uh, has an age placed on it. So I think you understand that. Um, as Mackenzie mentioned, this is um, touched on many truths. This is a very complex situation. Um, I work with nonprofits here in town, and I work closely with people who are helping people that um, are poverty stricken, have lost homes, have been subject to uh, rent conditions that are far beyond them. And I'm involved in many programs where they're helping. A problem I see that happens is most citizens don't know about these. And so then they have trouble uh, finding these services. I really appreciate that you had this out front. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cerna. And I liked, since COVID, we've been losing touch with, because so many of these programs have been changed or shut down. And I think it's really important to increase the knowledge um, to educate our citizens for compassionate action rather than creating an us versus um, 
them to invest tax dollars to implement expansion of numerous programs that are already helping citizens of all econ socioeconomic situations. And yet at the same time to enforce existing laws for illegal campers and polluters. It's her so as part of the outreach also to invite media to exercise more of its power to report on these successful programs, educate local citizens with action steps and solutions to aid the truly homeless and hopeless people we witness on our streets daily. Citizens educated with solutions can guide people to existing services and engage in helping these services and its recipients thrive. So I'm here to help do that and do what I can to clean things up, but also spread the word about the services that are available. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks. Thanks Okay, so next, uh, Vince Jacobs. Is Vince still here? Uh, and Dave Reed. Vince, Dave Reed. Dorothy Richards. Dorothy? All right. Um, let's see. Tommy? All right. Uh, David? Uh, is, is it Hound, Hounded, Junior, David? H O U N I D, David? Sandra Reynolds, Sandra? And then Dan Adderholt. He always spoke on three, though. So, so Sandra, then Tom Biglioni. to this um, okay. homelessness. Um, I've been on the are, river. are you Sandra? You're Sandra? Yes, I'm okay, Sandra. Sandra. Good, good. Go ahead. Um, I'm new to the river. Um, I'm on the American River um, between 7th and 5th. Um, I have not seen a lot, all this trash. I have not. Where I'm at, I help clean the, the whole American River on my side. Um, I take care, but I make sure I clean my neighbors. I, I, I really pretty much, I love animals. I've seen so many wildlife, and I just, I wanted you guys to see the, there's more to this trash. I mean, there, I've seen nothing but beautiful animals and turtles and, uh, <laughs> I mean, crawdads, and um, I've helped uh, animals. I have old cranes, like, a, I, I've never seen the pictures like this. Like, I literally, I'm just, I'm thrown. But I've actually, I've been a working person. I, I worked all my life. I lost my job to this pandemic. <clears throat> pandemic. I have grandkids. I have my kids. Um, they don't know where I'm at. They don't know that I'm in homeless and living in a tent and... Uh, I take care of my dogs. My dogs are healthy. I have the only dog in town that has a split nose, and he's healthy. He wasn't supposed to live, but he's the only one living in Sacramento County in Yolo. But I, I mean, I nobody really knows that I'm here because I stay to myself. I stay with my dogs and me. We we don't go anywhere. But I met him. Um, he approached me, but. Nobody else has approached me. I, I went to every service. I went to the welfare. I went to uh, see housing. I've been to um, uh, women's empowerment. I've been to um, the Salvation Army. I went to Mather. I went. I don't do drugs. I don't have a habit. I don't have. I don't require. I don't fall into that category of having. I, I'm by myself, so I don't, there's no thing or anything, services out there for me. I'm 54 years old. I never knew I was going to be living on the river. But I, around me, I pick up, I, I've been through three floods. And not one of the water has hit me and, and took my stuff into the river. I've seen my neighbors, <laughs> and I pulled everything out of the river that ever went into the river by, next to me. I cleaned that river. I rake it, all the junk out, but I've never seen this much trash in my life. Um, I just take care of my, my place and uh, all the way down from me, 
but I go with him, we do this every day. We pick up trash every single day. And we do, we're out there for four hours just picking up trash, but I've never seen that much trash in my life. I, I, I have pictures of, I mean, I paste my pictures on the wall. I take pictures of the river every day. I see nothing but healthy and, and fish. We see fish and we see salmon. We see, I've never had to see anything like that in my life. I just wanted to let you guys know that um, I'm new, but nobody knows that I'm there because I stay to myself. But I just wanted to let you guys know it's not, it's not all, everything bad, you know? Thanks, Andrew. Okay, we also want to show Thanks. a video to you guys really quick. We aren't talking okay. Very important. Also, um, Tommy and my crew members would like to talk, oh. want me to talk on their behalf, you guys, because they had to leave, and they were really upset about the lies that were being said by our crew, so they left. You guys heard the outbreak. <laughs> Why don't you guys watch this video, please? Yes. This is all of us out here cleaning the American River Park. We've been doing this for 10 years, almost 10 years, cleaning every day. And during winter time, we clean nine years. Okay. We usually take 50 tons of trash since Porsche came along. Bill Cerna, you know what it used to be like. American River Parkway is destroyed. So do you want us to watch the video, done. Dan? Is that what you, you want us to watch the video? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Right. Sorry. Here we are, rewind. There we go. I'm just new. <laughs> Yeah, you can hear. Yeah, there you go. I've never seen that much. Not my crew members, Mario and Mike, down here cleaning. Be careful, you guys. Say hi. You're on live video. <laughs> Mario, say hi. Mike, live video, brother. Oh, man. Oh no, that's the pathway. Yeah, we're just not gonna go to mop up down here, keep it clean and safe, make sure it's clean at all times down here. Head towards Discovery Park this morning. Ah, beautiful day though. Really nice out here. I want to show you guys more of the parkway. Mind you guys, this parkway is supposed to have been destroyed and today trash everywhere. We keep the trash cleaned up 24-7. There is no trash on the parkway. We keep it that way. And my home screens are there on the lower America River Parkway. That's why I'm going to show you guys proof of this. You say pictures, videos, out in words. It was me and my micro home screws. I've been cleaning every day for the last nine and a half years. I kept it clean this way all the time. And Discovery Park, because we don't want no kids stepping on the needle. And nobody loves America River Parkway more than me and my micro home screws. We're the environmentalists out there. We care for the parkway more than anybody does. Ain't nobody out there got the heart like my crew do, volunteering clean without being paid a promise anything every day. Okay. I've been there two okay. years. I've been here two years, and I've been with them, and, and it, we keep it clean. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sandra. Thanks, thanks again, Dan. Thanks. I wish I could show you pictures of the, how I see it. Okay. Don, I owe well, you guys. Well, you described it for us, Sandra. I appreciate that. Hey, Don, yes, I owe you guys apology for this. My cool earlier. Yeah. I just don't like my crews being lied about. I, I apologize for that. I understand. Apology to I say one more thing really quick sure. on my time for being with my crews here because they really want me to say this. My crews are very offended. Um, we do not want to be having a competition thing with any group like Sacramento Picks Up or anything like that. Matter of fact, we want to help them out. Yeah. Okay, Mark Baker is, I mean, I like the guy. He's a good guy. Um, Roland Brady, I mean, we have, a friend, we have our differences, but we, we work together yeah. and everything. The thing is, though, you guys, we're not out here to um, say that anybody, everybody cleans everything up, okay? Because my crew's been out here for the last 10 years clean, almost 10 years clean every day. You guys know this. I did this out of my own pocket mostly. I spent, oh, what? I, my wife even chewed me out for this. I spent $870,000 through the years. She added it up, $870,000 through the years. And, you know, it's, I, we just came from a nonprofit, and we're all working together, and I, and I can help them as they're, since they're not a nonprofit. We can help each other with the stuff. I have no problem with right, that. Yeah. But anyways, what I'm getting at though is my micro homes crews do want, want this uh, area down here on 10th Street between uh, Highway 5 and 160, I mean, okay. um, to be a safe ground if you guys will pass that for that because they live there every day and they keep it clean and safe every day. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thanks for what you do. Okay. All right. We've got a few more speakers. We still have some folks on the phone. So uh, Tom Biglioni and then Diana Pajetto. Is Tom here? Tom left. Tom left. Okay. All right. Diana and then Bruce Oliver. Hi, Dana. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Chair Natoli, Supervisors, County Exec Ann Edwards. My name is Diana Pajetto. I'm the Executive Director of the American River Parkway Foundation. 
sorry, I sound very... We all know, as we're sitting here, the effects of homelessness, whether it's on the parkway, whether it's on the city streets. It is a humanitarian crisis throughout Sacramento County. I don't think anyone in this chamber previously or now is gonna deny that. Destruction is occurring on the parkway. Destruction is occurring on city streets. Critical infrastructure is important because all of us, as people that live here, we want clean drinking water from our wells. We want power to turn on, so if something happens to one of the critical infrastructure power lines for SMUD, pg and &E, or WAPA, we would all be here in the dark and no power. Yes, I understand homeless live without power, but for everyone else, that critical infrastructure is very, very important. We also realize the need for housing. The Parkway Foundation supports these ordinances with the caveats that we continue to search and seek and develop housing and shelter space locations, which is why during the budget discussions back in June that there was the $5 million that was appropriated. The Parkway Foundation is working with different developers to find land that shelters, safe grounds can be developed. We're even looking at some spaces on the parkway that would be able to be developed as safe grounds that would hopefully then have water facilities, restroom facilities, support services that would be there to actually provide those services because we know without those services, those that are homeless, that are currently unhoused, without those services, they will not be successful. So to have that wraparound service is crucial for, the, for this community and for everyone that lives in this community. Because I don't think anyone, whether you're, you're a city, county resident, appreciates, wants to drive down a street and see the destruction that is occurring, that we all have to do better as a community. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Okay, next, uh, Bruce Oliver. Uh, did Bruce leave? Okay. Um, is it, I don't know the first name here. Is last name Singh? I don't know if it's Sandy or Sunday. S I N G H. Okay, come back to that. I have uh, then Karen uh, Doran, Karen Doran, and then Audrey Kayam, and then Randy Smith. Blast from the past. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Good evening, Supervisor Natoli and fellow board members. It's great to see you. It's been a long time since I've been in this building. Um, I'm here as a board member of the American River Parkway Foundation and a resident of the city and county of Sacramento. I live in District 2. Um, and I've lived here most of my life. I was born here, left for a little while, and came back. I love this community. And that is why I serve on the board. And before I... I I'm here on behalf of the board to say that we support the ordinances, but I also want to recognize the 6,000 volunteers that we have at the foundation who do cleanups every week on the parkway. And I would also like to invite everyone here to join us for the Greater American River Cleanup, which is on September 17th. You can check our website for more information. <sighs> we are in support of this ordinance. I am support of this ordinance, but I would ask everyone here to look at the other side of the equation. We have to build more housing for the unhoused in our community, and we have to treat them with compassion and respect. And I would like all of us, including me, who live with the privilege of a home and a yard in a nice neighborhood to not have a knee-jerk reaction every time a proposal is put forth to build housing anywhere close to you to immediately say no to it. We have to start either saying yes or at least being willing to listen when these proposals are put forward. And I, have, I will commit to you, Supervisor Kennedy, that I will not be in this chamber opposing something in my neighborhood. I live in South Hunt Park, just so everyone knows. <laughs> anyway, that's why I'm here, to support the ordinance, but say it's only part of the solution, and we have to come up with compassionate ways to support our unhoused neighbors. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Good to see you. <clears throat> okay, so we have, um, is it Audrey Kayam? Audrey? And then uh, Randy Smith, and then I'll... Mr. Singh, or Mr. and Mrs. Singh, I'm not sure. Okay. 
Hi, Audrey. Hey. Good evening to the board and to everyone listening. My name is Audrey Keon. I'm an attorney in the Public Defender's Office, but I'm not speaking for my office. Uh, I'm speaking just as a resident of Sacramento. I appreciate your time. I'm here to speak out against the increased camping ordinances for Sacramento. Um, just as a resident, first of all, because I don't want my neighbors being tossed out of their homes, but second of all, to speak in a language that I think more of us in this room might understand. As a citizen, I don't want the county opening itself up for really expensive and complicated solution when it could instead be opting for a simpler and less expensive solution. We all agree that funding more housing is a need. Um, to illustrate my point, I will try to explain what might happen if we pass these laws and if homelessness in the, in the many points that have been raised is criminalized. First of all, more people will be, um, it will cost the county money. Those police officers that were shown to us in many videos that people have put up on this screen, they cost money to send out there and their salaries are public. Um, when homeless and unhoused neighbors are arrested, they will be sent to the jail, which is two blocks down from this building. That jail costs a lot of money to run, and it costs a lot of money to feed and house the people in there. We are all paying for that, so that will cost money. When they are brought to court, a district attorney will have to decide if charges will be filed against this person, or if it's a local ordinance like Fish and Game or these supposed ones. It will be a city attorney. Their salaries are public, they cost money, and their time is better spent on other things. If, um, if my office is appointed or if other criminal defense counsel is appointed, we cost money to defend those people and to try and sort out a better solution for this person. If that person takes some kind of a plea deal or is funneled into an alternative court that might be designed to help these offenses for you know, local county ordinances. Probation officers cost money. Other social workers to run that cost money. That is a lot of different agencies that will be costing the county money if these ordinances are passed. And in speaking in civil terms, uh, I know that the board is probably familiar with Boise versus Idaho. That was a case that was passed in federal court that in very general speaking terms prohibits these county ordinances when there aren't shelter beds. We all know there aren't shelter beds. There are other lawyers in this chamber that may disagree with me on the interpretation of that law or that case as it applies to this situation, but half of lawyers are any, half of any given lawyers are wrong in a situation. I think you all can guess how much money and time we can take up just for one client when we disagree on something. And there are a lot of unhoused people in the American River. I'm not homeless, I'm not unhoused, I'm not at risk of being so, so I have the luxury of speaking calmly and expressing things you know, to the board the way that I am. But I'd ask that while we are trying to find a solution to the housing crisis, these two ordinances aren't the solution. We don't have to go the hard way while we're waiting for a long-term fix to the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you for your service. Okay, <clears throat> so I have one more uh, speaker, Randy Smith, and then we have several folks on the phone still. So Randy Smith is still here. Randy. So if there's anybody I missed in the, in the uh, speaker form, just call out, but otherwise we're gonna go to the phone after Randy. So. <clears throat> Good evening. <laughs> thank you for all your patience. Um, I want to thank the board for all the work you have been doing for the years to help the homeless in so many ways that I don't think is being recognized. Certainly there's a big issue that's still before us. I'm, I just, I was going to give a presentation. I wasn't able to get together. Um, I showed some pictures to you last June, uh, the condition of our, our waterways, and that's really all I want to defend is our waterways, that we all need the drinking water and the the safe water. So I, I want to, I think I've heard, I've been listening to the meeting all the last four hours, four plus hours, and I appreciate what many people have spoken in defense of our creeks and waterways and having them protected by a new ordinance. And I, I very much support, ask you to, to go forward with that. Um, and I would um, definitely um, 
I believe, 150 feet for our uh, setback from the high water for our waterways is appropriate. 25 feet for a lot of infrastructure would be fine, but definitely want to urge all of you to, and those who are writing the ordinance to consider that, reconsider 150 feet from high water mark as a protection. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes, before, sir. Before we go to the phones, um, do you, um, we want to consider uh, letting the audience know what we might do after hearing the last speaker in terms of a break so that they can plan accordingly before we deliberate, or are we just going to push on through? Or are we going to? I, I say, what's the pleasure of the board? Do you want to, uh, again, we've got a dozen speakers or thereabouts on the phone. Is that right? So that's another, assuming folks go to the, you know, probably. So about nine speakers left. Okay, so another half hour to 45 minutes probably with the comments, depending upon what the nature of the comments are. Um, and then obviously board deliberation. So uh, we can take the testimony and then uh, take a brief break. Um, or at at least a bio break. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's what you like to do. So you want to take the, take the phone callers and then we'll take a, uh, take a break and, and, and um, 15 minutes. Enough for folks. All right. So we're going to keep going with the speakers, uh, and then we'll take a break at the conclusion of the speakers, and uh, to, and then we'll come back into into session. So, all right. Uh, was there anybody that had signed up that I didn't call or missed? And I don't think so. But uh, anybody that may have stepped out. All right. With that, uh, Dan, I already I called you. My, my, that, this... Oh, there was somebody I missed. Yes. Tommy, I called Tommy. Is he here? His car got towed. I'm sorry for that. Um, he, I just wanted to know. This is two simple things, really quick. He just wants to know if um, you got, if you guys are still going to keep your promise of getting American River Homes crew homes for them and their pets. Also, yeah. they asked yeah. me to ask Phil okay. Cerna if they're if they're if American River Homes crew is still getting the war for clean and save American River Parkway on September 1st. That's okay. the only thing he asked. Okay, asked Tommy. So Tommy asked two things about the pets yeah. and then something about an award. Okay, yeah. so noted. Okay. Yeah, the questions. I. The question is, are you guys still going to keep your word about helping that, helping micro homes to get into homes for them and their pets, more than one pet, into homes on the micro parkway that you guys promised that you guys would do? Because they all yeah. work full time jobs. They don't yeah. want the mooch off yeah. you guys. They just need assistance getting in a home. Yeah. And then the other, the other question is for Phil Cerna. Is if American Home Homes is still going to get the award? My question too, as well. It's, it's yeah, it's not an award. It's a proclamation. First. Yes. Yeah. yes, It's a proclamation, Dan. And yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dan. Oh, wait, okay. The first question. I'll answer okay. the first question. We're going to do what we can to help folks, so I'm leave it at that for right now. So before but, they, before the ordinance. I don't know what's going to happen before the ordinance. We're going to come back to the ordinance, so stay tuned this evening. So. Okay. Thank okay. You. Good. Thanks, Dan. All right, and thank you to Tommy for weighing in. Okay, with that, let's go to our phones, and uh, we'll work through those calls, and then we'll take a, uh, take a short break. Please transfer the first caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. This is Lily Duvall. I'm representing the League of Women Voters of Sacramento County. I am a board member as well as the chair of the League's Housing and Homeless Committee. We have provided a formal letter of opposition to the board specific to the two proposed ordinances. With the proposed ordinances, it appears the county is unfortunately using the language of a footnote in Martin versus Boise to again criminalize the unhoused by determining specific public locations where it might be constitutionally permissible to prohib prohibit camping. The League of Women Voters of Sacramento opposes criminalization of the unhoused as it is outlined in our social policy position. Alternatively, we strongly advocate for the provision of permanent housing or when necessary alternative shelters and supportive services to ensure that basic human needs of the unhoused can be met. 
The League opposes any further definition and criminalization of the unsheltered individuals without having alternative sanctioned shelters or housing available to those who need it. Today, the county does not have sufficient inventory available for the beds and uh, to accommodate the needs of the uninsured. 2,400 beds will not serve over 2,600 individuals. The math just doesn't add up. The League and our members share our community's concerns about the unhoused. We too are personally impacted by unsheltered individuals camping throughout the county. We too are apprehensive that the unstructured camping in public places is a danger to the public's health and welfare. We also have a value of the American River and support its protection. That said, these new ordinances will not resolve the issue but will displace individuals who will, due to necessity, find new areas to camp whenever they can. Our expedited efforts should be focused on solutions. Displacement and fines are not a solution. Housing is. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And we did, and we did receive the letter. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, Board of County Supervisors. My name is Jenna Abbott. I'm a Senior Vice President with the Sacramento Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. Most of you will recall that I was also the Executive Director of the River District and prior to that, the Executive Director at the Mac Road Partnership. I remind you of these things because I have worked with all of you in some capacity over the years to address this, thorny, this very thorny problem that is homelessness. I could again speak to you in my current capacity with the Metro Chamber, but I'm confident that you are fully aware of the Metro Chamber's position on, this, on these items. Instead, I'd like to speak to you as myself tonight. Jenna Abbott, Sacramento County resident, lover of the city of Sacramento, strong supporter of the democratic process, and your colleague and friend. In 2016, my husband and I moved into the unincorporated county of Sacramento into Phil Cerna's District 1 and the Central City because we believed the city was on the solid trajectory, and we wanted to be part of helping it to realize its potential. We took jobs downtown and enjoyed the walkability of our neighborhood and its easy access to get to our jobs without having to use a car. Sadly, in recent years, our city, which I would like to remind you is part of the county, has suffered a series of setbacks and the homeless population has burgeoned exponentially. The most important message for you to hear from me tonight is that people living outdoors in abysmal conditions are suffering. Many of them are drug addicted and violent and others suffer from mental illness. We walk among these people every day and we witness their drug use and their mania. I feel strongly that we as a county, with you as our county leaders, have an obligation to create shelter and services that will help them. Homelessness in the city and county of Sacramento has grown exponentially worse and with Sacramento County's population increasing nearly 70% in just the last three years. Thousands of people sleep on the street every day in inhumane and unsafe conditions. Businesses and communities are struggling with the impacts of these encampments and the issues associated with them including the garbage, mental health, and drug crisis, and crime. As residents, we need you, our county leaders, to do what you were elected to do and lead us. Leading means working with your city partners to pass in tandem a comprehensive policy that includes services and enforcement. Last night, the City of Sacramento voted to place a ballot initiative on the November ballot that would allow for enforcement of anti-camping laws only once shelter has been offered. They strongly stated that they need you, as the county, to partner with them by doing the same and stepping up to offer those services for which you are funded. Those services include behavioral health and outreach services. The continual fighting and finger pointing between the city and the county, please, we need it to stop. Both of you are re responsible for providing shelter and enforcing anti-camping laws, and it's critically important that the city and the county come to a binding agreement and do what's right for our region, our homeless population, our small businesses and our neighborhoods. Failing on this would be catastrophic for all of us. Over the next 30 days, you have a unique opportunity to take bold steps, creating shelter and services for those experiencing homelessness in partnership and in tandem with your peers at the city. It will require hard work. It will require setting egos aside for the greater good. And mostly it will require strong leadership and collaboration. And since I know most of you personally, I know you are up for this challenge. I urge you not to squander this opportunity and show me and the rest of our region that our faith in you is justified. Thank you for giving me a few moments to speak to you tonight. Thank you, Jenna. Next caller, please. 
Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, yes, I'm Sarah, and I grew up riding along the American River Parkway on the bike trail since I was 10. I love the parkway and have enjoyed it for over four decades. I also love and wish to advocate for my fellow human beings, especially those who are not able to afford housing in Sacramento. Those two things do not have to be in opposition, and I am very saddened by the way that the proponents of this ordinance, these ordinances have been presenting um, this issue, as well as the way they have been demonizing the poor and unhoused. Um, I'd like to just mention that Cerna spoke earlier. Um, well, he's already decided, so I, I'm not even sure if he can reflect on what I'm saying and, 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 and listen to all of the other speakers that have gone, because he seemed to already have made up his mind. But he spoke earlier about a tone that he recognized by the park representative and called it passion, but instead I'd call that anger. She mentioned the health and safety of park rangers, firefighters, and other staff, but made it clear that she's completely unaware of how much this ordinance would damage the health and safety of those currently sleeping down there. And that person also spoke in a very pro-law enforcement and pro-punishment manner, rather than in a humane way that would take into account the needs and well-being of folks that are so disadvantaged that they can't even afford housing in Sacramento. Hearing that anger and the implications of her position truly terrified me. It's an us versus them thinking a poor versus rich or want to be rich and a lack of an ability to see the whole picture and then not to mention an overweening desire to disappear social problems from sight rather than actually solve them. Sadly, I heard that same. I've been on the phone for over four hours and, and I've been watching as well. And I've heard the same tone for, and viewpoints from the residents of that retirement community who constantly use the word they in anger. I also heard the term criminal element being used, demonizing the whole of the poor and unhoused. Joyce spoke eloquently today about how she and her wife, um, who are unhoused, um, and also Sandra, uh, who lives at the river and has newly, you know, had to move down there, has worked her whole life and is newly unhoused. I, I listened to them and they, they don't seem like the, they don't seem like the they that these folks are talking about. So um, I think it's, it's not a real thing. Um, still, I empathize with those folks, but sadly, they're wrong in thinking this ordinance will do anything but move the problem elsewhere. It's NIMBY at its finest. It won't solve the problem for our county, but it will cause a whole lot of suffering all the way around and a lot of costs that could just be put into real solutions. Um, we don't want, Emily stated she didn't want to see anybody sleeping on the street. We don't want that either. Folks who advocate for, you know, our poorest members of the community, we don't want that either. But we, um, there's a, you know, there's a, a huge difference between wanting to have expediency of disappearing from our site, the problem of poverty and houselessness, you know, versus creating real solutions to this horrific problem of folks not being able to afford a place to live so that they can, um, you know, so they end up having to sleep outside. I implore the board to reject both ordinances. This is not a solution to the problem of having large numbers of people sleeping outside and unhoused here. Shelter does not equal housing. And it's some, there's some question as to whether there would even be enough sheltered beds. But using shelters as a proxy for housing will only cause harm to so many people, ones which the park representative did not seem to consider or even care about. But it will also waste a huge amount of money that could simply be used directly on act, getting access to affordable housing and services for folks who are in need. This real affordable housing is an essential part of the actual solution to people not being able to afford housing. The ordinance does nothing to provide that. Um, instead, it will just disappear those folks, at least temporarily. And they're people, I guess, who most people in Sacramento, or a lot of them at least I heard speak tonight, just don't want to see and hear. And um, it's that human suffering is not to be uh, underestimated. We've seen videos of that, but it also will criminalize the poor unhoused folks, uh, which is totally inhumane, and particularly considering the horrific and extremely well-known conditions of that, that folks incarcerated in Sacramento County jails are subjected to and that the sheriff has been sued numerous times um, over and lost. We don't, have to, we don't have to go, as the attorney said, we don't have to go the hard, though seemingly faster way uh, and spend so much money that won't solve the problem and that could instead be used... I need, I need to ask to you to conclude, ma'am. You're just about a minute okay. and a half. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, I say take the money, take whatever money we would waste over moving these people around and causing them horrible suffering um, and all of the other things associated with that. And instead, we need to uh, provide housing and uh, 
and um, provide them with services, real, make real change so that, you know, and all of this other stuff that people have mentioned about, you know, kids being homeless, kids in schools having to live down by the river. Like, can you, can you please put them in your, in your conscience and mind when you vote tonight? Think about those kids. These are not these demons and all these people talking about the American River Parkway and how much they love it. Well, I, I love it. I, I love it, too. But I don't love yeah. it more than I would love for a child to be able to sleep in an actual okay. home at night. So that's all I've got to say. Okay, Thanks thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for your patience. Thank you for your comments. Thank, okay. okay. Thank you for your work. Bye. Okay. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Uh, please mute the meeting in the background and then start with your comments. You have three minutes. Yeah, PJ, he, him. Uh, much of the sympathy I've heard on behalf of the unhoused never comes with the requirement that housing be provided, never comes with a strong language surrounding services being provided. Just brief mention to humanize their dehumanization of their fellow human beings. The reason people are becoming homeless here at a higher rate isn't because we're more lenient on them. It is because our housing costs are flying up and our housing supply is drastically lower than it needs to be. And no, Richard and Philip, homeless folk don't affect water quality. It was found after updated science reported on by the SACB that neither of the areas of complaint were affected by homeless people due to E. coli. It was all local wildlife. Sorry, I believe the science, something you asked to do when it came to COVID and what I asked you to do when it comes to the unhoused. You want enforcement, but what did they do wrong? You claim theft and property damage. I call that doing what they need to in order to survive in a society that's thrown them away. You claim they block the sidewalk, yet our cities are designed for cars, and often some of the areas complained about are rarely even used by pedestrians. You claim drug use. I call that coping with personal trauma as well as the trauma of being seen as disposable in society. You claim service resistance. I call that seeing a government that half-asses attempts at helping them and then puts the blame at their feet when it fails. You claim they are scary and yell. I call that having no support system and being unable to access mental health care sufficiently and consistently so as to manage psychosis and other issues. At the end of the day, what concern do they have for your rules if you don't care enough to help them and they need to survive? As far as the infrastructure portion, there is no definition of what is required as far as outreach. This is necessary. In the past, outreach has come in the form of offering services or housing that had a wait list associated with them and was not an actual tangible resource. This needs to be explicitly called out. All that it currently does is states that at a later date it will be determined how to prioritize encampments, but not what is required of adequate and comprehensive outreach. This also needs to be documented. I don't see a documentation requirement to ensure that there is evidence that resources have actually been offered and that those resources have been sufficient to ensure that people have someplace to go if they move. You keep putting the onus on the unhoused when it is the city and county that fall down when their services get tested. You don't fund services to the necessary extent, thinking of the 500 person wait list for addiction treatment currently, some of who have been on there for over a year. You don't fund them consistently. You don't stand up housing and services concurrently to ensure people can get better in a safe environment. I also would hope the staff would come back with the different levels of what infrastructure entails. I don't trust that the county won't try and do something similar as to what happened in LA, where huge swaths were written off as infrastructure and the next thing you know, 20% of the city was off limits. I'm sorry, but 20% of that city is not vital infrastructure. 20% of this county is not vital infrastructure that needs protection. 10% isn't, 5% isn't. And 5% is actually 49 square miles. And it needs to be clearly deline delineated the reasons why anything is designated as infrastructure and is necessary to protect from the people it purportedly serves. Additionally, the enforcement is unnecessary. If the shelter spaces were there, then the people would go to them, but they must be there and the services must be there and they must be funded to the degree necessary to ensure consistency and engender trust. All enforcement will do is result in further distrust of the government and more service resistance when it comes to trusting that any of you have their best interests in mind. They know that you don't, they don't trust you. I don't trust you, especially Kennedy. The fact that you would ride the line when it comes to cruel and unusual punishment shows me your moral character is lacking. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. My name is Carissa Boudwin. I am a homeowner in Fair Oaks and I live walking distance to the Sacramento Bar River Access. I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old kid. Um, I used to take them on walks to the river at the Sacramento Bar Access and walk along the trails to Bannister Park about four times a week. But last fall, I started feeling like it wasn't safe for me to be on the trail without being with someone else. 
That is so sad that it doesn't feel safe anymore. All the moms see it. There are people living and doing drugs on the river trails and in the bushes. It wasn't long after that that Emma Rourke, a 20-year-old woman, went missing um, during her afternoon walk on the river. She was found strangled in a homeless encampment tent. The stock sheriff then visited the encampments in that area of the river to make sure all the sex offenders and people on parole were in compliance. The sheriff put out press releases about this. It's absolutely shocking. A question that I do have is when will the county post and notify the public to take caution on the parkway from fires, needles, toxic trash, and high criminal activity and to avoid the encampment? After seeing the photos today of just how dangerous and critical the situation is, the public should be notified of the risk. This is where moms take their babies and strollers and children to ride bikes and throw rocks in the river and to explore in the wilderness, and they, may, they might not know what the risks are. Outside of the thousands of pounds of trash and needles and what the State Water Contro Resource Control Board has reported with the high fecal indicator bacteria from the human poop washing into the river, it seems that it's hard to accept that it, we now have to accept that out of control drug addicts can live on riverfront property where our children can no longer safely play. Since when is drug use allowed in city and state and county parks? I, a tax paying citizen and a Sacramento native and mom who has chosen to raise my kids in Sacramento refuse to accept that we will just hand over the American river to dangerous people who are burning, destroying and disrespecting it. We have all of these, we've heard all of these societal, societal commitments to the homeless about trying to find them housing and give them all of these resources, but where is the commitment from the homeless to do better and to participate respectfully in society? Allowing the drug abuse and violence abuse to continue is a danger to the general public, and it's not fair to the homeless either, who have, whose lives are being lost on the street. When will the county or city be legally liable for allowing the, car, the parks to become dangerous to the public health and with constant fires and illegal drug use? We have laws and it really is time to enforce them. Illegal camping and fires and dumping and littering and drug use laws need to be fiercely enforced along the parkway. Not enforcing laws has allowed drug addiction to go unchecked and now it's all over Sacramento. Everyone sees it every time we leave the house. It's imperative to make every effort possible to keep the American River Parkway a clean, safe jewel of Sacramento for all to respectfully enjoy. It's shameful that the parkway has not been properly protected to this point. Please pass the resolution to protect the parkway and the public from the dangers of homeless encampments, and please make the distance 150 feet from the high water mark. And lastly, I would like to sincerely thank all of the volunteers and nonprofit organizations who educated me today and who are doing so much to protect the parkway from unnecessary abuse. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please mute the meeting in the background and please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Before I start my comment, I uh, just want to name that uh, I'm here to speak to items two and three, which I understand would, uh, were combined, and therefore I should have six minutes. Is that correct? Is that correct? <clears throat> Keon, we're not going, well, I've been pretty liberal with the time, so try to get it within your, within the three minutes, but uh, again, I wouldn't take it to the six minutes, a couple of halves. So anyway, go ahead. You run a fair meeting, so I will trust that you uh, give me the time I need for both items. So a couple of facts to clear up for the middle class residents who pay all their taxes in the room and on the phone today. Every single person, unhoused and housed, pay their share in taxes every time they buy anything from a grocery store, gas station, or any business located in the contiguous United States. It's called a sales tax. Second, poverty and homelessness is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. It is a 100% a policy choice, political, economic, and social. Three years of COVID and six rounds of stimulus funding lifting more than 50% of U.S. children and other households out of poverty prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. Three, people who aren't trying to stigmatize the poor people don't, don't feel the need to say so. They certainly don't use pictures and videos of mountains of trash and point to blame all illegal dumping on the unhoused as if local businesses, housed residents, and passing motorists aren't illegally dumping their mattresses, futon frames, and other undesirables along the roadways and hiking trails within 100 feet or more of the parkway. 
Four, on any given night, there are no less than 9,200 unhoused people on the street. The county only has 1,300 shelter beds to offer unhoused people, all of them occupied on every single night. So what exactly will these ordinances and measures act like do offer these folks to help them lead the parkway? Last I checked, Sacramento shelter and housing resources aren't exactly overflowing. So given that reality, what resources is the county committing to creating to support this? How much time will the county give folks to meaningfully engage with services? Will you direct staff to identify vacant county buildings that can be repurposed? Will you be dedicating new dollars to rental subsidies or providing affordable permanent housing? If the answer is no, then the, these measures have nothing to do with helping unhoused people or about public safety. This is about elected officials defending the quality of life for a handful of wealthy businesses and white property owners who put money in the pockets in your pockets for your next campaign. How do I know that? Because not one of these proposals the city or county has offered mentioned anything about funding the one resource that study after study has shown is needed to actually solve, not just make better, the crisis of homelessness, permanent affordable housing. This is bigger than just following federal court decisions like Martin B. Boise. This is about doing what, about what is the right thing to do for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people living among us, many of whom the, uh, through the people in this chamber and approving these measures clearly don't care anything about. It. I know for a fact Sacramento's economic and political establishments don't give a damn about poor people living in this city because poor people are not now nor have they ever been the beneficiaries of the U.S. system built through land theft, slavery, and genocide on the basis of property rights. They have no legal obligation to protect or consider our human rights or well-being. It's all about money for them. But what's the excuse for many of you in the chambers advocating for these anti-homeless measures? I know from your words and actions that you don't give a damn about your fellow property owners throughout the county, much less the local environments you're disingenuously defending using co-opted talking points. How do I know that? Because all these proposals do is allow for police and code enforcement to forcibly move thousands of unhoused people from your backyard into someone else's backyard, some other parkway, or a jail cell where you won't have to ever look at them and remember they exist. That is the textbook definition of not in my backyard. And you earn that title through your words and actions every time you open your mouth this, uh, this evening. Nothing in these proposals are new or imaginative. It's the same violent policies and tactics local governments have been implementing for over 20 years with nothing meaningful to show for it. While I certainly empathize with frustrations in how city and county have wasted hundreds of millions of dollars of our taxpayer dollars to do everything except address the root problem of this crisis, I do not sympathize with a single one of you in this chamber who are putting your own feelings, your own subjective sense of comfort above the basic needs and well-being of your fellow human beings with nowhere else to go. Actions speak louder than words. You shouldn't be approving these ordinances. The city shouldn't be approving this, that ridiculous ballot measure, but it, you're going to do it anyway because at the end of the day, in the United States of America, money trumps people, period. It's all about money for y'all. So you're going to make your decisions. You already made your decisions, most likely. And I'm not like, and it's not worthy of my respect. Don't threaten me when I vote, like when I don't respect your rules of decorum. They don't mean anything when you're constantly shifting the goalposts and only speaking to the people who have the most access, the most advantage, and the most money to give to you at the end of the day. I would ask you to do better, but I honestly don't have any like any faith that you will. Take care. <clears throat> Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Next Let's caller. Go. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hello. My, thank you for your patience. My name is Willa Limbach, and I'm a second year medical student at UC Davis School of Medicine. And I'm speaking to you this evening as a Sacramento resident. I strongly oppose this ordinance to further criminalize unhoused people living along the American River and allow for more sweeps into the area. It's cruel, callous, and will not solve any of these problems. I work at a free clinic where I regularly interact with Sacramento's unhoused folks. Let me tell you about an unhoused gentleman I recently talk to. I'll call him Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith is a disabled Vietnam veteran living outside in a tent along the river. He also has severe diabetes and needs insulin to survive, a medication that must be refrigerated. A nearby small business owner used to let Mr. Smith use his 
his refrigerator for his medications, but then Mr. Smith's camp was swept and he had to move. Mr. Smith uses a wheelchair to get around, so when the camp was swept, he couldn't move his belongings. Can you imagine being ordered to vacate your home with less than 24 hours notice? Now imagine that you're a senior citizen who uses a wheelchair and it's over 100 degrees out. Mr. Smith couldn't use, move his belongings, so they were thrown away by the state. He lost his bedding, food, shelter, and a place to store his insulin. Mr. Smith couldn't take his medications anymore and ended up in a severe diabetic crisis. He was hospitalized for, seven, for several days, which cost California taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. This money would have been enough to house Mr. Smith for decades. I urge you to remember that we're talking about human beings. Not only is it cruel and heartless to sweep them from their homes when there's nowhere else for them to go, but it's also a huge waste of taxpayer money. I urge the lawmakers to look for solutions to the hum humanitarian crisis that is homelessness by focusing on permanent housing, long-term shelters, and resources. Once you have enough housing for every single person in Sacramento, then you can start making camping illegal. Homeless people will not disappear if we criminalize their existence. I strongly oppose this ordinance and urge you to focus your efforts on solutions that will actually help people. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. If you could mute the meeting in the background and then start with your comments. I'll mute. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Yes, my name is Yolanda Delgado, and I just wanted to thank you for this forum that we get to speak our mind and let you know what uh, the citizens of Sacramento. I live in North, uh, North Island, and the homeless situation has got to be addressed. It is just out of control, and the waterways do need to be protected. I have told people many and many and many a time, we're all the same. Once you get up first thing in the morning, the first thing you have to do is empty your bladder. Where are they going to the bathroom? Where? Along the riverways, they have to go, and then it trickles down into the river. I do feel bad for the homeless. I do, I do. But something has got to be done. What can I do and my family and friends do to help you help us out here in the county in the city. I just, I, I, I'm frustrated. I'm saddened by how things are going. It just, I don't want my grandchildren and my great grandchildren to, this is not normal. Homeless people on sidewalks is not normal. I didn't grow up with it. And things need to be addressed. People need to be helped. I don't know what the solution is, but if you could tell me, what I can help with, I would be grateful to do it. Thank That's all I have to say. Thank you, Alana. You're very welcome. Thank you. Next, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for being so patient and listening to everyone. And I just want to say that we do need to continue to do right for our unhoused neighbors and have enough housing for all. No one should have to sleep outside. No one should have to live without basic things like walls and plumbing and safety. I'm here to advocate for a solution to help people. I think we can do more than one thing at a time, though, and the two sides really do need to come together. I'm here to advocate primarily for our water waterways, including our creeks, sloughs, and rivers. Many of our creeks and sloughs pass through underserved neighborhoods in our community. Morrison Creek, Strawberry Creek, Arcade Creek, to name a few. 
All of our waterways should be considered critical infrastructure, in my opinion. They all flow into either the American or the Sacramento River. As such, these places, particularly those that flow into the American River Parkway, are part of the parkway. Additionally, 25 feet um, from the high water mark is not going to make a difference, in my opinion. 25 feet is not going to keep the trash and pollutants out of our waterways. And I've seen this firsthand through doing cleanups of abandoned encampments. We don't have housing for all of the people who are living outside. And so in the meantime, I'm asking for you to mitigate the impact of humans living in places that are not set up for humans to live. What can our county do to provide clean water, toilets, garbage service, and cleanup areas for folks that are leaving stuff behind in the environment? Protection of our wild areas from fire, not to mention support and services for mental health and the health and safety of pets. 150 feet from the high water mark, I think, is what we need to have to protect our waterways. When I was a child growing up in Sunnyvale, we had a creek that ran through part of our neighborhood. Many of us children would ride our bikes there and spend hours looking at the flora and the fauna, the reptiles, the amphibians, the fish, birds, and plants that lined the creek. The last time I tried to visit that creek, I encountered a concrete barrier and cyclone fencing and was only able to peek at the creek through a small opening in the wall. The creek looked very forlorn and forgotten. I doubt any of the children in that area have any idea it is even there. When I moved to Sacramento in 1979, I was taken with the old architecture, the rivers, the beaches, the creeks and the sloughs. I enjoyed spending time picking berries, looking at plants, trees, the animals that get life from the water. 35 or more years ago, when my son was about four years old, I would take him to the creeks and the rivers, particularly Steelhead Creek, and I shared with him the enjoyment of just looking and experiencing a waterway meandering through a neighborhood, a waterway teeming with animals and plant life, and to just see the water moving through unimpeded by much trash or litter. This past year, I participated in many creek and river cleanups. I am saddened that these creeks, such as Steelhead, are not a place that I would take a child for a leisurely day looking at nature and fishing, crawdadding. These places are filled with plastics, textiles, shopping carts, needles, batteries, and are not places of peace and quiet contemplation. They are creeks with solid waste channels running through them. The ordinances that you're proposing may be stopgap measures, may help protect what we have now somewhat. I'm gonna ask you to go further and clean and restore what we have and make these places accessible once again to the wanderings of the children and their families who, vibe, who live adjacent to them. Our Cape Creek goes through a very underserved neighborhood, Strawberry Creek and Morrison too. Why are there no resources to clean and make these places as healthy as they can be? At the very least, they go into our rivers, which produce 80% of the drinking water for our region. Why do we have no means of keeping them ecologically healthy waterways? A society that does not preserve its natural environment and waterways is pretty much doomed. Thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Have a good evening. Thank you, caller, for your patience as well. Thank you. Okay. okay. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. I understand and support the need to protect critical infrastructure and natural resources, as well as the people living in the communities that testified earlier. I want to voice my opposition to the proposed ordinances outlined in agenda items number two and three. Without first meaningfully prioritizing and investing in low and no income housing in the county, these proposed ordinances are going to further criminalize homelessness and poverty without addressing the root problem. I find some of the framing around discussions like these about concer as concerns for the health and safety of unhoused folks to be disingenuous when they are not accompanied by a serious and substantial plan and funding for social services and affordable housing in the county. 
I respectfully ask the board to vote down these measures and instead invest your time, energy, and county resources to seriously consider divesting from programs and policies that perpetuate a cycle of criminalization and poverty and instead invest in housing and social services and support that will actually help unhoused folks and actually address the systemic underlying issues that create and perpetuate <clears throat> the conditions that these ordinances purport to address. What makes sense from a fiscal and public policy standpoint is to address the root causes of problems. In this case, it's the lack of affordable housing and social services instead of the symptoms. Folks living in areas that threaten critical infrastructure and natural resources because they have nowhere else to go. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, I'm a resident of District 6 as well as a business owner, and I'm calling to oppose both of these ordinances. These policies will lead to death and preventable harm. Every time you move someone in a sweep, you disconnect them from everything, community, support, health care, safety, love, and more. Displacing unhoused individuals through sweeps will separate them from services being provided by the county homeless encampment teams and other grassroots organizations. Sacramento County has not made any real and critical investment in public housing or access to vital programs like mental health and substance abuse services, food access, workforce development and education, or anything else that addresses the extreme inequalities perpetuated by status quo policy and budget priorities it has made and continues to make. Over 70% of our general fund already goes into cops, courts, and cages, and it looks like the upcoming 22 budget is going to be the same. 40% of people living outside in Sacramento are people of color. The war on the poor has been the most aggressively directed at people of color. This was created extreme racial disparities in the homeless population. Structure inequalities like income disparity, unemployment, and underemployment, cuts to safety net programs, unequal school systems, criminalization, and predatory lending create the conditions for mass homelessness in poor communities of color. This is also, they both were also, a violation of Martin versus Boise, a decision based on the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. Making people move nowhere to go is a violation of the Eighth, Amend Eighth Amendment. Sacramento County does not have enough shelter beds to justify being able to move people, thousands of people. Sacramento County doesn't have the adequate shelter that's defined by Warren v. Chico, that state shelters must be brick and mortar. Your pallets, your safe cities do not, do not fit that definition, do not fit current existing legal precedents. The county does not have the space to store thousands of people's belongings pursuant to a sweep. Um, which would violate Lair versus the County of Sacramento. You guys have already been found guilty of that. Um, so what are the effects of these sweeps or what you guys like to call them abatements? Mass incarceration, destruction of property, sleep deprivation, pushes people to less, less safe spaces, harm to physical and mental health, um, and just, just so many barriers. Um, how much of our public dollars will be going to this criminalization ordinance instead of being spent on building social and public housing? We demand an investment in building actual housing, not more ways to criminalize poverty and survival. Again, I am urging all the council members to vote no on this, on, on, on both of these. You, you will be killing people. You'll be killing your constituents. I mean, you guys have already been doing it. You've already do violent sweeps. Patrick Kenny, they've already showed you a sweep that you did at Stockton Boulevard, and yet here you are again bringing even more ordinances that are going to be causing more and more harm. How many lawsuits? How many broken arms? How many people getting into these situations and medical situations and traumatic situations and, and literally dying? because of this abatement, because you guys are continuously continuing to criminalize and, and put all these punitive measures and put millions and millions into your hot team and millions and millions um, into to, to everything but services and housing. 
um, please, please vote no, and please don't ever bring this to your community again. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, caller. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, thank you. My name is Bernie. I'm a resident of Southland Park, and I'm calling to strongly oppose the two ordinances outlined in the agenda. I'm really disappointed in the way that ordinances have been proposed and kind of framed, putting environmental concerns against housing advocates. I think the issue here is the order of operations, as many people have said before me. Enacting ordinances without support for actual resources and services is a waste of time and money that has been framed as a solution, when really it's just moving the problem and putting the debt for that problem in the future. <clears throat> and I think it's kind of just to appease folks, right? We've, we've put a really <clears throat> nice image out of these clean parks, which of course I'm um, all about uh, taking care of our parkways, but uh, the ordinances proposed are gonna result in a loss of community resources and what I think is really critical trust that's needed to work with the unhoused folks to get them the services that will actually lead to long-term solutions. Um, I just think that you guys really, I hope that you guys really consider the fact that the folks who came, um, those being impacted, the unhoused folks who came spoke, um, and give them the weight that's appropriate for a situation like this, because myself included, a bunch of folks calling in um, from our home or you know, returning home after the meeting, after speaking, uh, has a different weight than those who are actually gonna be impacted by this. And I think that uh, it's up to all of us um, as a whole and as a community, but not as an individual, to be able to find the solutions that uh, make living uh, and existing something that is possible and not something that is criminalized. Um, I'm, I'm deeply upset by this, and I hope that you guys really consider those folks that are most deeply impacted with this as you make your decision. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller, please. <clears throat> Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. I thought she was still talking. Thank you. you please mute the meeting in the background and then start with your comments. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Gannon. Um, I could feel like all of you could the pain of so many of these speakers. And I'm also saddened by the attacks on both sides, um, assuming we think what, you know, we know what the other people think. I want to come at this from uh, Physics 101. <laughs> Uh, teaches us that matter takes up space. It, it's, people have to be somewhere, and they're going to be somewhere. So instead of sweeping them away, or really just sweeping them along, let's gather them up, as you do for things, and I hope people, with value. Actually take them to somewhere prepared for them with careful thought a place befitting human beings and transport their possessions also. So it'll be a place they want to stay until more permanent shelter can be arranged. And if that piece isn't actually ready first, passing this ordinance is problematic. As much urgency needs to be put into this other side of the coin. Otherwise, besides being cruel, it's nonsensical, like sweeping into the wind. Thank you. Thank you, Carr. Thank you, Karen. Next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kelly Cohen. Um, I've been enjoying the American River Parkway since the day I moved to Sacramento County 20 years ago for a promotion. Because as a wildlife biologist retired, I was accustomed to living in rural areas 
I sight unseen made an offer on the house where I live today because it backed up to a nature area, the American River Parkway. And I have paddled, cycled, hiked, and volunteered in the parkway and I'm very grateful for its, uh, its existence and it is very important to me. Um, the American River Parkway was created over 50 years ago for the enjoyment of the public in perpetuity and is paid for from our incomes. Parks improve the health uh, physically and mentally, add to the quality of life, provide opportunities for children to learn nature appreciation. It's a public resource that needs to be returned to its intended use and bold steps taken to find appropriate space and housing for people who are homeless. The American River and Deer Creek Parkways and their associated tributaries, despite what other jurisdictions do with regard to parks, these ecological areas need to be designated, in my opinion, as critical infrastructure, if that's what it'll take to get any teeth into enforcement. Designation of a minimum of 150 foot buffer is needed. So I'd like to know how you would enforce it. Um, these waterways are critical infrastructure because of their ecological value and their vulnerability to impacts um, and to the value that they uh, give to our lives. They uh, provide for drinking water, for salmon, um, things like that. Um, I do care about the plight of others, but since when, and this is gonna sound cold, but since when am I responsible and have to sacrifice my beloved parkway and the health of connected waterways to get degradation or destruction by others, homeless or not. I'm not, I'm not responsible. The county and state are responsible for solving social problems and need to make it a number one priority. If that means sequestering all of the parties that make the decisions, then that's what needs to happen. Um, laws, and, I can't talk with my mouth is dry. Laws and ordinance are meant to be adhered to. The county should not be using the parkway as a stopgap to investing in true infrastructure by not enforcing the long held no camping ordinance. Note, the parkway should never be part of a designated safe space as it violates the parkway plan and isn't a reasonable or sound use. With a portion of AB 140's 7.7 .7 million and other funding sources, several large physical facilities could be built in stages to provide a breadth of services and separate housing wings, from temporary intake to permanent housing for homeless veterans, the mentally ill, and those homeless primarily due to drug use. Bold steps are needed or else the parkway and waterways and homeless problems will continue to recycle themselves over and over again. Recall, it was an unsolved problem before the Boise decision. Hotels can be purchased to provide temporary or permanent housing, including as emergency housing for those finding themselves homeless from rent raises and job losses and providing assistance for them getting back on their feet. I agree with the gentleman who said help for the drug addicted homeless should be involuntary because while on drugs, they do not have the cognitive ability to make that decision. I think this also applies to the mentally ill homeless, where it is actually cruel to have just abandoned them. Developing campuses with designated buildings for permanent housing and services geared to helping the mentally ill would be a kindness. As the number of fires accumulates, so do, this is a kind of shifting here. Yeah, I, I um, need, so you need to kind of conclude your comments, please. If you conclude your comments. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, then I will uh, compact this to saying that fires, even though we know that they impact wildlife, that we should be picturing acorn woodpeckers, granaries and their net cavity nests burning up and western pond turtles who um, burrow and lay their eggs up upland, that getting burned over and destroyed, that a lot happens with the fires and so there's, I know you're aware of the problem, but it's very big, especially on an additive level. Um, basically, that's all I can say. I support these 
um, ordinances, but think enforcement is important. And as I said, that AB 140 needs to be looked at um, and maybe used in a, a way to build actually true firm infrastructure. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate all your time. I've been listening since 2 p.m. Great. So thank, thank you. Thank I you for staying with us. I had a long day, too. Yeah, thank okay, you for staying bye. with us. Thank you for your comments. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Supervisors and the community that's listening. My name is Crystal Sanchez, and I wear many hats in this community, but today I come as the president of the Sacramento Homeless Union, and we legally represent 2,800-plus unhoused folks here in Sacramento. We oppose both ordinances here in, its, in their entirety. I can't emphasize this enough. Homelessness is impacting all of us. This is a public health crisis and it must be deemed one immediately. We have asked for this repeatedly. It is impacting everyone from businesses to neighborhoods to those dying on the streets. The fact is there is no adequate housing. We lack over 75,000 units of affordable housing per the federal HUD guidelines. The services and housing are barely existent. It is literally taking people years to access these services and housing and shelter. And they are put on extensive wait lists. They are being recycled out of shelters and to congregate shelters and then out again on the streets. I am emphasizing too that this will disempower the newly created homeless encampment teams by moving people in circles, separating them from what services are available. This ordinance does not in any way address th these needs. In fact, it pushes the envelope for you to be sued for violations of multiple lawsuits. Let's talk about those for a minute. By no means am I a legal professional. In fact, I'm majoring in criminal justice and have worked in the medical field for 18 years. The obvious is that the ordinances at the foremost will violate human rights to basic needs of food, shelter, water, and the right to have possessions. It pushes the violations of Martin versus Boise that states no municipality may criminalize an unhoused individual for the act of survival when no adequate shelter is available. In current situations, including safe grounds, pallet homes, and tent, tents and congregate shelters, truly push the envelope, as in Warren versus Chico, where Judge England states that shelter must be made of brick and mortar. This does not include more recent lawsuits that have been won by the union and others to protect the rights of unhoused communities. Now let's talk about the ordinance if it passes and you elect to sweep and remove thousands of people, including seniors, disabled children, families, and everyday people stealing their shelter and their survival needs. Is the county capable of storing all of their survival gear as dictated in the lawsuit Lear versus the County of Sacramento? Here's a more common understanding though, that all of us normies can hear. If we remove something, um, if we remove people, where do they go? We all have identified that generally during sweeps, it recycles people a few blocks over in front of businesses, in front of residents, and in neighborhoods where community members continue to call and complain, in which they are swept again. Again, I'm going to repeat this question. Where do they go? We have thousands of testimonies of violence of sweeps. We have documentation of multiple deaths and vic victimizations within two days of your sweeps. Criminalizing the unhoused for survival is creating huge barriers in actually housing and resourcing people, as we learned in the 100-day challenge, which the county was part of. We couldn't house anyone with all major players involved, including FHRA, the county, the city, behavioral health, and everybody else. Um, the lawsuits will take away from solutions to both the environment and to the unhoused. Um, but I do want to put a uh, note that we will stand up for the rights of the unhoused community and the community as a whole. This isn't about pitting social justice fights against each other. It's about all of us. And again, democracy includes all voices. Unhoused voices were not included in these listening sessions, but advocates were. And as much as I love being an advocate, that is not impacting me directly. It's impacting those who are unhoused. We ask that you do not pass these ordinances and that we all come to the table and create a solution that benefits all of us. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Um, please mute the meeting in the background and go ahead and start with your comments. You have three minutes. 
Yes, hi, my name is Jim, 60 year resident of Sacramento. When you hear, I do care about the homeless, but the but is where the dehumanization begins, where their justification of harm starts. Every single person who commented today was commenting on your failures to properly fund parkway cleanup. Every single person was commenting on your failure to fund health services. Every single person was commenting on your failure to provide housing. And you heard that. I heard their delineation of your failure and thought, I know, I'll criminalize the poor. That's some next level deflection. People live in the parkway because they've been forced there through NIMBYs and harassment by cops. They didn't go there because it's fun. They went there because it reduced harassment and that will be increased if they are forced back into neighborhoods. I'd like to hear how much of the trash picked up by the Sacramento Picks It Up was directly caused by unhoused folks. Do you know for sure? No, you don't, but you're insinuating that they are to blame for all of it. Is the goal of this item to push people from parkways back into the neighborhoods because given the minute footprint that they actually have in reality on the parkway compared to the total overall acreage of the parkway, it seems as though you're attempting to swat a gnat on the back of a horse. Sure, there are areas that are messy and trash ridden. Some of this is because people just existing create trash. Some of this is because illegal dumpers target encampments because they know they can dump and they won't be blamed. But a whole heap and lot of this is because you aren't providing trash services to people that require trash services. After a month or two of just me and my place creating trash, I would have a decent sized pile several feet tall. Yet you expect them to magically make their trash disappear when their main focus is surviving from day to day. If you are pushing them into the neighborhoods, are you working with the adjoining communities to ensure that they have adequate resources to be able to house and service these new unhoused communities that will be entering their communities of the house? Is the goal more harm to unhoused communities? Because that is what you have a plan to do by attempting to expand the definition of infrastructure in order to fit a niche allowed by the Boise decision and continue being cruelty for cruelty's sake. I take that back. It's actually due to your own incompetence and utter mishandling of this crisis for as long as you've been in office. At every turn, you listen to business leaders concerned about profit, homeowners concerned about their home values, nonprofit corporations that stand to lose millions if homelessness is solved. All of these are immoral concerns that place above the very survival of other residents of our community. Yet you keep going back to the same quote unquote leaders, the same quote unquote stakeholders. And when you hear the same solutions, you keep doing them, despite them having not worked before. Maybe if we punish them more, you say, as though that will make them trust you. If I asked you if it is okay to flatten a junior high serving 200 students who are still inside the structure because businesses would make some money, you'd likely say no, but do the same thing over the course of the year with the same justification, and it's okay as long as they're unhoused because you value one life over another. You've been trained to, and you've been following your training very well. You justify it because you can demonize them and assert choices they must have made that make this just and deserved. It's the only way you can live with yourselves, but you're wrong. Each of their stories is different, each trauma is different, and no stereotype fits them, much as they don't fit yourself. So listen to them when they tell you what they need to succeed. Business owners don't know. Homeowners don't know. Nonprofit corporations don't know. They do. And the longer it takes you to understand this, the more harm you do to them and the house community, wasting money, harming their safety, increasing their distrust, and being inhumane and immoral. This is the exact opposite of environmental justice. And Phil, just because Assemblymember McCarty has promised to help you get Doris Matsui's position when she retires, doesn't mean you need to do his bidding. Thank you. Next caller. Thank you, caller. <clears throat> we have about five uh, callers. Okay. The calls are still okay. rolling in. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hello, I'm calling in to speak on items two and three. I am a Sacramento resident and I oppose these ordinances because they fail to address the root causes of homelessness. Rather, their purpose is to hide the symptoms of the problem in order to appease the more reactionary residents of the city, including the so-called environmental activists who are more concerned about shallow aesthetics and virtue signaling than bringing forth the changes that would actually improve humankind's relationship with the natural world and to each other. These ordinances just kick the can further down the street. People who are unhoused need housing and services. Providing permanent affordable housing for all is what we need to be doing, not continually pushing vulnerable people around from place to place. That is cruel and morally wrong. Please send the next caller. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, caller. Please 
please, on the next caller. Hi, caller. You have three minutes. Please start with your comment. Thank you. My name is Frank Wheeler. I'm a board member on the Carmichael Colony Neighborhood Association, and I'm representing my own feelings relative to the homeless issue. And I'm first of all, I'd like to say I'm in support of the ordinances as they are with 150 foot space from the high water line as Fish and Games 5652 has indicated is already law. My feelings are we need to clean up the waterways and move the problems that are occurring that can't be changed easily and then work on the homeless part of it. The homeless part is priority for the children and then work our way up through. But if we don't get the, the neighborhood cleanup done around the waterways, fire suppression, activities that are not conducive to families occurring. FEA Nature Center had a homeless individual come in here recently while they were teaching a bunch of children and they had to lock the nature center down because of the homeless situation. We had a fire in Carmichael at the base or the base of the bluffs at Ansel Hoffman Park that threatened all the houses nearby. And again, that was relative to homeless. I'm on a walk right now. <laughs> Just walked by the entrance to beautiful Ansel Hoffman Park. We have a homeless encampment right in the front in the, the main rock faced gates. One side of the gate is covered with a homeless encampment. These are public right of ways, but I think preservation of the waterways are most important. Secondarily, safety is priority. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Frank. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hello? Hi. Yeah, hi. Can you start with your comments? You have three minutes. Go ahead. Are you there? Hi, I just wanted to let Patrick Kennedy know that he's a rat bastard for bringing this on. Phil Cerna, fuck you in those three pages of services that ain't helping nobody. And Sue Frost, we, you know, fuck you since you were serving fucking crackers and Proud Boys. Fuck all y'all. All right, next caller. Caller. Hmm. That's not nice. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. I just want to know, I know that the homeless problem is a problem, but this is really about saving uh, the city, well, really the county infrastructure here. And I just wanted to say, people keep saying we need to provide housing for the homeless. Well, you know, any responsibility they should take for anything. And I also know that the whole concept of um, Mini houses, small, tiny homes is popular. So basically, that's saying build everybody a studio apartment, in essence. Well, you know, the county could build some dormitories, put it on some area of land that isn't going to get in the middle of existing housing. Because these people, yes, they're human beings. But we already learned that between 66 and 90 percent of them are drug addicts. And believe me, you cannot reason with the person when they're in certain states of mind. So the idea that we can't solve this, yes, we can. Dormitories worked in the past, and let's do that. Now, I have one other comment about the Sacramento Homeless Union, which just won a kind of injunction against the city so, so that they couldn't move people. Now, 
they filed it in federal court, and they won. But I have to tell you, Sacramento Homeless Union doesn't show up on the California Secretary of State as a corporation, neither does their parent company, and they're also not listed as a business entity even in the city of Sacramento. So how is it, and I'm not a lawyer, how is it that an entity that doesn't seem to have a legal existence is able to sue and win in federal court? So I don't know the answer, but I hope someone will look into this because if something that isn't a legal entity can sue, then hey, let's get Mickey Mouse and everybody else filing lawsuits. Um, it's just kind of crazy, and maybe certainly it's possible I overlooked something. But I think if you're not a legal person, there should be some issue about you being able to file a lawsuit. And I wish you the best, and I hope you will pass these ordinances because we need to protect Sacramento County. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Thank you, caller. Okay, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, all. Um, I'm calling today, and I just first want to mention that, like, as a young working class person, uh, sitting on the phone for (laughs) what is, like, almost six hours is really not possible for most people. And it is quite a privilege to even be able to be here and wait this long just to be able to give a three-minute comment. And that's that needs to change. Honestly, if you want working uh, people's input on any of this stuff, you're going to have to make these more accessible to much, much more people if you want a genuine sense of democratic participation in this, right? First of all, that's the first point, right? Um, But I just want to speak to the fact that this proposal is going to worsen homelessness in Sacramento because it does nothing to address the multiple crises of the unhoused, right? Um, I think we all agree that there is a crisis. And we have very different analyses of why that crisis is happening um, in this city and in this state, quite frankly, and even in this country, if you really look at it. Um, Understanding the history of healthcare and housing accessibility is crucial to understanding the multiple crises on how people are dealing with. Um, This overwhelming overwhelmingly older white audience doesn't seem to acknowledge that older white generations have been criminalizing poor people of color for hundreds of years hundreds of years we've been using these approaches right they don't work they don't work so instead of individualizing the circumstances that unhoused folks are dealing with i implore you to consider how these are systemic issues and they might even intersect with some of the main problems in your life that you deal with When you look at countries with successful rates of housed citizens, they always provide distinct social safety nets to achieve this outcome. Without public access to healthcare and housing, these efforts to further criminalize people dealing with mental health issues will worsen their crisis and our crisis. What we need is bold movement towards universal healthcare and housing. In fact, an opportunity to pass universal health care in California was available this past year, and a Democratic supermajority issued that in favor of donations from medical insurance companies uh, this past legislative session. You need to start holding your peers to account. You need to start pressuring them to support the things we need to be healthy and for us to have lives that are meaningful while we're here, not in the next life. While we're here, we want healthy communities. I'm 25. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking like, where I'm, I'm housing insecure my whole life in California. I've been healthcare insecure. I'm going to turn 26 and I don't know, even know if I'm gonna have healthcare and we're here debating about trash on the parkway and you cannot see the very decisions that have brought us here, the policy decisions that have brought us to this place. It's incredible, but it's not surprising for a group of white people and white people that have time to actually do this. Yeah, it's, it, does, it makes sense why this is happening. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Thanks for your patience. If we have one last caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. If you could. Hello, my name is Jennifer Harris. And I'm just calling to say I greatly appreciate 
you supervisors as elected officials, I do not envy your position. I realize this is one moment that we're experiencing here that's built up for a long time. Yes, we're all frustrated. I just want to say I appreciate you as human beings. We're not perfect. No one is. And uh, I, I certainly appreciate you being in the position you are in. And I'm uh, looking forward to moving forward with the best solutions that we can come up with for the moment and continuing to improve together. So just thank you for your time and thank you for uh, being in the position you're in. And I wish you all the best and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Jennifer. Okay, that concludes your public comments. Okay. All right, that <clears throat> concludes the public comment. Uh, as we said earlier, uh, we would take all the public comment, then we're going to take a brief break. So I'm going to suggest we uh, break for uh, 20 minutes. We'll come back at five minutes after eight uh, and uh, reconvene and for, to deliberate the matter before us. So, so we will close the, close the public hearing at this point in time. And again, thanks to all our callers. Thanks to those in the audience that have stayed with us uh, this entire time. And uh, we will be back uh, in at uh, 805. Uh, good evening. I'll call the uh, Board of Supervisors back into session. And again, thanks to all who've been with us uh, patiently throughout the uh, afternoon and now into the, well into the evening. And uh, with that, I'll have uh, the clerk please call the roll to reestablish a quorum. Okay, good evening. Supervisor Cerna? Here. Kennedy? Here. Desmond? Here. Frost? Here. Natoli? Here. And you have a quorum. Okay, so we've <clears throat> gone through the staff reports and uh, heard from uh, members of the public. Let me um, bring it back to the board for questions of staff before we get into it. See, we have a member of the board already punched up, but we'll go questions, and if there are no questions, then we can sort of go into comments. And I don't know, Ann, is anything you wanted to add? In okay, can you hear me better? Is that better? Okay. All right. So I was just <coughs> asking um, uh, the county executive if there was anything she wanted to add before I brought it back to the board for any questions. So No. Okay. All right. With that, then I'll have uh, member board, uh, members of the board. So, Supervisor Cerna, you're in the queue. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, I'm getting thumbs up from the back of the room. All right. So, uh, first of all, I I want to uh, express my thanks to everyone who uh, waited so patiently, especially those folks on the phone um, who uh, spent hours today um, waiting to address the board on um, obviously a. Um, an issue that has a lot of uh, very invested uh, interests on um, multiple sides. And uh, uh, I think uh, the fact that we had uh, people willing to uh, remain in chambers as long as they have and stay on hold for as long as they have really is a testament to um, the fact that this community cares a lot for both um, the parkway, um, critical infrastructure, and most importantly, the, the people that, um, that we serve that um, are suffering and don't have shelter. <clears throat> so um, a few thoughts, um, and then I'd like to uh, put a motion on, on the floor, and of course there are others that are in the queue to make comments. <clears throat> but, um, you know, the, the, the reason I, I, in the middle of the meeting, uh, put this a list out in, in the front was uh, for a few reasons. Um, the first of which was, uh, again, to make sure that at least uh, the folks that are here in chambers today <clears throat> have uh, easy and immediate access to, again, an abbreviated list of what the county uh, has and continues to do uh, to address the needs that so many speakers um, took the time to uh, bring to our attention today. And, and in fact, many in many instances, even those that are advocating support for the ordinances, I think rightfully mixed into their comments um, the need for uh, this county to continue with um, a compassionate focus on our continuum of care, and namely to make sure that uh, we add and continue to add capacity uh, to house those that are currently unsheltered. Because I, uh, it's fundamentally uh, critical that <clears throat> the public understand 
that I don't think there's any of us on this board that look at the two um, uh, efforts, uh, whether it's the effort around these two ordinances or the efforts uh, to build more capacity as mutually exclusive. They're, in fact, I think mutually dependent. And um, so I'm, I'm pleased and um, uh, actually uh, encouraged to, to know that the public that is watching us very closely, as you should, uh, sees that part of the dynamic, which is critical. And uh, you know, it doesn't mean that <clears throat> we have checked a box and raised the victory flag. By no means does it mean that. It means that uh, we acknowledge, we want the public and the media to acknowledge uh, what we have done, but because again, if there's any um, room for improvement on our, on our behalf, it's the fact that we don't tell our story uh, well enough, we don't tell it frequently enough, um, it oftentimes gets overshadowed by what happens two blocks down the street. Um, and that's just kind of a, the nature of the beast, being a county uh, governing body versus a municipal governing body. Uh, but that's going to change too. And it's not just going to be <clears throat> uh, you know, a brief list that we're going to lean on heavily uh, moving forward of what we uh, do in terms of programs, initi initiatives, efforts. Uh, to add capacity for the unhoused and to enhance services for uh, the unsheltered. Um, you can expect in the coming weeks there'll be a much more uh, refined and more exhaustive um, uh, communication effort to make sure that the broader uh, people that we serve in this county understand exactly uh, what it is uh, we do and what our interests are in terms of responding to uh, the community's call for, for more. <clears throat> because. We hear you, I guarantee you, we hear you loud and clear, and we have heard you loud and clear over the several past years. And of course, um, with the latest point in time count, you know, that adds uh, even more context to the need for more capacity. Um, at the same time, um, we also, at least my, my opinion is, that we, each of us, has a responsibility um, to make sure that the public um, has uh, their assets protected in terms of the critical infrastructure that, quite frankly, your taxpayer dollars uh, have been used to uh, fund and finance over decades <clears throat> and to make sure that uh, you have access to a clean and safe parkway. This is not the, the first time that uh, any of us have um, attempted uh, to make progress uh, towards the, the goal of having a safer and cleaner parkway. I can tell you that every single year I've been on this board, it's been a fundamental um, uh, priority for me, especially during uh, the budget discussions that we have uh, twice yearly. And I think this uh, falls into that same category of trying to advance a cleaner, safer parkway, trying to protect uh, infrastructure that is uh, essential. Um, I mean, I hopefully uh, everyone realizes and acknowledges that uh, this is, you know, neither of these ordinances is attempting to um, blanket the county without regard for being very specific in terms of the type of infrastructure and where that'll be located um, and how it'll be named with the forthcoming resolution. Um, and that, that's for a reason. Uh, we didn't just want to say no camping anywhere. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, those uh, aspects of our uh, infrastructure inventory uh, are protected because when we have bridges and their abutments that get carved out or we have, um, you know, uh, we have drainage ways that are, are blocked that can cause flooding in a, in a storm event, um, those types of things uh, begin to very quickly pose a threat to uh, the public's general welfare and health. And so uh, that's, part of our, that's part of our obligation. We have to be stewards of both. We have to be good stewards of that infrastructure and very good stewards of the unique asset that is the American River Parkway. And we, have, and we absolutely have the fundamental obligation uh, to make sure that um, no one suffers in, in this uh, county unnecessarily. And so uh, with those comments, um, I think the um, staff that have worked on these two ordinances, uh, primarily our legal counsel, um, and it's, I know it's been 
um, a joint effort within the county council's office uh, involving you know a number of different legal minds have been very, very, very careful um, in advising uh, this board and uh, our executive to make sure that uh, both ordinances uh, don't uh, aren't aren't overreaching, uh, that are based in uh, um, uh, supportable actions um, and enforcement. Of course, uh, as many uh, commented, will be, you know will be the uh, litmus test whether or not uh, these ordinances do what they claim to do. With that said, on on the subject of enforcement, I will tell you that I certainly don't expect. Uh, either ordinance to be exploited, and by that I mean uh, used to quote unquote sweep anyone. Um, we are going to be using this, uh, using these uh, ordinances, I think, very surgically, uh, very thoughtfully, um, to protect uh, what we again believe to be uh, some of the most vulnerable parts of our infrastructure inventory and our parkway. Uh, so, again, I, I want to end with uh, thanking everyone who's contributed. Uh, today and give us plenty to think about. I want to thank our staff and uh, I want to thank um, my colleagues too because I know in one-on-one -on -one discussions um, that we've had with the county council's office and uh, our executive team, uh, I think we've all contributed in some way uh, our thoughts about how we wanted to see these, uh, these ordinances uh, uh, come, to the, come to the public and be the source of today's uh, discussion. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm going to, uh, and I'm told I can, uh, I guess, make a motion uh, for both uh, for both ordinances. Okay. Um, and I would like to make that motion that we adopt both ordinances. Okay, <coughs> it's been moved and seconded um, uh, for items two and three. It would be <coughs> introducing those items today uh, and, and then would come back uh, as noted uh, August the 23rd for further consideration, but we still have others in the queue, so uh, we're gonna go down to our um, list of supervisors, and we have the next Supervisor Desmond, followed by Supervisor Frost, followed by Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you, Supervisor Cerna, and uh, please indulge me if I'm a little bit repetitive with some of the things, because you definitely stole some of my thunder, but uh, for, I wanna start, of course, thanking everybody for being here and sticking it out, and. There's an awful lot of passion around this uh, topic, and um, I, we, we don't see eye to eye, but I think we all, I mean, like Supervisor Cerna mentioned, the public comments, almost every comment, we know, we all know this is a very complex issue that requires um, compassionate measures to help the homeless, regardless of their situation, whether it's a simply a housing situation, an economic situation, a, uh, a mental illness situation, or a substance use disorder um, challenge that they're facing. Um, we are up here every week, every two weeks, trying to move heaven and earth to do more to help this uh, population. Um, I also want to thank the staff and, and underscore what Supervisor Cerna said and thank County Council, because we have had a lot of discussions um, about this and uh, definitely appreciate all the conversations and, and the input you've taken. And uh, also specifically mention Liz Bellis and Emily Halcon. I mean, there were some um, criticisms directed and levied at you, which I think were completely inappropriate. I want to let you know I uh, completely value and appreciate the hard work you're doing and, and the, the, the passion you have for your positions, and I think you both do outstanding work. Um, you both juggle a lot of different interests, and um, we are well served by you, so thank you for all of your work as well on this. Um, you know, it... It strikes me that uh, nuance doesn't make good theater, and uh, there's a lot of nuance surrounding this issue. You know, so many people call in and think that the, these ordinances are going to result in <clears throat> massive sweeps all over the county. Other people think that this is going to be the panacea to solve homelessness and get them out of causing problems in our in our neighborhoods. This, these ordinances will do neither of those things. They are very nuanced, and as, as Supervisor Cerna mentioned, the, when it comes to actually enforcing these new, I think, tools that, that we're being provided here, that's where that nuance will come in. Um, and every enforcement action that is taken as a result of these will be preceded by 
outreach and engagement and navigation efforts. I am very confident of that. Uh, that is my expectation. I believe every board member shares that expectation of mine. And this is in no way something that is going to detract from the work that this body is doing in terms of adding to all the things that are on this list here that we are continuing to do because we recognize that we can't even take advantage of a lot of the, the situations that these ordinances cover unless and until we have more um, shelter space, the right shelter space. Um, actually, housing along the continuum, everything from shelter all the way to permanent supportive housing, unless and until we have more <coughs> treatment and services for people suffering from mental illness and addiction. We know, all five of us here know, we have an obligation to help the homeless. And that is what we spend the vast majority of our time doing here. We have an obligation to help them, but we also have an obligation to the rest of our constituents, including these seniors who are here tonight who lived in that, live in that mobile home park, who are dealing with horrible circumstances affecting their lives. We have an obligation to children and families who are using our, our, our sidewalks, who have to walk out into the roadway to avoid an encampment. We have an obligation to them as well. We have an obligation to protect this jewel, this environmental jewel we have in Sacramento County, preserve it for current and future generations, um, including the waterways that feed into the American River. And we also have an obligation to make sure that our transportation infrastructure, flood control infrastructure, other critical infrastructure is protected and it is there and available to serve us and is not interfered with um, by a homeless camp. And those are not, like Supervisor Cerna said, those are not mutually exclusive things. We can meet all of those obligations. We need to be doing more to meet all of them. Um, and this is by no means a panacea, uh, but it is a step, I think, in the right direction to give us the tools to be able to establish a, a better balance. Um, and we will be back here in a couple weeks continuing the hard work of bringing online more services, more capacity. And that's something I, I talk to my constituents about all the time is, look, yes, we need to regulate where some of these encampments are. There's no doubt about that. But we are inherently limited in how we can do that both morally and legally until we have more capacity. And so I would ask all of you, when those discussions come in the neighborhoods, Please be there, be, recognize that. Recognize that that is the challenge. Um, and that is the right approach for those who are unsheltered to help get them into an environment where they receive the, the services they need in a safe and secure environment. And it's the better approach for neighborhoods and businesses that are, that are um, being harmed by some encampments. Some encampments, not all of them, a small number of them. So I, I encourage you to, to be there because those discussions are gonna be coming up more and more, I think, in the coming months and maybe year for all of us in our districts. Um, so with that, I just uh, thank you again for the, the discussion. Um, looking forward to, to hearing additional comments from my colleagues, but uh, I'm proud to uh, second the motion to approve the ordinances. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Desert. Before I go to Supervisor Frost, the maker of the motion had a question of counsel. Yeah, uh, thank you, yeah. Mr. Chair. Um, so, uh, I want to be clear in the motion, uh, but first I need some clarity from uh, County Council's office. Um, is there anything that um, puts us in a more compromised position? And I guess I'm asking it a different way from what I asked before. Is there anything that puts us in a more compromised legal position if we specifically acknowledge uh, the 150 feet from the high water mark? Can we do that and is it, does it, it, is it the same force and effect or um, does it still maintain the same um, legal risk, I suppose, uh, as if we don't do that? Uh, you certainly can do that. It's a policy decision. Okay. Um, as I think I've said repeatedly today and prior, we've crafted the ordinance um, to be as legally defensible as possible, limiting um, to the very essential and smallest area. Mm -hmm. um, that is why the 25 foot was um, considered and adopted for your adoption today. So um, okay. that it was, a, it was a calculated reason for doing so. Understood. Okay. And as uh, Ms. Travis and I discussed um, <clears throat> earlier this morning, 
Um, we had a good conversation about uh, the roles that uh, council uh, has and as opposed to policymakers, and they're two different uh, roles, but uh, we depend on each other. So I appreciate the, the fact that um, our county council is being very uh, forthright about risk because that is part of what we're being asked uh, to consider here in part uh, tonight. But knowing that, um, I'll just put it out there to see if there is a appetite, um, but I would like to make sure the seconder of the motion understands that I am interested in the 150 foot from the high water mark um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I appreciate that. I, I am as well and, and um, um, I, I appreciate the, the comments of council as well. I, but I, something I was thinking about in regard to this though is some of these tributaries, tributary, some of these slews, I mean, 150 feet out from the edge would put you out in a roadway in some of these cases. So that was my only thought. Um, and so, I mean, I know we can, I mean, perhaps is it something when we get to the resolution stage, we could take a more surgical approach depending on the nature of the tributary, slough, or waterway, whichever it is, depending on, on just kind of the geography of it? Would that be a better well, approach, I guess? That's my question. Well, the ordinance says 25 feet um, of critical infrastructure. It doesn't specifically identify waterways. So you would have to change the ordinance to reflect just the waterways if you wanted to accomplish what um, Supervisor Cern wants so, to do. Um, and can I just finish the answer? And to answer your question, you wouldn't be able to change the feet designation by resolution because the ordinance would be um, would trump that uh, the resolution. What if, what but, if, oh, one more thought. <laughs> if, for instance, you find that this isn't working, you could certainly come back and amend the ordinance right. to um, extend it. So is there a way that <clears throat> it could be um, crafted on site tonight that acknowledges an interest by the board for 150 feet from the high water mark for the American River and 25 feet for all other waterways because it makes I mean I understand yes, I, I, think I, your point I absolutely is, agree with that your point I, I is well taken yeah and I, I think given the literally the physical breadth of the floodplain uh, along both sides of the the waterway of the American River um, that seems to be a much more kind of practical consideration because I think you're right 150 feet from uh, you know some of these urban channels yeah right when you say waterway, I was under the impression that all waterways, I mean the creeks were waterways. No, yeah, so I'm not. I'm not. It's, it's not. A, it's not a definitional. Um, uh, it's not. It's not the definition of waterways that I'm really addressing. It's trying to figure out how to tailor the feet from the high water mark for a specific tributary, namely the American River. I just want to weigh in, though, because you started thinking about the high water mark in the American River and how high it flowed in 1986. That's the high water mark. And so you take 150 feet, you're going to put it right in the middle of some neighborhoods, right in the middle of some businesses or parking lots uh, if you do that. I mean, so, again, you can think about it in its current state where it's dry and you know that there are times when people move up to the levee, but you're going to get well Past, you know, you're going to go to the top, top of the levee. I mean, that water nearly topped the levees in some cases. And so you're going to go out, and if you've got 150 feet from there, I mean, again, I just thinking about it, I'm not, you know, the practical part of it. I get what the testimony was here today and try to, you know, prevent the intrusion of certain materials into the, into the waterway. But uh, if, <clears throat> if I understand high water marks correctly, that's the, the his historic point well, at which that creek, that river flowed. That's the high water mark. Now, there may be other, other definition of that, Lisa, that you can get to or with your, your familiarity as, as other members of the board. But, you know, that's, that's my understanding of how water, high water mark. So two observations yeah. with the, both of what you said. First of all, the American River Parkway or the American River, it's no camping at all. So it wouldn't matter to make that definition. Okay. Um, the, there's the distinction between the two ordinances. So if you're just talking identifying critical infrastructure, um, to Supervisor Natoli's point, um, staff has recommended language if you do want to go with the high water mark. Um, and I can read it. It would be X amount of feet. Um, we, 
in the high water mark as determined by fish and game, and if not available, top of bank observed, because not all creeks have a defined high water mark um, by fish and game. And um, again, just to reiterate, there is the ability to cite for things that are happening within 150 feet of the wild high water mark under the fish and game code. It just doesn't prevent camping. the camping. So I, I think. I think I think I like the the uh, language that yeah alternative language that council has just recited. So yeah, that's yeah, yeah. So are you keeping it because that would be a separate section? I think. Um, because again, the 25 feet of critical infrastructure is just all critical infrastructure, which includes waterways, sloughs, sure. everything else that's in there. So if you want that definition changed, we will have to add a separate section, which is possible, but you have to determine the, the amount of feet, if you want to keep it consistent 25 feet, or if you want to change it. But, this, but we're, we're Right now, what you've suggested in terms of the, the the more specific language, with a placeholder for distance, that is on, that would only be relative to um, uh, waterways other than the American River, in the infrastructure ordinance. Correct. correct. Okay. Yes. And any any area could be deemed critical infrastructure by resolution. Right. Well, any mm -hmm. creek or waterway, I think, is what we're talking about. I mean, I guess the... Outside the, the 25 feet. The, the challenge I see with, with doing it, I guess, is, um, well, certainly, um, you know, our urbanized uh, channels, our urbanized um, uh, conveyance um, systems, uh, they don't have, they don't feed water the same way you know the that feeds the American River from a broad floodplain. I mean, it it it, it collects in culverts, gets you know put into the uh, uh, the sloughs and the and the channels. Mm -hmm. um, and in some instances, you know, most of that volume is not coming from you know uh, the sides as it would uh, in a river context. So I I don't know what the magic distance is, quite yeah. frankly. Um, yeah. But there's certainly a difference between Arcade Creek, some of these areas, and you know Chicken Ranch Slough right. in certain places. You know where it's all concrete lined, and there really is no green area outside of it. It's right next to people's backyards on both sides. Well, how about this? How about we we keep <clears throat> keep it as is? I think I heard council say that we can come back and change it if necessary, and maybe um, we do that, and then. Uh, use the you know maybe the next couple of weeks to figure out what the alternatives are that can be based on something rational other than two supervisors trying to figure out right. some arbitrary at, number at, right, at, right at eight thirty. Yeah. <laughs> well, and when I said come back and change it, I didn't mean like before the adoption because if that's the case, that we have to reintroduce it. I meant later on when we figure out how this is practically working. Amend it later. Amend it later. Yeah. That's what I meant. I just okay. wanted to clarify that. Because yeah, it is I'm, a substantive change. If you introduce it now, yeah. you can. Okay. That, I'm good with that. I think it's that. a good starting point. Yeah. Okay. And also, I mean, I will reiterate, there is the fishing game code that sure. can be enforced as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the motion stays as Stay it is. Okay. okay. All right. Supervisor Frost. Thank you, Chair. Well, first I want to thank everyone who came today who um, was here to express their thoughts and their voice their concerns. Um, I want to thank County Council um, and Legal Council for the thoughtful way you put together an ordinance that would work for us at this time. And I want to thank staff who have worked um, tirelessly over time to create a, a complex plan um, on how we'll manage homelessness. And it's um, it's a huge effort, and they've been amazing. Uh, I think it's heartbreaking that so many people <laughs> are homeless, and it's heartbreaking to watch the impact of the homeless on our parkway and in our communities. Um, citizens no longer feel safe in a lot of our public spaces in spite of sincere planning and effort over time and a huge financial investment, the county is still struggling to figure out um, how, 
how to expand the programs and how to reach each individual, which each individual homeless person has uh, individual needs. So it's, it's a complex issue. We've got growing homelessness and it's a real public health concern, not only for residents, but also for businesses and it's untenable really. Over time, I've watched in my communities um, in Rio Linda and along the Dry Creek where they have, um, they've just been exhausted by the homeless camps, especially during COVID as, as they grew. Uh, we have growing homelessness um, along our communities where we have fires um, from homeless camps near people's homes. And we have churches where the church secretary every day meets um, her job to have to hose off um, human waste off the sidewalk um, before she goes into work. And um, just copious damage and fires um, along the parkway and assaults. It's not safe. Um, I agreed with one person who spoke today who talked about, you know, the drugs are exponentially, you know, exact, you know, exaggerating the problem. Um, and I know that the county, we have tried to add drug recovery programs and mental health programs to help um, with those concerns and we still need more. Um, I've heard many comments regarding you know, quality of life for our citizens. And while there are some really noble homeless people and, um, and citizens who are working really hard to clean up the parkway, it's, it's just not enough. And the county is doing a lot too. We've invested millions of dollars over the last couple years. Um, I support the idea of the 25 foot um, from the high water line uh, with the idea and understanding that the fish and game code 5652 um, works in conjunction and on top of that. And I, I like the idea that um, we're going to come back, you know, and methodic, uh, you know, carefully evaluate what is critical infrastructure. And so it's not going to unroll, it's not going to unfold instantly everywhere in the county. It's going to gradually unfold. And as that's happening, we're as quickly as possible trying to identify safe stay and scattered shelters and more opportunities for support systems so that we can um, meet those in the middle and make this really work like magic. I mean, that's, that's I think, what the goal is. We can't leave the vulnerable homeless and the unhealthy um, we, we can't leave them out in an unhealthy environment and, and vulnerable. Our most vulnerable homeless are, um, are out there. And it's not right to just leave them there without helping them. And we can't allow homelessness to destroy the critical infrastructure of our county, especially the parkway, which is really a jewel. I mean, it's it's something to really be proud of and something that everyone can enjoy at, at all income levels. I think um, all citizens should feel safe in public spaces. We have parents who want to take their children to the park, but they can't do it because they're afraid there might be a needle. You know, they're, they're seeing people, strange people in the park. And um, all citizens should have mobility and safe access to whatever destination they want to go to. And that goes to ADA and these areas where we have homeless people on the sidewalk where someone might have to walk out on a busy street just to get to their dis destination. For some people, that's, that's hard. So for these reasons, I, um, I fully support both ordinances uh, and I Look forward to continuing our work to expand the shelter capacity and the services that can meet in the middle. And hopefully may, this will be the magic that can help our homeless and at the same time improve quality of life and um, public health and safety in our communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Frost. Supervisor Kennedy.
Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so I'm not going to talk a lot about the parkway because my colleagues have um, waxed poetically about that and uh, certainly have a greater understanding than I do of the parkway, though I have a great understanding, but certainly not on a day-to-day -day basis that you all do. So I, I just want to focus on a on more of you know, what we see in South Sacramento and District 2 as far as critical infrastructure threats that are brought on by uh, camping. Um, and more specific to that, because, you know, first of all, you know, an ordinance such as this, you know, it, it, it should not be designed to punish. Uh, it should be designed to mitigate urgent health and safety concerns. And, and I think these do that. Uh, as council said, Every word has been scrutinized to make it as narrow as possible and ta tailor this as narrowly as possible so as not to be broad and overburdensome and, and you know, impacting those that, you know, it, it, where it's not an infrastructure issue. Uh, one thing I, I will say, and, and I'll, I'll talk about um, some of the, uh, the, the health issues such in the, that we deal with in District 2 in South Sacramento. Um, we, we, have, we don't have the, quite the picturesque creeks and waterways that uh, some of you all do, uh, but we have many, many creeks that most people don't realize. Many people don't realize that how many bridges they're driving over when they're in mm -hmm. you know, urban settings in, in, down in South Sacramento uh, that provide a, a real service. And yeah, I, I will tell you that we spend a lot of time, a lot of money trying to keep those clean uh, and that's not for aesthetic value. Uh, that's health and safety. And, um, you know, it's from the, the junk and rubbish that is there that can cause flooding uh, issues, uh, also uh, pollute our waterways, uh, to the, the, the waste that has created E. coli problems, uh, to fires that we have regularly in the creeks uh, of South Sacramento that uh, directly abut houses. Uh, that have caused fires uh, and that have been dangerously close to affecting homes. Um, and, and then there's also the threat to people who are in these encampments. I mean, it's horrifying to, I drove down uh, near Calvine and there was a large encampment in a detention facility in the wintertime. You know, that's just dangerous. That's, that, that's something, I mean, I want to protect those people who should not be there because they're putting their life at peril by being there. And if there's some place that's safer and more appropriate for them, yes, we need more housing. I, I, you won't find anybody who hasn't beat that drum to death more than I have. Uh, we, we do not have enough housing. We need more SUD programs. We need more mental health programs. And, and thank you, Supervisor Serna, for providing this list uh, on behalf of Rachel in my office because she was going to have to transcribe it tomorrow. So <laughs> now doesn't have to. I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, this is evidence that, you know, we are making a concerted effort to provide services and housing opportunities. And, and we haven't stopped here. This is, this is you know, just step you know, 1,000 of many to come. And so, uh, you know, we will continue to focus on this. Um, but this isn't easy. Um, you know, I've been called a lot of names tonight. I think my least favorite was old. <laughs> my favorite was rat bastard. Um, which my wife actually texted me and enjoyed. Um, <laughs> But I, uh, I, I, you know, these things come, you know, Mackenzie got up and gave a very, very eloquent uh, testimony tonight. And, um, you know, as usual, I, I agree with much of she had to say. Um, I wish I could say it as eloquently sometimes. Uh, but, uh, you know, you brought up the Stockton Boulevard um, situation. That was the darkest day in my supervisorship, if that's a word. Um, these aren't easy issues to deal with. They, they, they keep us all up at night. This is no different. Um, but, you know, this is not punitive. This is protecting our community, community assets, and also protecting our unhoused un neighbors. So, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Okay, <clears throat> um, I know the hour is late. I'm just going to take just a, a couple of moments here to uh, share some thoughts. One of the things that has gone through my mind today, but I think as others have said, um, this is something that's on the minds, not only of us that have the responsibility and privilege of serving as 
uh, supervisors, certainly in this county, but <clears throat> in in capacity, the others, our colleagues, serve at the cities and in and, and, and such. And it's something that um, folks could, I guess, choose to ignore and uh, say that it's not uh, visible or that it's just them. But it, but they're they're people just like ourselves. And for the grace of God, it would be uh, any one of us here in this room, um, whatever our you know our our situation in life and um, some of us are blessed with good fortune some of us are blessed with um, you know decisions that went the right way uh, some of us are just blessed but when I hear folks come to the podium as we did again today who um, have you know struggled who you know the, the lady Sandra that spoke to us this afternoon uh, earlier who lost her job and now she's in the parkway and uh, she took the time obviously to come here and to to share that with us and um, I think that just in of itself is is um, takes a lot of courage and obviously there are folks who will advocate uh, uh, for folks who are in that situation and do that very very capably very competently and uh, again um, they know who they are they've been here many many occasions and I appreciate uh, uh, their weighing in on, uh, on behalf of folks who may not have that voice uh, um, or le at least feel they have that voice. And that does weigh on me. I'll just say that, you know, having the, the, the years that I've served on this board, but certainly served in public life, that uh, it's not lost on me, uh, you know, that uh, people's situations uh, are many, many, many times are out of their control. And when I see folks, as I did the night before last, when I left this building um, about this time, uh, a little earlier, but... Um, you know, sleeping on the sidewalk, laying there on the sidewalk with nothing but, you know, their shirt pulled over their head. Um, that strikes me. That's another human being. That's another soul that this good Lord's put on this earth and that they, you know, whatever their situation is, at that moment they're sleeping on the sidewalk. And when I see tents and we can talk about encampments and you can see the blue tarps and you can see all the pictures we saw today of certainly accumulations of debris, some of it attributed to those camps, um, Again, that that bothers me too, because again, uh, you know, we're not a, a third world country. Uh, we consider ourselves to be a very, very civilized society, and one who, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, certainly promotes uh, you know compassion and approach to uh, dealing with some of our societal uh, problems. But when you see in this state, in this country, and certainly in our community, and one that I've lived here all my life in this community, to see some of that human desperation, uh, despair. Uh, but also um, just the human condition. Uh, that troubles me. And it troubles me for the people who, again, who uh, are fortunate enough to have a job, they're successful uh, because they work hard, and they want safety for their children. They want to be able to use the parkway, which is a treasure, something this community uh, many decades ago uh, uh, you know, chose to, to take on and to preserve for all the various values that it holds and to see, obviously, some of the degradation that's occurred there for a variety of reasons, certainly some of it's due to natural circumstance. Not all fires are attributed to the homeless by any means. Um, that concerns me because, again, that's a treasure, and that's something that, that as a board member and certainly as a member of this community, uh, I, I see value in. I see value for folks to enjoy it, and whether it be a person of any age, but they should feel safe. They should feel that they can, can use that parkway and go down there and take in the natural environment and enjoy the, the river and, and enjoy the company of one another or whoever else is, 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 is using the park at that particular time. And, and so those things really, again, they do weigh on me. And again, the comments uh, that we've received today from folks who are concerned about what is meant to the, the natural environment, what is meant to the human condition, what is meant to them as a, a resident. We heard several folks who were lifelong residents here and raising their families are concerned about, you know, what, you know, what they not only perceive, but maybe very much a reality for them and, and, and their family. And so when I think about that and think about what's before us, obviously we have two ordinances and, and, and words do mean something and certainly the intent behind them uh, is, is, it needs to be meaningful. I just, I guess I want to just call to mind that <clears throat> I would want to say that I don't think we need to have any unrealistic expectations about what's before us, that yes, it will have an impact, it's designed to do that, it's designed to give uh, tools to uh, those that are charged with on a daily basis with either overseeing the parkway or maintaining, quote, critical infrastructure, uh, but also I think to, to send a message that, um, uh, you know, we're not condemning those who 
are, you know, at any moment uh, choosing to camp there, but we're also saying that there are certain locations where uh, that may not be allowed because it, it either impacts that infrastructure, impacts the ability for folks to move uh, safely in and about, uh, I say safely, but, you know, to, to avoid traffic or having to walk out into the, to traffic because there's obstructions in, you know, in, a, in a sidewalk. <coughs> but I think it also speaks to the, to the greater need. And again, I would certainly be the first to acknowledge that, you know, we are doing uh, many, many things as a, as a county, as a, as a community, as a society. It's not all on government's shoulders. It's on shoulders of all of us. And we hear people from the ministry. We hear folks who are giving up their time, whether it's, you know, maintaining our our, our parkways, our waterways, uh, those that give to, you know, to, to help others who may be less fortunate and in need of that help. And so, you know, as a community, uh, we're given, again, the responsibility and, and, and certainly the privilege of serving and the capacity we serve in to try to help figure out, to try to find a balance. And sometimes I think that, you know, uh, that balance is uh, very, very elusive because uh, on one hand, we want to um, address an issue, but then we also know that there's a there's a tremendous deficit in in our ability to, I think, uh, help overcome, help people overcome uh, what is 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 really shameful, and that you know people shouldn't have to sleep on the sidewalk, and they shouldn't be given that as their only choice because they either have an addiction or they have lost their job or because they've got things that trouble them in their mind that doesn't give them the ability to uh, to cope and and and. And all of those things come together, though, because, again, we're, we are one community. And even though we come from different walks of life and different points of view, different experiences, is that uh, I believe very strong we all have a soul in us and we all have a, a mind that we're given and, and, and to hopefully be able to approach things with some logic and some uh, thoughtfulness. And, again, these two ordinances, uh, you know, it certainly have tugged on my thought processes as to, you know, one, the necessity to do something, and recognizing that we're, you know, we, we are bound by the laws of this nation, certainly of, the, of, of the, <clears throat> this uh, state, but we're also uh, bound by, I think, as some of my colleagues have said, uh, you know, the, the, the thoughtfulness that goes into having an ethical approach and looking at the human condition. And, and, it, and again, I will just say that it troubles me that uh, we have anyone, whatever their walk in life, and certainly many of them folks uh, from um, underrepresented uh, uh, communities, uh, um, certainly people of color, when we have women and children that either are living in encampments or living in their cars or living in squalor um, and in poverty because they, you know, of the situations they find themselves in, or veterans, people that have served this country honorably, and that they have got a situation that, you know, renders them homeless at a given moment, though, again, that is, is something that, one, we need to keep in the forefront. But we also then need to keep in the forefront that to have a, 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 a livable community that, you know, we have to, um, you know, take head on some of the issues that may be a result because the people don't have options. And, I, and again, I, I would just share that I, I, this evening I was thinking, I thought, you know, what would I do if I didn't have a job, I didn't have a car, I uh, had some struggles in my life and things had really gone to pot and I had no place to stay. I didn't have a place that I could call home. So, you know, what, what would I do? And um, uh, fortunately, I'm not confronted with that, but, I, but it, um, I, I think about that because that's what a lot of those folks that we're talking about are confronted with. And, uh, um, and, and yet, I think we have an obligation to try to give tools to those who are, we charge uh, with, you know, being caretakers of the parkway or being those who provide social services um, and uh, provide the various services that should be available to all citizens and all residents of this community. And um, I will say we need to do more. I, I, I believe that. I, I'm going to harken back to just a, a moment in time. At one time, uh, not too long ago, we had an affordable housing ordinance that actually had inclusionary housing as a part of it. it was it controversial? Yes, it was, but uh, with some folks. But it provided for because it had a funding stream that was attached to it, and it had redevelopment dollars were attached to it, and it allowed us to deal with low income, with very low income, and extremely low income folks. And, and it, I think, it provided somewhat of a safety net for at least a portion of our community. Well, we don't have that 
in that format any longer. And that's, again, a result of a combination of things. But I think about behavioral health. And you think about the ability to, uh, you know, help people cope with situations that have either been brought on by trauma, have been brought on by addiction, uh, and or other life experiences. And uh, I think we're doing a lot. I, I, I would give them the first to agree, but I think we're going to need to do more. Because, again, we're, we're not going to, I don't believe we're just going to build our way out of this by building, you know, tens of thousands of units, that will be a part of the, the foundation for uh, addressing it. But we've got to continue to, uh, I think, uh, work to provide services and hold people accountable. I mean, there, you know, there is a certain level of accountability. And if you're not in control of your circumstances, maybe that's difficult to, to come to grips with. But I think that's a part of it. But uh, I, I intend to uh, support the uh, ordinances before us here uh, this evening. Uh, but I also want to just, uh, I guess, leave it with a, a word of uh, certainly um, caution about the expectations and or what people would perceive is going to happen here. One, I don't think it's going <clears> to <throat> solve a lot of the uh, uh, issues that folks have been in these chambers on on a regular basis now in their neighborhoods and in their business uh, businesses, but just in their community. It will help us, I think, to address that. But we are going to have to uh, on the other part of it, it we're not going to be sweeping folks out either. That's not that's not the equation that we're looking at here, and uh, you know there's some peril certainly to the natural environments, but there's peril to people, and I think uh, you know we, we need to have some tools that we can um, uh, employ or deploy uh, in a way that's I think judicious and prudent, but also compassionate. And that word's used a lot, and uh, I I've, uh, want to leave it with this because the question is still in my mind, no matter what we do and what we put forth as being a tool, um, what will happen to folks if there is no other housing option? They will be moved under this, and we will offer them certain uh, options, uh, and they may not fit because of their situation with their own personal circumstance, with their, uh, if they have pets, if they have partners, if they have possessions, and we're trying to accommodate some of that. But what will happen, uh, I think, will be much like what we've seen happen until we get more housing on the back end of some of this, is that folks are just going to move, and they may move to another location. They may, may move out of the parkway. They may move away from that critical infrastructure. They may get out of the, you know, out of the roadway. Uh, but until there are some, some uh, you know, real options in quantities uh, that will uh, go to some of the need and demand out there. I think we're going to struggle with this as a community, not just as a board of supervisors or Sacramento City Council or city councils throughout this uh, uh, um, county. We're going to struggle with it. And again, I, I think there are caring people in this organization. I know there are caring people in this organization. This board cares deeply about the people we represent, whatever their walk in life. And uh, again, I don't think this is going to be something, though, that's going to uh, it's, not, it's not the magic wand. It doesn't solve homelessness. It certainly doesn't solve the issues that folks are concerned about as it relates to our waterways. And lastly, I guess I would just say that I think there's, I guess I'm really curious because when I saw some of those pictures and, and, and the debris and the accumulation, and I am very appreciative of the volunteers and whether it's the American River Cleanup Crew or Sacramento Picks Up or anybody else, the American River Parkway Foundation, but I, I guess I, I, I asked a question, particularly in some of our creeks and natural streams, what are the public agencies doing there? Some of that stuff's been there for a long, long time. It just didn't show up because there was a, somebody camped on the bank. And so I guess I'm going to ask to the internal question here, when it comes to our water resources department, there's not unlimited budgets, but where is the responsibility lie for some of that cleanup on the public agency part uh, beyond what volunteers are doing? And again, I would not attribute all that that we see there necessarily to, to homeless. But uh, uh, bottom line is I am supporting... Uh, this this evening. Again, um, uh, I don't come to it with tremendous reservations. I do have concerns, though, about, you know, what it means and what we're actually going to be able to accomplish. But we, if we don't try, uh, in some respects, to uh, deal with it in, in real time but some of the problems we see, then I think we've just become more and more frozen in, you know, in our ability to uh, actually you know, make some progress, but we got to continue to push to, to help folks, and we also have to, to keep our community uh, one that people can feel safe in as well. So uh, I intend to support the uh, matter before us this evening. Thanks. All right, Patrick, you still punch in? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I tried to leave you the last word, and I forgot something. <laughs> I wanted to... Uh, uh, to or the county executive, um, you know, we talk about this a lot. Uh, that you know, it's it's our 
kind of unwritten policy, maybe it's written somewhere, uh, to really in, try to engage before there's any enforcement of something like this um, and, uh, you know, reach out for, you know, housing, shelter, social services, mental health, whatever the services are we can connect them to. Um, I, I'd like a commitment that, you know, to the degree that we can, we will make meaningful engagement before this is there's any enforcement on this. Um, and I say to the degree possible because there are emergency situations that may come up by the very nature of the ordinance. Um, but but I, I'd, I'd like to more formalize that here, not in the ordinance, not as part of that, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. You absolutely have my commitment for that. I think it's absolutely very critical and it is always our number one goal. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, anything further for members of the board? If not, Lisa, is there anything else you need to add for the purposes of the motion that's before us? No, just to echo what um, the Supervisor Kennedy said and Ann um, mentioned, we do have an encampment management policy and that services and outreach are part of that. And I believe that was provided to the board at the workshop that we had in July or June. Um, but if the board or anybody wants to see that, they can certainly um, see it again. And then nothing further to add on the motion. Okay. It, it, it might be uh, helpful. This will be back before us in two weeks. And I think to the, to the question and the response uh, that both of you just gave, uh, you know, that was in a workshop uh, format. But we now actually I heard that we've got, you know, some s staff uh, support. We fill some of those positions. Maybe we could have a, a um, at least a refresher on that and not necessarily in a workshop, but I think have that as accompanying information. So there's, it's well publicized. I think it kind of goes to the point that Supervisor Cerna made earlier about, you know, making sure that it's clear what, you know, how we how we're going to approach this. So, okay, with that, then, unless there's anything further, um, uh, we do have a motion and a second. Uh, this would be an introduction, and uh, I'll call for the vote. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Okay, so now this will return on August 23rd. Is our time set time that would be for the adoption? We'll again the be a public hearing so people can weigh in once again. Um, Flo, do you have a time? On the 23rd, do we know what time? Oh, um, I don't, you know what? I don't know if I have a time yet. Hang on one second. Oh, yeah, and those are typically on consent for the adoption. Uh, I would imagine there may be some folks who want to talk to us. Okay, so, so I'll, we'll, we'll work, out, we'll work out a time and it'll yeah, we'll I think make it sure that time, people, time to yeah. items, let's, let's I, I don't have it prepared for that. Sorry about it. that. Uh, no problem. Okay. All right. So that's the um, um, items before us. Those are items two and three. We'll go to uh, uh, county exec comments. I'll be very quick because I know it's late, but I just want to pile on with the rest of you. My thanks to uh, county council, both um, uh, Lisa and Leticia, and a special thanks to Liz Bellis and Emily Halkin. Um, not only have they worked very, very hard on this, but they're both very passionate about it um, from both sides. And I think that's really important, and we're lucky to have um, their commitment to the overall effort. Okay, thank you, Ann. Yes, thanks to all of our staff. Appreciate it. Okay, board members, anything here? Anything here? Okay, with that, then it's 9.05. Again, I thank all who have stayed with us uh, throughout the course of today, and uh, we will... We next come into session on the 20, 23rd, is that correct? So we're out of, out next week, so we are adjourned.